that be conditionality to check um, uh, how that uh, is um, correlated with the variation between 2023 and 2021. And then we will plan how we can uh, help states and, and municipal uh, governments to actually induce systematic changes uh, when they can see this broader context uh, of um, how to, to achieve racial, uh, uh, reducing the, the racial inequality gaps. So basically that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a fascinating study, and I think this based this the data that you collect in a structured way from yeah, representative samples across Brazil should really give some uh, insightful evidence uh, evidence about what what really drives these gaps uh, and what can be done about them. And some of it's very subtle. I'm involved in a research project in Rio now where uh, part of it and it's called teacher mindsets. And part of it is, you know, uh, analyzing teachers' expectations of their students. And the gap in expectations for white and black and brown students is really very stark. Uh, so there's subtle things that will have to be um, part of the picture in this, in this work, as well as structural things like laws and uh, resource change, shifts in resources. Um, next, let's go to the technology half of the panel uh, with Wahed, uh, talking about talking about the use, the cost effectiveness of using mobile phones to assess student learning compared with in-person testing. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so we are going to switch it, switch the gear a little bit now. The presentation is on whether uh, how we know whether does it matter how we know how much students learn or how much students know? And the short answer is yes, it matters. Um, so done presentation? Okay. <laughs> so um, over the, uh, during the pandemic, the use of phone service have you know, rapidly rise. I have done it myself. I'm pretty sure most people here who does service have done it. Um, and uh, it is also true for you know, measuring learning. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, there has been concern about uh, how much students um, are losing in terms of learning during the pandemic. So for instance, this study takes place in Bangladesh, which has experienced one of the longest school closure during the pandemic, 18 months. And uh, now we are knowing that, you know, students suffered a lot, I mean, in different aspects, but also in learning. But during that, you know, phone-based assessments became much more popular uh, than before. And several stu studies have utilized phone-based testing. Uh, for instance, we saw uh, the paper that Claire presented yesterday. Um, and uh, we know from the literature that survey modes matter in terms of how, in terms of individual responses. Um, and uh, measuring learning using phone survey, that can affect how, how much we are measuring because um, who is responding, you know, often we cannot control it. Family members surrounding can help, MVNs can, you know, influence. The students, the child's uh, familiarity with technology can influence their responses. So there are different factors that can go on. Um, so in this paper, the question that we essentially ask is whether phone-based assessments are comparable uh, in, uh, within person assessment, and if not, and how much difference there is. Um, so we, uh, you know, we explored this comparability, uh, and uh, and to that, do that, um, we uh, administered the same test on the same child twice, uh, once in person and once over the phone. Um, and these are all five to eighteen year old children. Uh, I mean, I mean, eighteen year old could be in a university, but like we just wanted to cover bases for different reasons. Um, we did the ASER test, uh, so the Bangladeshi adoption of ASER. Um, and then we also added some additional questions uh, for children who would have, you know, a higher proficiency. And we, um, you, we, we, borrow, we, we used the 
cofundator paper uh, that they what they also did phone based testing uh, and also added some questions about. Uh, this paper, in essence, is similar to two other papers. One is uh, already published in econo um, in the uh, Education Economics Review, uh, where they, the authors did this comparison, but using uh, existing um, assessment. And then the other paper, which does RCT, well, well which does uh, you know essentially similar to what we are doing, but we have different findings. Um, so the summary of result, as I said at the beginning, um, learning level measured through phone assessment differs significantly from in-person tests. Uh, children score significantly more over phone tests, and they also take less time. I mean, I, mean, I guess no surprise, but that's what we find. Um, and the deviation is similar by gender, while it's more for younger children, and uh, also more for I mean, as I will see more for children who have lower learning level in the in-person test. So the study design, uh, let me take a bit of time what we are doing here. So we have these uh, about uh, more than 1,000 households from this other survey we did right around the school opening. We call this the back to school survey to measure which school students are going back to school or dropping out or re-enrolling, re you know, that phenomenon. From there, we randomized uh, essentially order of survey. So we split the sample half and half, or almost half and half. So the, what we call treatment here for you know, ease of communication, um, we are doing the phone survey first. And the other group, we are doing the phone survey later. Right? So for the phone survey first, we are starting with the phone survey. Then we wait for a week or two. And then we do the in-person survey. For the phone survey lacquer group, we do the flip. Uh, we start with the in-person survey, then again wait for a week or two, and then do the phone survey. So that's essentially the study design, and we do these orderings to ensure that it's not because of which test you are getting first or not. Um, and you know, in administering the survey itself. Um, we know that uh, you know ASAR survey, ASAR questions have increasing level of difficulty. So we start with the, um, the second from bottom proficiency for each child, and then if they do, they you know they are proficient in that level, they go get increasingly difficult questions. If they don't don't get that level, they go to the uh, proficiency level below that. And the additional questions that we have. Uh, are only are not offered to student children who are at the level below of the first question that they got, and I'll, I'll tell that a little bit more in the following slide. But um, so essentially, we are starting here, which is you know for Bangla, it is the uh, Bangla is the native language for Bangladeshis for ninety nine percent of Bangladeshis. Um, a child is tested at the word level. Then if they fail that level, they go to the letter level. If they fail that level, we, you know, they are not, they do not have any foundational literacy in Bangla. Um, if they pass that level, they have minimal foundational literacy in Bangla. And then again, if the child passes the uh, word level, they get paragraph. If they fail paragraph, then we say, okay, they know word and spelling. If they pass paragraph, they get story. And then based on whether they pass or fail, we again give them. So that's one level of, that's measuring proficiency. But we are, you know, in doing so, we are also measuring whether they are getting each question right or wrong. And based on that, we also construct the test score that I'll show you. So that's the answer. And if any child who passed this level, irrespective of whether they passed the following, get the bonus questions. So that's how we have administered the test. Now, to make this test comparable, some of the answer questions require visual cues. So for the in-person, it's pretty simple. We gave the enumerators the visual cues, and they took it on a piece of paper, went to the child, they saw it, and they responded. Or, uh, you know, so there are visual cues. But how do we do that in, for the phone test? So we texted the questions to the children. So for that, what it means in the sample universe, 
we had to ensure that each child had access to another, to either able to open the, a text message in the phone handset that they're talking to, or talking, uh, using to talk, or they had a different uh, phone where they could get a text message. Without that, we cannot, so our analysis, we keep children only if this condition was met. And that's how we are ensuring that we can deliver the visual cues for the uh, asset test to the children. Um, and uh, we, you know, we train the innovators in a way so that uh, the child was asked a question once they verbally confirmed that they're ready to answer. So to do that, we um, ask the child whether they can open and read the text message. Once the child confirms that they uh, have received the text message after we have sent it, the test begins. And uh, as I said, there is no visual cues for the bonus questions. So essentially this is, the, for the visual questions, the, uh, the bonus questions, the difference is whether you can respond hearing over the phone or respond when I'm asking you the questions in person. So in the both survey, we have constrained it by time. Each question had a four minute time limit, uh, except for one question in Bangla. And we informed the child about the time limit before every question. And we uh, estimate this regression where Y is test score or proficiency level or time. Phone is whether the test is phone. And this is, uh, Delta is a child level fixed effect that would absorb as well the uh, ordering. Right, and we cluster by household. The sample is comparable whether you do phone first or phone later. Uh, we have about um, just about fifty percent female or girls, and most are enrolled in school. Now, the, this graph is showing whether the test scores are correlated to each other. What this is telling us, yes, uh, across the three subjects we test and overall score, the phone test and in-person test are correlated to each other. Uh, however, test scores differ by test type. So as you can see here um, on the phone test, students are scoring more for each um, uh, score. And then when we do the regression, we see about, uh, so this is standardized with respect to in-person test. Is 0.14 standard deviation more in the overall um, in the phone test, which is above the median that we kind of debated about yesterday, uh, and it differs by subject. And this is the other thing is this phone test takes less time, so this is by minutes, and the overall test average in person time was 26 minutes. Um, for the phone test, it took about 17 or 16 or 17 minutes on average. So it's about 10%, 10 minutes uh, less for the phone test. Um, and this difference is higher for children with lower learning level. So as you can see, like if like they would have scored same, the, the, this would be in this 45 degree line, but we can see for the lower level, learning, the gap is more while it's less for higher level and also it's not, we don't have many in the, uh, in this distribution. This is quite high, right? So for neg negative two standard deviation in any person, we see almost a point negative one, two standard deviation over the phone. So that's like 0.8, so, so for one data point, I'm just saying. This is also translated into the proficiency levels. Like uh, in phone test, we find high, on higher proficiency for students who actually have lower proficiency in the in-person test. Um, and when we see whether proficiency increases or decreases or remains the same, uh, for Bangla, like two third, almost two third, it remains the same. Um, and like, for the rest, like half and half, whether it increases or decreases, but for other two subjects, we see that um, uh, for a significantly higher portion than Bangla, 
and significantly higher portion, then whether, whether it remains, it decreases, it increases. Yes, thank you. I'm just uh, wrapping up. And then we look at like where this change is happening and it also differs by subject. So for Bangla, it happened. So the, for the ward level, so the second level proficiency, we see the largest increase from phone survey to in-person survey, uh, from in-person survey to phone survey. And for English, also it happens for the second level, which, uh, sorry, uh, is in the first level, which is letter, where you see the increase from in-person survey to phone survey. But for math, the biggest jump is in the highest level, which is the division level proficiency, uh, where uh, the increase is from in-person to phone survey is about 13 percentage points. We do not see any difference in the gap by gender except for math. Um, I realized that we didn't add the only female mean here, which I should have had. And uh, however, we do, not, we do see that the, the gap is less for, uh, the gap is larger for younger children. So essentially as age increases, the gap decreases. So means for the younger children, and that takes me to the concluding slide, which is we assume that in-person tests are the benchmarks, I mean, just for the sake of comparison. And if so, phone tests are prone to overestimate learning levels. And that has consequence in you know, using phone tests uh, to measure learning level, and we probably should adjust our measurements uh, if we are, want to compare with in-person tests. Thank you. I give you 13 seconds. Great, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. And next we'll hear from Andy through video connection. Are you there, Andy? I'm here, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to the organizers. Um, very happy to be presenting again at Rice. I, my paper is entitled Explaining the Productivity Paradox. What I'm really looking at is what happens when teachers are asked to use technology in their classroom. And I think this even speaks to a wider question about what happens when workers more broadly are, are exposed to a new technology. Um, this paper is now out actually as a working paper um, with the Edinburgh working, ser uh, working Paper Series. Uh, so please take a look on, and distribute freely. Um, it's, it's out there and it's, it's been great fun. Um, and, and I wanna thank them for putting it out there. I usually start uh, with the, my presentations with the very last slide because I think the very last slide is the most important one. I really wanna thank your Avanti Fellows, the NGO that I've been working with for um, more than five years now, that really um, have embraced the findings also, and the government of Haryana, um, all of the study is in Haryana in government secondary school. So huge thanks to all the partners and also funders for, for that study. I wanna start out um, with something very old, <laughs> and that's the productivity paradox. Um, and I would argue that this paradox where uh, Solo said, you can see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics, um, you know, it's still around, right? So this just goes back to the 80s where computers were a new thing and people were saying like, wow, this is this cool new thing. This is a computer. And then Solo noticed that, well, computers are actually everywhere, but they're not showing up in the productivity statistics, right? Now you could say, hey, I mean, why are you showing me stuff from the 80s? Isn't this like a bit outdated? But what's happening right now is exactly that. Uh, that people are again super excited about technology, right? You hear it everywhere. Everything is buzzing about AI and cool new toys and whatnot. And this stuff is thrown at workers and also thrown at teachers. And you know um, what? You know the foremost uh, researcher in in AI in the AI space uh, from formerly MIT, now at Stanford, say, you know, we just see a redux of this uh, productivity paradox. We see transformative new technologies everywhere but in the productivity statistics. And I would argue really that why that is or why we see like this mix of like effects um, is, is you know, partly a function of why it is so hard to just study this. And I use EdTech really as an example for that to, to just show you that this is really always a, a, a weird intervention that's really hard to, to study. So you really don't know whether in most of the studies where the technology really serves the purpose of factor augmenting or complementary technology. So the intervention itself actually does that, 
or whether, for example, is increasing instructional inputs, right, or instructional time, right, such as in the studies by, you know, um, the, the AER study by um, um, or later on at all about the MindSpark study, these kids studied more, right, so maybe this is just an increase in inputs, right, or maybe you're substituting inputs, right, like uh, you're saying them um, to use some tech intervention, but you're taking something else away, right, or you're placing their curriculum or what I would say, most of the time, you actually have a mix of everything. Like you have this mixed bag of you're asking students to do something extra, maybe you're asking teachers to do something else extra, uh, and so forth. So I think EdTech is really a prime example of having all these things happening at the same time. And then sometimes it goes up, sometimes you go, it goes down, and you really didn't, don't know what your intervention did, right? So what I want to do here is kind of solve this a little bit and look at a technology intervention that asks teachers to blend their instruction with technology. So you're not replacing anything, you're really asking teachers to co-teach with a technology, right? From what I know, this is the largest cluster randomized trial of an ethic intervention that complements teaching, largely shutting down all these other channels that I just talked about. Uh, it compares the intervention also against a non-tech intervention, and it is uh, a very large trial in partnership with the state government across 240 schools, 25,000 students in a single cohort. And with very rich data, not just in the outcomes, but also with classroom observation, teacher interviews, and student interviews. Right? Punchline is after um, about a year of the intervention, this was pre COVID. Uh, I find negative effects of the uh, tech intervention on math. So, this is in secondary schools, uh, grades nine and 10. No effects on science, no effects on, um, of the non tech intervention. So, uh, running this, this whole intervention with workbooks only and not with tech, but really standing out for me, there's negative effects in, in math not just on test scores, but also negative effects um, in terms of instruction and also negative effects on student attitudes. So really consistent with uh, what economists would call like an adjustment cost so that yeah, you're asking somebody to use a new technology and take some adjustment. And in the short run, cynically or like ironically, when people talk about ed tech being disruptive, yes, this was very disruptive um, and, and purely disruptive in, in terms of the negative effects. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the context, so this is Northern India, uh, state of Haryana, highlighting here the eight districts where, where this program runs. The study had 240 schools. Um, again, so there's uh, the, the main treatment consists of these two components. One is the technology intervention where teachers are being asked to co-teach with, with uh, these materials in the classroom. These are short snippets, so that it's not like the teacher is switching on some video, but the teacher is teaching what the teacher is normally teaching. Uh, and along with the normal curriculum, there's no changes to the curriculum. The teacher now teaches the same material with these short video snippets. Right? The second component is workbooks and school visits and, and a bit of coaching to teachers. Um, but then uh, I'm going to tease out these two components. In terms of the research design, I'm, I'm showing here the, the same location. And I have this three group cluster randomized trial with 80, 80, and 80. So one group gets RCT and uh, gets ICT, so the technology intervention together with school visits and, and the, the, the print materials. And um, there's a second group that gets just the workbooks and the print materials and the school visits. And then I have a pure control group. Uh, main outcomes are written ex assessments that I assign uh, myself. And then I have, uh, um, I break these down by subdomains in terms of, you know, content domains or uh, cognitive domains as well. Uh, I have very rich data on implementation fidelity. I have very rich data on intermediate outcomes. I have uh, monthly visits to these schools, so a, a very long timeline in terms of what's going on in these schools. Um, and um, yeah, I think it, it's really rich in terms of what we see here. Um, it's really trying to break up that uh, break up that um, black box that often, you know, if you just look at test scores, you would never get at. Right? Um, no magic happening here. This is a very simple cluster randomized trial. I want to point out one thing here. Um, certainly, uh, the identification comes from from the assignment of the the treatment or the two treatment groups. Um, here, this this control variable, um, I'm actually able to uh, match the study schools to the universe of the schools in India with dice. I also have the locations of the schools and I um, have uh, census track data so I can actually drop these schools into, into census, uh, census information. And then through Shrug, I can actually connect all of that to all the information that we have about the villages that these schools are placed in. So this means that I have basically everything that you know about the villages um, where these schools are. 
from like the census to nightlight data is, is <laughs> uh, anything that you could possibly have. And then I run like a very simple lasso regression to pick out from that. So it's super rich background information that I'm using um, just as controls. Um, that also allows me then to compare the sample against just like uh, other schools in India. Again, like edtech interventions are often you know, very selective. In this case, also, they're a little bit um, positively selected to schools where this program runs. But actually, I can show that uh, I can, um, that the overall sample in, in comparison to India overall is quite representative. So, you know, on average, these schools actually look quite similar to the average Indian government school uh, in terms of uh, observable characteristics. In terms of internal validity, I, I, everything checks out. There's a slight imbalance between the workbook group and the control group. I run a bunch of uh, robustness check uh, to, to see whether that affects if anything. It doesn't, um, as you can think, is this an RCT? I'm the one assigning the random uh, treatment. On top of that also, this is not the main in, um, comparison of interest. The main comparison of interest is, is ICT versus control. Um, finally, in terms of internal validity, this stuff was used. So this is not a matter of implementation fidelity. Um, I can show you all kinds of uh, implementation and take up data. Um, I think my favorite one is uh, where I use the timestamps of when uh, Avanti Fellows, the NGO, visited these schools, and I link that to the backend usage data from the videos that they use in the classroom. And I can then compare whether they're actually playing the videos just when somebody comes and looks at them, or whether they also play the videos when there's nobody around, and they do. I mean, so this is for me the, the best example to just show like, yeah, hey, this is a teacher using these videos when nobody's around and just using these snippets and liking this. Right? And more qualitatively, if you speak to spoke to teachers, um, government officials, everybody was like, yes, this is a great intervention. This, this is really great. Let's use this. Right? Now to the effects that I, that I summarized at the beginning. In this graph, I'm showing you control group growth on the left hand side. So how much did kids learn in the absence of anything? Top is math. So you see about a 30 percent of a standard deviation growth uh, over the course of um, the Savada school year. In science, there's not much growth. Uh, so you could argue that there's no not much productivity to begin with. And then on the right hand side, the black bar shows you the ICT versus control comparison. So this is about the 16% standard deviation negative effect on test scores. Or if you compare it to the control group growth, it's about a, um, you're basically slashing the productivity in math by half. You cannot perfectly distinguish this. Uh, so it's not entirely driven by just a tech intervention. So you could say just doing something is already hurting. A little bit, maybe part of that is driven by just doing something without tech. But I think uh, what stands out here is that, um, you know, at least for math, where there was some productivity, you slashed that productivity by half. Now, I'm not going to go through like all the pre analysis plan checks that I also ran. Basically, there's not a lot going on in terms of heterogeneous effects or, or like effects by uh, content domain, you know, or cognitive domains, or stronger students or weaker students. So I, I kind of skipped a lot of that. I think what's what's more much more interesting is um, that I can show that this is also negatively affecting the quality of instructions that the students receive. So uh, these are various dimensions here that I aggregate to an index. What I'm showing you here is observations done by the NGO themselves. Um, I then also do video-based re-ratings from a neutral team that is office-based um, that is done by JPL, not by the NGO. So this half a standard deviation negative effect on the instruction is measured by the by the NGO. When you adjust this for the bias that creeps in by the NGO doing that themselves, the negative effect that comes that you um, get if you were to use the office-based neutral ratings is about a standard deviation negative effect. So huge negative effects, right? So you can pick whichever you want. Maybe this one is biased, or like you know because the NGO gets better ratings. In this case, though, then it is still almost a half a standard deviation negative effect in, in terms of instructional quality. And in terms minutes. of student pressure, Three minutes. In terms of, uh, great. Uh, in terms of student attitudes, both interventions actually had a negative effect on student attitudes in terms of like how do students feel about math and science? You know, are students, for example, nervous about math or do they feel um, happy and enjoy their learning about math and science? And um, Actually, in both of these interventions, um, I, I have these negative effects. So in conclusion, negative effects on instructional quality, student negative, student attitudes, negative to null effects on student learning in math there, where there was some productivity, uh, that net productivity was slashed by, by half. And 
really uh, just suggest that you know introducing these new technologies at least in the short run comes with some disruption and uh, comes with some substantial adjustment costs and you know this might not entirely be driven by technology part again some of this could have been driven just by doing something and asking people to do something different um you know they could be expanding part of the story so it's going to be interesting to see whether then in the long run you know that adjustment pays off and actually that's uh, exactly what i'm what i'm working on right now so this is pre-covid and after covid uh, with great funding from usaid um, there's a new two-year cohort where i'm currently working uh, on the on the end line but you know for me really there's this warning sign here that you know there's a lot of excitement now post covid people are saying like oh we used edtech let's keep using that um Maybe I think there's positive examples that we've we've seen through Rice and some of our colleagues, but certainly be very careful um, how it's being used, what it is doing, what it's replacing. In this case, um, we really see these at least in the short run negative effects. Right. I want to highlight here one. I have a minute and a half left. I want to want to highlight one uh, piece that's super important to me here. Um, Avanti Fellows, the NGO here, has embraced these findings, and this is for me. One of the best examples that I've seen ever about how somebody uh, or how an organization reacts to findings um, in math, Avanti has actually pulled the negative, uh, reacted to the negative effects and has pulled the entire intervention out of the classrooms and has pivoted to a new model where um, the NGO is now providing after school uh, and after school intervention through remote teaching. And in science, there was no negative effect and they decided that we want to try to tweak this and get this working. Right? And really like, you know, um, to have a partner that not doesn't try to like, make findings go away, but engages with the infrastructure uh, and sketches with the data, see how sees how to pivot and, and come up with a new intervention. And is now with me in the new period of the new cohort in the new RCT and is studying that. And we're now currently launching our end line of that new two year period. So it means amazing. So a uh, huge, huge respect um, and huge thanks. Um, also to the funders who said like, yes, this is a, a negative finding, but let's keep going, let's pivot and see what we can learn in the future. So uh, really um, great collaboration and super, super happy and super excited about the, the findings that we have now coming in with the new cohort. All right, um, thanks so much. Thank you, Andy, not just for your presentation, but for presenting, we, we talked yesterday about implementation, but for presenting a gold standard example of how to do an evaluation that really gives deep attention to all aspects of uh, implementation. Uh, can everyone come up here? And I wanted to say a word about uh, I think that one of the biggest challenges for all education systems is to A, find ways to uh, analyze the needs of disadvantaged populations and make sure that they get the support they need. And that could be not only uh, girl gender gaps that we've heard about or racial gaps, it could be also be ethnic gaps, it could be uh, you know, uh, change difficulties for students with disabilities. And you know, as we heard yesterday, difficulties, uh, differences in the mental health status of different groups of students. So I think there's a big agenda for, for um, countries to really analyze these issues and work on you know, really effective ways of addressing them. Questions? A <laughs> lot, I see. Uh, one, two, three, four, Five, six, <laughs> one, number one up here. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for the great presentations. My question's for Andy. I was wondering, one thing I didn't quite get from your study was the specific problem that videos were attempting to address in terms of either teacher practice or learning outcomes. And I think as we think about sort of video, I think your illustration is great in the sense that it might be disruptive in a negative sense. But I, I think a video maybe is primarily adding value in terms of solving a specific problem. So, for example, illustrating particular concepts or supporting teachers with skill sets that they might struggle with in the classroom. So I was wondering sort of like what was the what was the original theory in terms of how video was going to support teachers and, and how did you connect that to some of the baseline data you were seeing? Thank you, everybody. Let's take uh, two more. And uh, please note whether your question is allied with uh, the question we just heard or not. I have a uh, question and a suggestion for what I had. The suggestion is see whether the uh, 
effects of the phones uh, depend on the uh, education of the parents or the presence of an older sibling in the household who may be helping the kid. And the question is, has anyone checked whether the phone, you know, the difference between the two uh, biases estimates of the impact of a study? I mean, maybe if it's like an additive effect, it would cancel out, you know, if you had used the phone. So maybe it's not a big problem. I don't know if you or anyone else has checked that. Number three here, in, yeah. Thank you. Um, so my question is actually quite similar to, to Paul's for, for Wahadur. Um, so you, you, you ended by saying um, phone tests are, um, sorry, in-person tests are the benchmark and are reliable um, and phone tests overestimate learning, right? Um, this actually raised a different question to me is about how reliable these measures are in general, right? Um, and we're sort of trying to get at some latent understanding of, of learning um, and have just assumed that this gets us at it. Um, and I was wondering if you had some sort of measure that could tell us either how reliable these were as measures of learning, um, and if you had the um, ways to parse potential reasons for the difference between phone and in-person, right? Um, there's the assumption that people might be cheating, getting help, um, but there are a ton of other things that could be going on. So I just wanted to know if you had ways of parsing what could be going on. Do you want to start with Andy responding to the first question? Did you hear the first question? I heard the question, uh, yeah. So yeah. the assumption was that this could help improve instructional quality. I think the, the theory is a bit different for science versus math and also how the videos were structured. So in, in science, you saw them more as an introductory way to make a topic more interesting. Um, so with a snippet of, let's say, an animation. Um, and um, for math, it was more about um, explaining a hard to understand concepts. Um, so, but in both, I think while these are two different aspects, um, the theory was, um, you know, this would help a teacher um, improve their instructional quality in, in a short sense. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, thanks for Paul for the suggestion. Uh, we do have data on parents' edu uh, mother's education. And we can actually see if the child is uh, has a if the is the older child if there are multiple children in the household. So we can actually test that. Um, uh, we didn't we didn't do this as part of an intervention, so we cannot really do that. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else is doing both these for in an intervention setting, uh, but we have thought about it. We in a future study potentially just. Uh, to check um, the point that you made. Uh, and the, for the other question, I uh, so just wanted to clarify that I didn't say it's reliable. I said it's if it is the benchmark. And I agree with you because uh, that uh, while you know, ASAR has been test used in multiple settings and one could you know argue whether it is a reliable uh, measurement of certain aspects of running, learning, uh, it is uh, still used quite widely to measure basic numeracy and literacy proficiency. So for that, probably it is. But however, this is uh, what, the, what we are presenting is uh, not to say that, hey, phone uh, in person is the most reliable and hence phone surveys are, you know, that much bad. It is if we are going with the current understanding of how we are measuring it, which is dominantly in person, then we compare to that, how deviation, how much uh, the phone measures are deviating. That's what we are presenting. We are not making the normative judgment that phone benchmark. Pardon me? He, he did call it. I said we assume that it's the benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> it, we, you have to compare it something. So that's what we are comparing with, which is the still the widely used measure. Uh, here, please, Julius. And then uh, you in front, sorry, and then three in the very back, <laughs> Lindsay. Uh, thank you, uh, Wahed again. So I've been involved with WESO citizen led assessments in East Africa, so I'm a little bit familiar. So I'm following up on some detail you mentioned, the four minutes that you give the child. So I want to understand your thinking behind this. So my worry is, I mean, from my experience, 
children actually will show that they are competent on the question you're asking within or no less than four minutes. But once you mention it, are you not introducing high stakes in this? And what's the thinking about this? And won't that stop the child from thinking properly and unnecessary? I'm sorry. Thanks. And this gentleman here, please. Uh, this one is for Laura. Uh, a question uh, and probably a suggestion just in terms of where it could lead to. Uh, question is more on, let's say, uh, the five pillar approach that you have, I think, you know, because a lot of people and a lot of countries uh, are measuring inequality. In fact, that's where the suggestion would come that for many years now, we've been trying to have this, uh, you know, the differences in scores between boys and girls. And let's say the even what you call as racial, let's say the schedule car, schedule tribe and all of that, that is being measured and states are being ranked at an overall rank. So equity is feeding into how states are being looked for. So in a sense, you're making equity or, uh, you know, trying uh, high stakes that states achieve and try towards it. But what necessarily should they do about it, which is where I was quite interested in what you're trying to do, that isn't always very clear. So would like to know more about that, uh, Laura. Laura? <laughs> I was taking notes. So just to, to clarify, uh, you want uh, to understand what um, Brazil can do about it uh, by knowing what are the, where in the pillars the states and municipalities are um, at, right? Is that it? Yeah, I mean, is it, is it really helping them to do something? Yeah, know, okay. Any, mm -hmm. any, any one or two examples you can share, because I said measuring not necessarily leads to action. Mm -hmm. Reporting it equality. Yeah, for of course. But if yeah. you've seen early signs of actively working on the curriculum mm -hmm. or other aspects that you've said. Yeah, we are going to use this tool uh, in some uh, programs that we support at the Lama Foundation and uh, aiming to uh, actively reduce these uh, gaps. So basically, uh, this, this tool uh, will help us to map where in each of the pillars, the, the, the departments and municipalities are, um, to actually actively make a plan on where and how they could uh, and, uh, go through uh, like uh, reducing these racial gaps. So that's very uh, um, practical is uh, issue that we're tackling here. We're not uh, focused on only collecting data for uh, data itself, because we have a lot of data, as I showed before, like. Uh, from the national system uh, showing the inequalities. But what we actually want to do here is uh, a map of what actually governments and the, the, the departments can do. So we, we found these five pillars. Actually, we, um, based, we were based in Educação Já also to, uh, I'm looking there because we have someone from Todos Educação. Uh, documents to understand what were the main pillars that we should look on we should focus on and that's why uh, this is developed to actually act and not only collect data uh, and then we can plan ahead on how to tackle these issues lindsay oh i think i had oh sorry so sorry. Uh, thanks for the question that's an excellent point so we did a pilot before doing this and we played around with you know whether we provide text message or not and also there we played around with the timing issue so we realized that you know over the phone often um you know if there is so in person enumerators often have self-imposed different time constraint than over the phone uh, and that would create bias in our estimates. They would not be comparable. So that's why we have to pose the time constant. And I agree, it can create the high stake situation that you mentioned. Um, however, it would create for both in person and over the phone because we impose time constant both. But I completely agree that it can have a like slightly different, oh, we have to do it by this time um, psychological uh, impact. Lindsay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
So, um, <clears throat> sorry, a question to Vaid again. Uh, seems like it's a very popular presentation. Um, so, mine is a very technical question, and maybe if you want to, we can take it later. Uh, you used uh, um, IRT to be able to sort of create uh, a composite scale score, um, uh, but then uh, the items that you're using, the asset items, uh, they are inherently a little bit different from your regular uh, uh, dichotomous or even polytomous items, so to speak. Uh, and uh, uh, plus, these are time tests. So, I want to, I was wondering whether uh, uh, is is the, is this question of whether IIT can even be utilized in this scenario a settled question because there are certain fundamental aspects of uh, uh, assumptions that you have to make like local independence and monotonicity and uh, unidimensionality that need to be satisfied on these items to be able to combine them in this manner. So have you looked at that as and is there more research which has sort of also utilized IIT in this context? <coughs> Hi, this question is for Andy. <clears throat> um, I think we've seen a lot of ed tech interventions go to scale. I was in the Bay during the Bay Area during the you know MOOC explosion where uh, people were really excited about that. And then we saw mostly negative um, results for large scale studies. You know, we have a lot of information now from COVID and I guess I'm wondering why we assume this is a short term adjustment and not in tech terms, a feature and not a bug of ed tech interventions detracting from a lot of what we know about learning theory that happens, you know, the learning happens in the conversation and the application in ways that tech may actually detract from. Anyone want to add, add something on that topic for Andy? Um, so related to that topic, I think it's really interesting that a lot of the findings of these four are uh, really counterintuitive to what most funders invest in. Like there's such a hype around investing in ed tech, investing in girls' education. Um, and so I wonder how you think about, I mean, I guess there are funders in this room right now. So that's one way to reach them. But what do you think are other ways to get your findings in the hands of, to influence the way that funders invest and particularly, you know, the big ones like development agencies and the World Bank and these institutions that have a huge influence on where investments go. Because honestly, I, I feel like they're not hearing these kinds of findings right now. You know, there's just this assumption that more in policymakers as well, I guess. So how do you think we actually can reach policymakers and funders with your findings? And then also specifically for Victoria, I think your your findings are really important considering just a larger wave of even in my country, the US, you know, now we have more women going to higher education, becoming doctors, you know, there's more women generally going higher in education than men. And so I wonder what you think are the what, what do we actually need to be then investing in for boys specifically? Like what what are, what do we actually need to be doing then to counteract this sort of wave of investment in girls' education uh, to create better, better outcomes for both? In response to the first part, you know, how to get to policymakers, maybe phone survey. But you could always do Chris, did you want to ask that? Yeah, my question is for Laura and Victoria. Um, there are a lot of factors that put kids at risk um, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status. Et what, what's your sense um, of where? you could intervene most effectively to create a culture where teachers believe all kids can succeed and give them the tools to help them do that. Is it at the system level? Is it the teacher training level? What's your intuition on the first steps that should be taken to create that culture? Let's take those questions. How to get to policymakers? Uh, what? Uh, how do you really solve the problem of inequality in education? And um, what was it? And how do you get to policy? And you had a second part of your question too. Uh, what do we need to do to impact policy? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, for policymakers. So maybe I'll speak to the Kenyan context. Um, I think this was early early this year. Um, the Ministry of Education was uh, revising its education and gender sector training policy, so it's a long name. And one of the things that we do at IPA is by presenting evidence synthesis that could inform 
uh, the revision or formulation of new policies, for example. So it was it was quite interesting and encouraging to hear from policymakers that most of the evidence is just focusing on girls, and they wanted to to see more evidence on boys and the disadvantages that they face in school. So I think one of the key things to do more intentionally as an organization or as a group that um, is really, you know, um, invested in promoting equality in education is presenting whatever findings that we have that also speak to boys and their disadvantages in such platforms because I think, um, and, and again, early this year, so we, we, we didn't have this paper ready then, but we did allude to the findings to that because we're working on the, on the results still. So I think uh, presenting these findings or uh, any evidence that we have out there intentionally in technical working groups uh, for in educational platforms with policymakers is one key way in which we could, we could do that so that they could inform, um, you know, the policies that they are, that are being revised or developed in in in, in whichever context. If, if I could jump in, by from your presentation, I got the impression that boys were not really being pushed out by the education system because they were being treated equally within the schools, but they were being pulled out by outside influences. You know, labor market opportunities, yeah. drugs, alcohol. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, things that might be hard for the school system to change. Yeah, and I, I don't know which where I read this, but there's this term, the femini feminization of the school environment. So again, going back to my point on uh, guidance and counseling in schools, mm -hmm. um, they're very like girl centered. And so maybe most of the, 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 the teachers there are not able or very much equipped to, to, to tackle the challenges that are unique to boys. So maybe one way of doing that and maybe I don't know if this is a funder question or something that donors could address is maybe less feminizing of that um, school environment. But I was also encouraged by um, a World Bank report that was released relatively recently, I believe late last year, late 2021, on uh, the underachievement of boys. So that coming from the World Bank was really encouraging um, that we should, we should look at boys' disadvantages as well in school. So maybe donors are starting to look at that as a problem. And how to solve inequality in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. So from the Brazilian perspective, we have um, a very structured system, educational system, uh, which uh, the federal government and then state government and then municipal government. So even when we had the, the BNCC, the National Common Core, the, the states had to implement the National Common Core and adapt to its context. And then the municipalities were based in this so they could uh, build there. Um, so from my perspective, uh, it's um, a really difficult question to answer because uh, there is a very um, famous, at least in Brazil, uh, study from Madeira that takes blind tests uh, in, uh, from SAEB and from SAREHP, which is a Sao Paulo test score, a standardized test score um, that that they do in the state of Sao Paulo and compares it with the, the tasks that teachers uh, do in class. And when they when Madeira and, and co-authors compare these uh, studies, they see that uh, for black students, they uh, have uh, lower scores when uh, teachers are, are grading the tasks uh, when compared to in the same level of, of the blind test. So with the same score, uh, uh, black students keep getting like lower scores when they they, they are graded by teachers. So uh, the problem is um, it's so uh, systemic in, in our country. And but to so teacher training is something that really is um, uh, a, 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 a key piece for like uh, developing policies to reduce uh, the, the the racial uh, gaps and also racism in Brazil. But if this is not uh, uh, structured by the secretary, the departments, this will not uh, be able to, to move because uh, due to the, 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 the system in Brazil. So it has to, to depart from the secretary so that they can uh, actively uh, engage teachers on, on this. But this is a very hard topic in Brazil because uh, the racism is not uh, something that uh, we, we have like uh, it's a blind racism like people don't sometimes blind sometimes not so blind but people uh, don't think like if you ask for brazilian there is a, a opinion uh, a survey in brazilian 
that they ask, do you think you're a racist? And then people say no, but do you think there is racism? And people say yes. So uh, it's a very tricky uh, composition of society. And, and that's why it has to departure, departure from the, the, the secretaries of education. So then teacher can get trained. But uh, so just to, con to, to wrap up, um, the on our uh, uh work with this tool that we're developing with this specific um, municipalities, we are uh, uh, training them uh, an anti-racist um, uh, training uh, from my consultancy, a consultancy that is a consultancy focused on anti-racism in Brazil. And the people that will apply this tool and, and will uh, uh, like do this uh, structured survey in the, the departments uh, will have this training. So I think this is just uh, early beginning of something that could like be much more uh, bigger. So as a, a public policy in Brazil. Last round of questions. Sorry. Can I answer that question? Sorry. About, uh, oh, are there some teacher versus park? Yeah, sure. Is there uh, some online online questions? The one that you asked just now. Sorry, what? The one Lindsay had asked. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Lindsay's question. Yeah, why don't you answer that question about teacher versus bug? Um, sorry, let me take that question, please. Uh, I think it's super important to understand that there's many educational technologies, right? And I hope that my study shows that, you know, you just need to be extremely focused on what the technology is doing, right? And, and you know, when we talk about, you know, putting together, for example, summaries for policymakers, I really hope there is no summary that says ed tech is good or ed tech is bad, right? Because you brought this example with a MOOC. Um, I hope it's very clear a MOOC does something very different than um, trying to co-teach with a technology in the classroom. Technologies can do many different things. I, sh I think I hope that, that study has showed one negative effect. Technologies can do very amazing things uh, when it comes to, for example, personalizing instruction or if it's well done, uh, increasing the amount of students study after school. Right? Um, so I think, I, I hope there's more focus on that and, and greater appreciation that there are many different technologies, there are many different tools. We have to better understand what they do and in what cases they're, they're positive and what cases uh, they're, they're hurting. Um, so, so that's what I'm hoping for that requires nuance, but uh, if there's one thing, I hope um, that there's great appreciation that there's techno many technologies, um, they won't go away. Um, but they they can be used in different ways, and I hope there's appreciation for that. As you noted, the the challenges are going to be even greater with AI and you know the continued evolution of pressures on school systems to make use of what's out there. Um, but one thing you said in the paper that um, I thought was interesting is that uh, you know the these are quote unquote to some extent adjustment costs. You know. It's tough for a teacher to change what she's been he or she's been doing, and it takes time, extra work, et cetera. So it could it really it's very good that you're having a long term follow up because one can imagine that once those costs are played out, impacts could be different. Last round of questions, Greg. I have a question for Laura and a comment on for Victoria. Um, how do you deal with data, self-reported data um, issues, challenges with race? Uh, we've looked at some of the data in Brazil on teachers, and it's between 35 and 50 percent do not report any race. And in the north, it's closer to 50 percent. In the south, it's so. How have you have you how do you encourage states to 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 think about this? And with Victoria, one thing just I just wanted to share at the IDB um, in Latin America, we have a similar challenge, and a lot of our programs have focused on how do we attract more girls into STEM. And more recently, we've been trying to think about something that you just raised. How do we attract more boys into you know, early childhood programs or primary schools where still between 70 and 90 percent of teachers are, are women? And this may be something to, that we should, we should think about when we, when we think about these, these issues. Any other burning questions? Yes, Jacobus. Kind of care. I'm, I'm just interested if, if you've looked or thought about mechanisms like fear or self-confidence uh, for in-person, you know, that might be biased downwards, uh, especially for, for females. You find this interaction with gender, which is, which is really interesting. And Andreas, if you do have time, I'm, I'm interested to hear about another 
comparison to another study that Adrian Lucas and others did in India, where they show that in Pakistan, sorry, that uh, showing videos in the classroom actually improved uh, learning outcomes. Um, that might have been more pedagogical in terms of helping and less of an adoption cost for, for the teachers to do that. Thank you. If I could, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to say, Victoria, thanks um, so much of what you said, you said about in Kenya is true in, in other parts of the world as well. And I just wanted to add that, you know, uh, at least uh, in the classrooms that I spent so much time uh, post COVID, uh, you know, we've all had this discourse of learning loss, but actually in terms of classroom management you know teachers often said the problem was that they came back from COVID knowing too much uh, and and that knowing too much was very much a gendered phenomena and sort of you know linking the two halves of the, the, the panel today, uh, a lot of that was because of the gendered access to smartphones. And so, you know, the boys did have much more access to smartphones than the girls did. And uh, they came back knowing too much, which made uh, classrooms much more difficult for teachers to handle. So uh, would love to talk more. Thanks. If I could just use my prerogative here to ask why I had one thing. Um, you don't seem to talk about costs much. You know, one clear advantage of mobile technology is you could potentially cover many more students. Uh, you know, even if the quality of the assessment is not perfect, maybe the incremental uh, information you gain from a larger population sample might outweigh that. And also what Jacoba said, you know, there may be some distortion from the in-person side too. Right. Uh, so uh, thanks for those questions. Yes, that's possible. Uh, and just to position it again, um, we need to be aware of, so for instance, when we go to the policymakers, we just did some follow-ups based on this track learning. And when we go into the policymakers, the policymakers want to understand these, like, they, they often want to discount any finding if it is over the phone survey. Oh, this is not something that we do on a regular basis. So this is probably, mm -hmm. you're distorting somehow. And we just want to know, look, if you understand that as the as something, as a more conventional measure, th this is how the difference is. But again, uh, as I showed at the beginning, there is high correlation. So mm -hmm. it's not that uh, someone who is at the other spectrum of learning is doing uh, you know, opposite, diametrically opposite in the between these two modes. It's just how different they are. That's what we are measuring. Uh, but of course, the benefit of phone survey is you can do it faster, you can do it cheaper, and um, uh, with fewer human resources. So both, mm -hmm. you know, money and time. And uh, based on uh, to the other the, that question, that's a fantastic point. Unfortunately, because of the length of the survey that we had to impose, we could not measure. Um, you know, other, you know, measure these things which would have allowed us. We would have loved to, but um, couldn't. I'm sorry, everyone. We have 40 seconds now to wrap up. I would just think that the, the richness of the questions and the richness of the panel goes to my point that this, these two topics deserve a whole conference on their own. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panel.
Grab a seat. Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started as people continue to wander in. We'll let just a few more. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all again for being here. Um, I know I'm really excited for this session. I think in an in a conference focused on education systems and systems change, this topic of long term trajectories of change is a really critical one to dig into because I think this is kind of at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so I think at this point we know a lot and we've heard a lot, you know, in the last couple of days about the kind of the what works to improve learning outcomes. And I think that leaves us with two big pressing questions in the global education space, one of, of which is the kind of how to get it done, which is the implementation components that we've heard a lot about and we had the, the panel last night that dug into that a little bit. And the other is how to get it to last. Right. And so when I define that, that latter one, I would define as achieving this kind of deep transformational change that takes a low performing education system um, and turns it into one that's sustainably achieving uh, high and strong outcomes for the students in it. And we have four papers in this session that are going to speak to that topic um, from different angles. And they're in kind of roughly two groupings. So the first two papers um, look at the role of political commitment to change. Um, and the shape that that's taken in different contexts and time periods, um, uh, as well as uh, kind of, which I think is really important and even came out of it yesterday, how that kind of commitment to change has been enabled and supported in different contexts as well. So the first paper in that grouping is going to be one by Debbie and Luis, uh, which takes this phrase, long-term trajectories, the most literal of all the papers in my session. They do a, this great historical overview looking at how Korea and Japan emerged from being uh, relatively low performing to being quite high performing over the period of about 50 to 100 plus years. And so we're going to hear a lot about kind of what drove that change. Um, and they extract lessons on the role of this kind of deep national commitment um, to education in both of those transformation periods and experiences. And then we'll hear from Kat Patillo, who picks up this theme of political commitment um, and looks at why coalitions and political uh, commitment emerge in different contexts um, and in some places and not others. And I think hers does a nice job of bringing some of these contexts concepts from Debbie and Luis's paper into a kind of present day global south context. Uh, and then and then we'll hear two more papers um, uh, in this kind of second set that look at more specific reform efforts uh, and drawing out lessons from Ethiopia and South Africa. So we'll hear from Masele Araya, who's going to present on a period of reforms in Ethiopia, which produced somewhat paradoxical outcomes, which are quite interesting to dig into. Um, and I also think this paper does a nice job of uh, showing how difficult it can be to disentangle and explain outcomes in a complex policy environment. Um, and I don't know that I've ever found a policy environment that's not complex. So I think that's helpful for, uh, you know, thinking through how we should be thinking about disentangling these different um, drivers. And then finally, we'll hear from uh, Stephen, who's going to present on a structured pedagogy program in South Africa that tracked uh, individual students' long-term learning trajectories. And I think provides really important new evidence on spillovers and the impact of foundational learning for later educational outcomes, both kind of in the schooling and the learning front. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Debbie to kick us off. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. So as she mentioned, today I'm talking about a comparative education history uh, that Louise Crouch and I have spent the last like, oh gosh, year and a half working on um, as, as brought in by RISE and supported by RTI. Um, and we're explaining its re relevance to educational development today. So rather than zooming in on into specifics, 
um, about what Japan and Korea did um, and how to apply that elsewhere, we're actually going to take some meta lessons of specifically the why and the how of how each country um, experienced really, really remarkable education transformations. The why in each case was a deeply felt national purpose and a very clearly articulated role of education for national development and national unity. The how was proactive and nuanced policy borrowing and adaptation that was incredibly proactive, um, particularly for that, for that era. So quick overview, why Japan and Korea? Um, we're looking at Japan, um, 1880 to 1930, Korea, roughly 1945 to 1985, although some of the period that we're talking about actually starts in the later um, 19th century. In the sort of 1945 later period, we're talking here about um, South Korea. So they're both massive success stories that are non-Western. Um, massive catch-up transformation, um, going from a low level of literacy relatively to high in about 40 years. Um, today, they consistently top the international league table, tables. And what doesn't get emphasized enough is that their success has been remarkably equal. Um, there's tremendous within country equality, both in achievement on international assessments, as well as years of education. Um, and, and this work has been very intentionally, very intentional and very purposive, rather than a longer term sort of evolutionary change um, as is seen in other Western countries. Um, so they're very, they're borrowing and considering, as well as rejecting other, other ideas very explicitly. A quick check in on where they are now. Um, Japan and Korea, on average, in TIMS for 2015 in grade four maths, their average was two standard deviations above developing countries um, and, and quite above that of Netherlands and, and Finland as well. Um, and it, very importantly, using an inequality measure, they've got half the inequality of developing countries. So sort of low average performers in each of these countries are still performing incredibly well. And, and I think that's something that we're all sort of seeking, seeking to aspire to. So the purpose here, the why on this, was a very unique sort of response to external threats. Um, Japan had emerged from uh, self-imposed isolation during the Tokugawa era. Korea had a similar period of that. Um, and those were really sort of military-backed forced openings that took place in both countries. Um, in Japan, it was Matthew Perry's uh, expedition in 1853, uh, 1851 and 53, pardon me. In Korea, it was 1871. And there was a sort of a forced um, opening of each of each of these countries or societies at that point um, to Western commercial interests. So the responses were intensely nationalistic. They were modernizing, modernizing, um, and they weren't really a, a rejection of the West, but a recogni recognition of the importance of this commensurate, again, quote, modernization um, along ad adapted, contested, and negotiated lines of education policy. So specifically, Japan's concerns were military technology, which required a specific kind of industrialization, which required a certain kind of education. So part of our argument here that I'll get to later is a mild version of this actually occurred in post-colonial Africa as well. Um, but it got highly diluted for some various reasons that I'll get to in a minute. So the purpose here, again, this why this education was a critical role for this emerging national identity. Um, and education was defined very ex explicitly as very equal provision, um, that, that uh, education just for elites wasn't going to cut it and wasn't at all in line with this vision. Um, so they took a lot of care to distinguish um, national, and in, our, in the paper, um, which is itself 162 pages, um, we take care to, to distinguish national purpose for education and national unity um, from sort of a course uh, education for nationalism um, that, that we see in Germany and, in fact, Japan um, prior to, to and during World War II. So here we're talking about national purpose versus nationalism. We go pretty deep into this distinction, and I'm going to gloss over it just a little bit here because, because of time. Um, so the language in the foundational documents was incredibly beautiful. It was poetic. Um, we don't see that in education documents now. Um, we don't see that level of sort of um, moving emotion, um, and it was really appreciated Education was appreciated um, not as a proxy or as a lever to improve economic outcomes or health outcomes, but really as its own goal. So that deep ownership was a manifestation of that deep owned purpose. Um, I want to note that there wasn't any external donor influence in Korea or Japan um, prior to World War II. 
Um, and there was a really deep questioning of policies that were borrowed in both cases. Um, Japan that came from journals, it came from education associations, the Korean Education uh, Educational Development Institute, as well as some, um, some interesting, very interesting relationship with um, a contingent from Florida State University took place in Korea. Um, and it really, that deep ownership has become sort of a buzzword over the past decade or longer, not because it's sort of good development practice, but in these cases, it was really arising from this very, very deep purpose. So getting into the how, um, both countries undertook really, really interesting policy borrowing missions. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to go a little more deeply into the Iwakura mission. Um, in addition to the United States, they visited Australia, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Russia, Sweden, and Switzerland. I did have to write that down. Um, and a full half of the high ranking officials from the new Meiji government went on this. So imagine, imagine being so committed to educational development that you send fully half of your high ranking officials to on an international trip for two years to learn about what's going on from other educational countries. This is the level of commitment that I'm, that I'm speaking of here. And this 107 member delegation, um, experience, their experience was quite heterogeneous. Um, so the, their impressions were very heterogeneous. And this shaped subsequent education reforms for decades. Um, those who went on this mission continued working in government um, for decades, and their perspectives and what they saw and how they interpreted it continued to shape subsequent reforms for quite some time. Um, and they weren't uncritical observers either. Um, they were very unimpressed with prim primary provision in Europe and France and Russia, quite particularly um, working class education provision in England. Um, they saw that as likely to, to really reproduce the kinds of social inequalities um, that the Japanese delegation wanted to leave behind via these education reforms. Um, so there's a really solid history here of proactive, nuanced policy borrowing. Um, and that meant that once donors got into the game post-World War II, there was an institutional memory of really careful consideration and contextualization and adaptation of any proposed policies. Um, and so there's not really losing sight of national identity um, and purpose even after the, the horrors um, of Japanese nationalistic education in the first half of the, 20, um, the 20th century. As they emerged from that era, there was still a very strong national purpose that was quite revised, um, but unity and purpose um, was part of education even after that era. So I want to dive really quickly into developing countries, which is way too large. Um, uh, a topic to, to sort of dive into here, but we're, we use in the paper Ghana, Tanzania, South Africa, and Zimbabwe um, as proxies. So the early speeches of Pan-African leaders were really beautiful. They were full of purpose for education as a driver for national unity um, and national identity. Um, but there was really a disconnect um, between the bureaucracy with the, with the bureaucracy and the law, laws. So white papers from this era really don't reflect that same level of purpose that you, you read from Pan-African leaders' speeches. Um, and the introduction of education planning documents, which were typically um, co-authored by UNESCO during this era, were rife with um, refer to education's role in both social and economic development. Um, but subsequent plans really focused exclusively on educational development. Um, you know, national level education system blueprints really kind of served to fulfill these human capital needs of manpower surveys um, and sort of lost some of this sort of higher purpose. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. There's strong influence of manpower um, surveys for, for social development goals during that time. Um, there was lack of commensurate surveys for the, the more social development goals. Um, and a genuine need, frankly, for economic growth um, to fund all this education that, that they're looking at. Um, so um, I'm writing a paper, right? We're breaking this into a smaller paper right now, and I'm working on this bit. Um, so I, if, I'd love to talk to you if you've got more thoughts on this afterwards. Um, so through this, we came up with a policy borrowing framework to compare the why and the how of Japan and Korea's education transformations to countries like Ghana, Tanzania, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. We put together a series of questions, sort of a framework, to analyze a country's engagement with purpose and whether policies are borrowed in a manner that remains true to that purpose. So how do you tell when purpose is being engaged? Who is engaged um, in defining the direction of the education sector? What's their position in society? Moral leadership, technical reputation, what's their power to truly make it happen? Now, what does the, the process of policy borrowing look like? Oop, apologies. Um, when policies and ideas are borrowed, 
Are they worked over, tested? Are they contested? Um, for, and, and are they for delivering results in a similar environments at a reasonable cost with cultural fit? Um, how much energy is put into incrementally observing practice from the ground up through natural variation? Um, and then sort of codify that into a ministry policy. Or the policies and practices being considered based on two or three gold standard RCTs. Um, you know, how truly networked uh, are the and ongoing are the networks that, and social groups that are defining these kinds of things? And where, where is the energy and the drive for engagement coming from? Um, is it the donors who are calling the meetings, um, really vetting the ideas and deciding whether they're on plan or not? Um, are they writing out the research agenda? <sighs> how? So whether the process about whether actors can do um, is, is more important than the specifics of institutional arrangements, at first at least. Um, you know, the, the, are the discussions focusing on imitating form for the source, uh, the sake of appearance? Do we have to have an emis because that's how we look like we're doing the rational thing? Um, or does it focus more meaningfully on how to relate to action, action to results, and whether that kind of relating can be done in practice on the ground by frontline education actors? So the borrowing framework um, engages with substantive issues. Are these policies being borrowed from the right place? Are the countries that they were borrowing from, in fact, successful according to whatever metrics um, you're imagining or, or are important? Um, and do we know that those policies are actually what's related to that success and it's not third factors? Um, how tied are the policies being borrowed to the historical sociology and politics of the uh, originating country? The United States has unsuccessfully tried to export its land grant university um, program for decades now, um, despite that being really rooted in its in the United States independent 19th century family farm system. So is the borrowing motivation deeply in line with education system improvement goals? Or is it more superficial? Is it to be seen to be in fashion? Is it to meet bureaucratic checklists? Um, or maybe an electoral policy promise that isn't really truly felt across the populace? And how much questioning and adaptation can be done or has been done? Um, have the constraints to implementation been analyzed by the implementers themselves? Um, is the adaptation, the adaptation process as well can be a, a way to sort of sell these ideas um, internally, build support for and buy in for them as opposed to catching implementers, particularly teachers off guard with new policies. And, and then there's some marketing issues as well. So whose impulse drove the borrowing? Was it donors? Was it teachers? Was it educators? Um, what, and what is the policy lender's agenda? Um, you know, not, to, not to single out Finland, um, but there is absolutely a bit of a cottage industry in exporting um, what sort of what Finland has done to other countries. Um, so is there a reputation on the line? Is there consulting fees on the line? Um, so we've got a minute left and I'm going to fly through these lessons. Um, <laughs> I would love to talk to if there are questions at the end um, about this. So what are the lessons that we can apply? Um, an education system's purpose must be agreed and really felt um, at the outset. Um, there's no way to borrow policies without contesting it through adaptation and iteration. Um, and the means are important. You notice I didn't talk at all about what Japan and Korea actually did. We're talking about how they were borrowed. Um, and when, once you're borrowing means, you understand um, sort of how to fit them into the purpose uh, and whether they fit the purpose or not. And numerical indicators are of course important and they're useful. Um, but it but shouldn't be confused with purpose. If you've got any questions, follow up here um, and look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. While we're waiting for the slides, I just want to wake everybody up a bit because I'm a teacher at heart. So what I'm going to do is say, if I call out what you are, you're going to stand up. So stand up if you are a professor at a university. Stand up if you work at a think tank or a research organization. We have a lot of those. Stand up if you're a PhD student in progress or a postdoc. Those are the people who might be on the job market, so look out for them. Uh, stand up if you work for a government. I know we have at least one here. Oh, we've got two. Yeah, they're proud to present. Um, and did I miss? Oh, stand up if you're a funder. I know you might not want to identify yourself, but you've got to do it. I know there's a few of you in the room. 
Those are the ones you need to go chat with if you have an organization. And stand up if you're an implementer, like an NGO or a nonprofit or a company doing work. Awesome. There's a lot of those too. Uh, if I missed you, stand up. <laughs> so that's everybody. Great. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk about what enables hubs and political will and coalitions for education reform, specifically using examples from India and Brazil. And first, I want to take you to Nairobi in 2016 when I moved there. So this was a really exciting time. We had Shopko and Bridge Innovative Schools both launched a decade earlier in 2008. We had the Uezo study um, and Armando's here coming out telling us that learning outcomes weren't changing. We had the Tusome reform forms coming in government. Um, and we had the fiber optic cables being laid to Kenya, which brought M-Pesa and other waves of tech innovation and enable a lot of ed tech to come, like Ineza education. And then we also had coming the government's competency-based education reforms. Alongside that, we had later in the Human Capital Index that Kenya was ranked first out of all African countries, tied with Algeria, Algeria putting aside two African islands. And so Kenya was really, at this time, and still is in many ways, Africa's hub for education, innovation, and reform. And I was lucky enough to be part of it. And this got me thinking about why does this happen? So why do certain places at certain times become hubs for innovation in certain topics? And so you'll see this happens for many different topics throughout history. So places like Athens or Paris or Silicon Valley, places at certain times actually are enable, become hubs that enable innovation on certain topics. And so I became really interested in why does this happen specifically for education? And so when I came to do my master's at Oxford, decided to focus on these two questions. So why does this happen specifically for education reforms and innovation in global South contexts? And specifically when coalitions emerge for education reform in those contexts, what forms do they take? And so this was a master's thesis, which involved two main pieces. I did a shadow, a survey of shadow cases across 106 countries to sort of identify where was more innovation reforms happening. And then I dived into two case studies from India and Brazil. And this mainly builds on literature and political sociology. Um, I also, after doing the study, spent three months in Brazil and a month and a half in India as research and turning this into a book about seven principles to transform education systems. And with the survey, I was really looking for three things. So innovations led by nonprofits and companies, where was there more political will and government reforms, and where were their coalitions, which I define as a group of actors all working towards a shared goal related to education reform. And we'll see that this is pretty obvious. Most places are not hubs. So these are just some examples on this slide, but essentially for very obvious reasons in places where there's more war and conflict or they have issues like political crises or they're predominantly rural, there's just not as much education innovation and reform happening. And so you might have cases where in a rural country, the government is leading a specific reform or a place where, you know, in a context where there's war, there's organizations working to do education in those contexts, but there's typically not as many because they're much more challenging environments to work in and harder to set up in. But what we do see is that there are at least 20 hubs in Global South context. So this is just a really surface level dive. I really hope someone could do a much deeper analysis than I did of where in the Global South are hotspots. But these are the ones that I identified. And you'll recognize a lot of these from the RISE research, you know, from the work that Jonathan London has done on Vietnam, for example. Um, but I can send you these slides if you're interested. I'm going to go through these pretty fast. But these are places like Sierra Leone, where David Senge has been leading a lot of really interesting reforms, like Punjab province in Pakistan, Ecuador, um, Luminos, who I think is here doing work in Ethiopia, South Africa's data-driven districts initiative, Mined Lab in Peru. These are some of the examples of the hubs that exist. And then diving into two specific cases of hubs in Delhi and Sao Paulo, I chose these because they're very similar in many ways, but they also have a couple key differences. So these are both huge cities, some of the biggest cities in the world, in some of the world's largest countries. Um, and they have these examples of coalitions, but they're pretty different in the sense that in Brazil, the Movimento Palabasi coalition was led and initiated by philanthropy by Lehman Foundation, who's here. You can talk to Daniel and Laura more about this. Um, and it was an example of where there wasn't as much political will around an issue 
issue at the beginning, but this coalition was unable to build that political will over many years in a very challenging context. Um, and in contrast, in Delhi, um, Admi Party is an example where a political party started and decided they, they had the political will to prioritize education, and they gathered a coalition of NGOs and technical experts to, to design and deliver a set of reform efforts in also very challenging context. So Ahmadmi Party was a new party coming out of an anti-corruption campaign, and they won in a very sort of upset election in 2015. They won power over the Delhi Municipal Assembly, which oversees the Delhi Union territory, and began doing a very rapid process of reform. And you can read the amazing book that RISE put out by Yamini Iyer and others that's about a specific program that was part of the reforms. Um, and these are some of the partners that were involved in various ways. And this impacts over 1.8 million students who are in Delhi's school system. Um, they had the Dalai Lama launch a happiness curriculum. On the top right is Manish Sisodia, who was the former deputy minister doing a school visit. Um, on the left, the New York Times featured them in a front page article. Um, and on the right, you can see how they, how the party actually uses this narrative of what they call the Delhi Education Revolution as a marketing tool, essentially. Um, and this, they really picked education and used it as a way to, to build their brand to voters. Um, and in contrast, in Brazil, the Lehman Foundation essentially decided that they wanted to pick a specific policy that they wanted to influence that would shift Brazil's education system. And after looking at a lot of examples around the world, including the US Common Core, they decided national learning standards were going to be the issue that they would focus on. And so they decided to start this coalition um, that ended up including over 65 leaders from across government, civil society, academia. And they successfully, over many years, um, influenced the adoption of a national learning standards curriculum policy. Um, and there's great work by Lehman Foundation about this online. On the right is a snapshot from one of the MPB meetings in progress. On the left is just an example of how education can be very politicized in Brazil. And there were a lot of protests actually against the policy that they were advocating for. It was very contentious in many ways. Um, and what we learned, so there's kind of two pieces to this, and the first piece is about these 13 factors. And what we see is that on the left, there's a lot that's outside of any one actor's control in order to enable these kinds of hubs and political will and coalitions to occur. And on the right, there actually are a lot of things that we as people in this room and actors can do to enable this to be more likely to happen. And so one example is actually just having a city. So there's a lot of literature about how urbanization enables enables more transfer and flow of ideas and innovations. Um, there's also research about how it accelerates activist networks and social movements and revolutions. But essentially, having a bigger city is better for the purposes of innovation. And that's not really anything one person can enable to happen in urbanization in certain places. Also, having more money in a place can help. It doesn't necessarily help, because you could have a lot of wealthy people who don't really care about education. But in some cases, um, if they decide to take the step, it could be really helpful. And so in India and Brazil, you had Ashish Dewan, who was in private equity and decided to start Central Square Foundation. And in Brazil, you had Jorge Paulo Lehman, who started Lehman Foundation. Um, and both of these individuals were really influential, and their foundations were in creating enabling ecosystems um, in their context, obviously alongside the huge teams that they built to do so. Um, one other factor, which is a little trickier to talk about, is about how certain places just have more of a history of collective action. And I argue that this actually can be really useful. Um, and so, for example, in Brazil, you have this history of this practice called Muchiwa, which is basically villages coming together to build barns or do other shared activities together. In India, you have these concepts of seva and samaj, of service. Um, and in both contexts, you have lots of social movements from various causes that have existed. And so on the left, you'll see Paulo Freire, who led literacy campaigns in Brazil. On the right to see Gandhi and the non-independence movement um, and the independence movement, sorry. And in Brazil, you have a specific legacy of their structure of the government being coalitional presidentialism. So they have this history of coalitions in government that was really helpful for coalitions to emerge. You also have 
things that just happen by surprise that no one really can control. So for example, in Brazil, during this coalition, you had the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff, which created a huge challenge for the coalition. You also had the election of Bolsonaro, who was really anti-education policies in many ways. And in the Delhi case, you had the head of the reforms, Manish Sisodia, was arrested. So I spent two weeks shadowing him in February. And a week after I said goodbye, he was arrested. And he's still currently in jail as we speak, which obviously caused caused a huge challenge for the reform process. Um, and in both cases, you know, these political events really shaped the rollout and created, sometimes it was easier for them to move forward and sometimes it was more difficult. And particularly in India, the climate around the central government and the BJP trying to crack down on journalists and opposition parties has created a real problem for Op, who is an opposition party. Um, what's also key is just having talent and leaders to actually work and lead reforms. And so in both cases in Brazil, you have the Lehman Fellowship on the left, the right side of the left photo is a Lehman Fellow who's been key in government in Brazil. And on the right side, you have a Teach for India Fellow who leads a nonprofit that's been a key partner in the op reforms. Um, but why is this important? Because people really do matter. And so if you have leaders who are committed to leading change and who um, have political will, they can make the difference. And in both cases, it was just three leaders who actually initiated these reform and coalition processes. Obviously, a lot of other factors and people were necessary for them to succeed, but it really was the actions of three leaders. And if we invest in these networks of leaders and emergence of will amongst those networks, that really can matter. Also, seeding um, organizations who can actually implement. So on the left is examples of Lehman Foundation's portfolio. They've invested in over 100 organizations. On the right is part of Central Square Foundation's theory of change. Both funders really single-handedly helped accelerate there to be a lot of talent in organizations testing innovations in each of their ecosystems, which enabled both of these coalitions. We also see the role of data. You're familiar with the story of PAL. Um, shout out to Armando again, because Acer was really key in the India case. And so Sisodia talks about how when he was a journalist, he covered the Acer results. And this was part of what made him decide to care about education and part of why he convinced um, Army Party to focus on education as an issue. Um, you can also think about training and spreading activist skills very intentionally. So this is Dennis Misne, who's now head of Lehman Foundation. In his time before, when he led Sue de Paz and was an activist on gun control issues, and during that time, he learned a lot about what makes advocacy work well and what doesn't, and he was trained by a foundation on how to do participatory strategic planning, which he says was very key in shaping his understanding of advocacy. And then when he became head of Lehman Foundation, that was part of the skill set he brought. Um, also having exposure to progressive education models. So Atishi, a leader who's been key in the op uh, movement, actually taught at an innovative school that was started by an educationist, Krisha Murthy, which shaped her experience um, and commitment to education later on as a politician. We also have cross-border sharing. I'm totally going to steal Debbie's term of the policy borrowing I need to get that right, but this is essentially a similar example where both of these coalitions visited other places and decided to take models from um, Finland, US and other places. And also on these trips, they weren't just about knowledge sharing, they were also about trust and really building solidarity amongst movement members, which, which theory shows is very key for coalitions to succeed. They also, in both cases, have organizations that are specifically tasked with orchestrating the coalition. So you have MPB in Brazil. In India, you have the government itself, but also supporting actors like the NGO Education Alliance that are specifically trying to help coordinate all these different pieces that are necessary in a coalition. And they also have, both of them, this a piece about co-creation and policy design. Um, and in the Brazil example, they had a lot of forums with states, municipalities, and Sisodia specifically often invited teachers and principals to his house to get their input on policies, like in this photo. Um, what we see is that you essentially need enabling factors for a place. You need people to actually lead a coalition. And then coalitions can take at least two forms. I'm sure there's many more. Um, and I'm just going to whip through some of these examples. So I have if you, I'll send you the slides if you want to read specifically um, more about all the steps. But essentially, we have one that I call the strike scenario, which is where a coalition can happen very fast because essentially politicians decide to do it. And so this is things like having um, a commitment to actually prioritize education. You'll see the head of CSF speaking about how OP did that here. Um, you have all these different technical support that they brought in. And all of these have a lot more detail in the actual thesis if you want to read it. Um, it's things like co-design 
and it's having trust to overcome the bureaucracy and all the different resistance that they faced in the Delhi case. Um, and then you also just have to have luck, like the fact that Op was able to suddenly win um, power um, in the time that they did. Um, and then they also face challenges like the arrest. Um, or the second channel is what I call the slow build process. So this is essentially, you know, you have a coalition that builds that political will over a long period of time for MPB. It took them five years from inception of when they first started talking about this to when they actually got the policy adopted. And it's been many more years after that of trying to support the implementation process. So it can take a very long time. Um, and this involves factors like the Lehman Foundation itself actually deciding to take on advocacy and Dennis's commitment to that. Um, it's things like Julia, who actually did the MPP here, talking about how they were able to bring together people from different political parties who didn't even want to sit at the same table, or one of them didn't even want to board the plane. Um, other factors yeah. here, um, and okay. yeah, okay, then we'll be done. <laughs> Great, email me if you want to talk more about it. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's coming. OK. Uh, thank you for the first two presenters uh, for explaining the uh, how education reform is a complex and highly politicized task that simplifies my work. And I speak a bit on education reform and learning uh, outcomes in Ethiopia and a joint work with Hodnot uh, uh, and uh, colleagues at the Real Center. So to give you a uh, background, it, the Ethiopian education has been very dynamic over recent years with a number of uh, interventions uh, with respect to uh, quality of improvement or quality of education reform. And uh, under uh, three phases, we have this GQ program, which is a general education program improvement uh, uh, and started 2008 under uh, three phases, especially the first phase were more of on uh, input focus, uh, especially in terms of constructing schools in remote areas, as well as uh, school supplies like textbooks. And then in the second phase, we have more of a process to uh, supplement, I mean, to, uh, I mean, to complement this school enrollment with some uh, school uh, improvement like teacher training centers or something like this. And then in the third phase, we have equity focus reform, uh, focusing on uh, girls, uh, students with disabilities, and students in nomadic uh, areas. So uh, this is the bug, I mean, uh, complex uh, system we have. And then if you see on the theory of change, because the reform had about six components, uh, but we'll focus on the uh, second component, the teacher development program, and how this has been impacting uh, uh, learning outcomes course, uh, learning outcome of students. Basically, the channels are just straightforward and simple. If you have some uh, pre-service teacher training, in-service teacher training, licensing activities, then it will lead to improved content knowledge, pedagogical uh, skills, as well as to learning outcomes of uh, students. So uh, with this, uh, we have an object we have objectives like to examine how learning levels of grade four had changed between 2012 and 2018, and then how this improvement in teacher content knowledge is associated with uh, learning outcomes or learning progress of students. And we'll see, uh, uh, we'll also see some of the benefits who have been benefited, uh, who have been benefited from this uh, system. Uh, basically, we have two data. We are using two data here. Uh, it's not really uh, an impact evaluation, just it just comparison and looking at some association of the reform uh, using the Young Life baseline collected as a start of the GQ program too, because here we are focusing on the second phase of the program instead of just all over the programs because we do have different cohort, uh, cohorts of students that will just compare two cohorts for the purpose of this presentation. So in 2012, we have uh, Young Lives, which is uh, nested under the broader Young Lives uh, 
uh, study, uh, and uh, we collect data from 90 schools and 500 students with some tests twice in a year, uh, and teacher content knowledge and full teacher and school uh, surveys and some household uh, data. Similarly, RISE has been very innovative to link uh, its uh, design with the young lives, and we, can, we just administer the same pattern of tests and from about 168 schools and 3,000 uh, plus uh, students with the same test and uh, teacher content knowledge uh, structure and household data. The tests just were calibrated and linked with young lives using item response uh, theory and with somehow 500 mean and 100 standard deviation. Uh, the item basically just item function well uh, with acceptable, uh, 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 I mean, item difficulties and discrimination uh, uh, indexes. But we have some alteration, in fact, because we have been testing the student twice of a year at the beginning and the end. The young life about, has about 14% uh, of alteration and about 18% for the uh, young life. And it will take consideration the alteration in the analysis. We have, uh, we just made a value added model because just how student has achieved over the school year with uh, standing or starting from the baseline. And we just run different uh, separate regressions for the young lives and uh, uh, rise surveys as we cannot combine as the students are different uh, cohorts. So, but we also just run conditional quantiles so that we'll able to see the distribution uh, who has been just benefited from the reform and check it for some alteration uh, weights as well. And then overall, what we can see uh, in the first instance is we found a declining average test score uh, in the system. Uh, when you see some of the baseline and inline, obviously the learning level, the average test score has been lower for the rise uh, cohort than the young lives. Uh, but I mean, this has to be uh, uh, seen in the context of rapid increase and quite uh, uh, unprecedented access uh, to in terms of enrollment. Uh, because if we just uh, triangulate or if we support this data with some of uh, coming from the Ministry of Education within this period under the GQ2, about 3 million additional new students joined the primary school. Uh, uh, in a sense, from about 16 million to 19 million students have been there within the Ethiopian primary education system. So there, has been, there seems to be a change in the composition of uh, students in the classroom, and which has to do with much of the decline and the average test score. I mean, if, if students are coming uh, to the systems, particularly first generation learners, it's natural to find, it's natural to see or uh, a declining average test score. But on the other side, uh, we find somehow improvement in teacher content knowledge as well as teacher qualification. In fact, the teacher qualification is an index of somehow experience, specialization in matters and teaching experiences. So uh, we have we find relative 2012 uh, teachers in 2018 had higher qualification in terms of degrees or specialization in matters and above all, uh, higher content knowledge. If you see the distribution, probably uh, it's just uh, the rise side, it's just to the left, to the right side, and then the young lives to the uh, left side, which indicates that there has to be some improvement on the teacher content knowledge. So our purpose was to link the teacher content knowledge with the student learning progress. Obviously, the baseline is lower for the young lives, I mean, for rise than the young lives that we are trying here the learning progress over the school year uh, with somehow uh, the end line. So if you see the simple correlation or association, obviously the teacher content knowledge has been just somehow insignificant the young lives, but here in terms of the teacher content knowledge for the uh, rise, it was just somehow uh, significant, positively associated for both boys and uh, girls. The same is true for the masses. Uh, teacher uh, qualification and obviously a class size and others have been somehow uh, negatively related for some reasons. 
And the same is true, we just disaggregate by household wealth. This indicates that uh, students from the poorest have been uh, benefit, uh, have benefited from the uh, uh, system or teacher content knowledge. Uh, as you can see just at the top, it's about uh, 12 scale uh, points uh, in terms of learning value or learning progress for the, the right. And the same is true for rural. Students from rural have been benefited from only, uh, just knowledgeable teacher in terms of uh, mathematics uh, for the right survey. And to see somehow the distribution uh, who have been uh, just uh, whether students at the bottom of the distribution uh, have benefited from the teacher content knowledge, uh, obviously that is uh, our just findings that that benefit increased as we go down or to the bottom of the uh, uh, quantile. So uh, it's about 12 scaled points, and then probably even the top are not benefiting. It's very difficult to justify, but probably, uh, if you can assume, I mean, probably strong students may not just need this much support from knowledge of teacher or whatever the reason, but I highly positive with the students at the bottom or weaker students have been benefiting from as a system, but we can't find this much strong association in the, uh, for the Young Lives uh, study. Uh, we uh, further disaggregate the schools uh, to see some, uh, whether there would be some uh, resampling issue, I mean sampling issue. Uh, so we group, we try to group the schools into four groups because here we have young lives. Uh, we have common schools between rice and young lives. So the group one are schools who have only data at the baseline 2012. And the group two schools are uh, schools in both rise and young lives, but who have data only for, two, for 2012. And group three are schools who are common in both surveys, but who have data only uh, uh, 2018. And obviously group four are only sampled in uh, right. So we see the same pattern. I mean, if we see the common schools, we have the same structure with overall uh, sample, uh, which means that uh, sampling may not have this much uh, some issue uh, for this uh, study. And we found that group three schools and group four uh, have higher uh, learning progress in relation to teacher content uh, knowledge. Uh, probably to uh, the conclusion is, obviously average test score has been declining over time, but and on the reverse, uh, teacher content knowledge has improved and it has been uh, positively associated with learning outcomes and the magnitude even increases over time because it has somehow uh, positively a positive relation with young lives, but the magnitude increases uh, with the rise ones. Uh, so the key to reconcile is probably the system has been working quite in multiple ways. In one, uh, it has been changing the composition of the student body uh, with who attend the school. And on the other side, it has been increasing the amount of learning uh, with, uh, which, which takes place within the classroom. Uh, that's just what, what I can say in terms of the seemingly paradox uh, findings. But generally what uh, we can conclude is uh, to improve learning, I mean, in such large education reform, it's very difficult to see the impact in a short time because it takes long time and it needs somehow sustained commitment, uh, engaging local actors, because there are just different uh, actors within the education reform as well as focusing on uh, equity. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, well, I can start by saying good morning, everyone. Great. Um, and I can start by introducing my co-author. So I'm, I'm Stephen Taylor I'm from South Africa. I work in the Department of Basic Education, uh, which is its government department. Uh, and one of my co-authors works with me there, uh, Nompomulele Mothwane, you might know her as Mbumi. Uh, and then other co-authors with us today is Yakweba Saliers, 
and Matthew Jukes. Uh, and not with us today is Jonathan Stern and Bram Fleisch. Um, and we are going to be presenting on the long run effects of an experiment we ran between 2015 and 2017 in South Africa. It was a, an early grade reading um, intervention. And we, we're looking here at the long run effects uh, at, at year seven or four years after the intervention was completed. The motivation for this uh, research, obviously, is that I think foundational literacy and numeracy, by the way, ha has become a big uh, development priority in recent years. I think uh, groups such as this have been given a lot of attention to it. Um, we've moved away from just looking at access to school to, to the quality and especially to early learning um, as a foundation. Reading in particular, I think, is seen as a gateway to, to later learning and as a foundational skill that other learning builds on. Um, we also know we have a big problem in this area in many countries, uh, and in South Africa in particular, we have a, a big problem around it. The latest PILS results suggest that uh, about 81% of South African children reach grade four without having reached an acceptable level of reading comprehension. Um, so we know we have a challenge there, uh, and that's why we, we increasingly regarding early learning interventions and early grade reading interventions as, as a potentially cost-effective a way to intervene in, in the school system. But I think the, the ultimate cost effectiveness of those kinds of programs will depend on whether the impacts persist over time um, on things like uh, staying in school and, and, and your ultimate educational attainment, but also on, on later learning outcomes. And theoretically, there are various reasons to expect that there would be persistence and even compounding of, 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 of benefits of having received a, a good early, early learning intervention. Uh, um, for instance, if reading is regarded as this gateway, then perhaps getting a solid reading intervention early on uh, opens up opportunities to learn elsewhere and the effects actually combine, compound when you look at later learning. On the other hand, there are reasons to expect possible fade outs of, of impact that maybe if, if the rest of your schooling is not of a high enough quality, or perhaps if the, the skills that are impacted in, in the foundational learning um, only partly translate into later skills, then you might expect some sort of a fade out over time. So it is to some extent an empirical question that I think not many studies have focused on yet. And also not many studies have actually looked at how specific early skills end up begetting later skills or leading to, to later skills. And we're trying to make a contribution to that. So the study design is that we're building on this initial randomized evaluation uh, known as the early grade reading study. Um, it was a structured learning program that had uh, that targeted home language literacy in the Northwest province of South Africa, where the home language is Setswana. Um, and it provided teachers with a combination of lesson plans, of additional reading materials, and on-site coaching. Um, it was done between 2015 and 2017, while the cohort of learners went from grade one to grade three. Uh, the initial findings was that it led to a 0.24 standard deviation increase in home language literacy and reading, which was the primary targeted outcome of the program. Um, we also, by the way, did find one year later after the program ended that there was a sustained impact on learning uh, and also on teaching practice uh, that had also uh, to some extent had a sustained impact and so the current study now builds on this by looking at the same cohort of children um, by uh, four years after the intervention ended so most children would be in grade seven assuming they haven't repeated however we can just look at at, at how progression actually turned out for the control group and the treatment group um, maybe starting right at the bottom we see um, a slightly higher rate of school level attrition in the coaching group. Um, that schools that closed. Um, so we, we regard that as totally random that there just happened to be, I think three or four schools that closed uh, amongst the intervention group and only one or two, uh, I think one school that closed in the control group. Um, if we look at the top end though, uh, children who reached grade seven without any delay, um, then we see a, a higher proportion of children who are in grade seven in the treated group. So we do find some impact, uh, and we also ran some regressions on this, some positive impact on progression, on grade progression, reaching grade seven. And that might turn out to be more important with time because one of the risk factors for dropping out of school in secondary school is, is a kind of a delayed uh, school trajectory. Um, that, that like high rate, rates for repetition tends to be a risk factor for dropping out of school. Um, because of being overaged. 
Um, just some uh, brief differences in means before we, we look at the regression results. And this is partly being shown to show you the kinds of uh, items that were assessed. Um, so uh, we had a range of home language items, which is Setswana uh, is the language, uh, starting with um, some, this is by grade seven now. So from the early grade reading assessment type of items, we still had oral reading fluency uh, and some comprehension based on that oral reading fluency passage. Um, but then we also included a written comprehension item, which was one of the released items from the PEARLS assessment. Uh, and we had that for home language in Setswana. And then we also had some English items, also the EGRA type stuff, but also a PEARLS item, a written comprehension item uh, in English. And just, just casting your eye, you see sort of moderate impacts across most of these items. But, but what I want to focus on is this table, because this table restricts the sample to children who are assessed both at wave four and at wave five. Because um, we want to look for the same sample, it's restricted to the same sample, and also this, the items that were common across, across time. Um, so there's three main items here that were, that were common across time. One was the uh, oral reading fluency in home language, which is Setswana, columns five and six. Um, then it was also the, the home language written comprehension, columns seven and eight there, and the English written comprehension, uh, columns nine and 10. And uh, for the, if we compare column five and six, uh, uh, you and you might wanna focus on the standard deviation effect scores on, in the bottom row, um, we see uh, very, very similar impact sizes at grade four and grade seven, it's way four and five, um, which translates in terms of words per minute to about six additional words per minute. Um, for the Setswana written comprehension, we also see very, very similar effect sizes. Uh, so persistence, you might say, across those two uh, common items for the same samples of children who we looked at at both points in time. For English written comprehension, which was not the primary targeted outcome of the program, um, here we didn't see a big uh, impact, statistically significant impact in wave four, but by the time we get to wave five or grade seven, we now do start to see a statistically significant impact on English written comprehension. Um, and so that points to a positive spillover effect into a second language, uh, which, which becomes an important language for learning and teaching beyond the first three years of school in South Africa. Um, and so it's, it's suggesting that there is kind of an overall persistence of, of effects, but perhaps we start to see some spillover into emerging important skills uh, later on. Next, I want to look at uh, some quantile regressions to look at uh, impacts across the distribution. Um, and this, the first two here are for grade two. So early on, initial impacts of the program. Uh, and if we look at a letter sound recognition in Setswana, which is, which is a very, uh, maybe an early foundational skill, we see an overall impact across the distribution, but the impact is, is largest uh, perhaps in the, in the lower to mid range of the distribution. Um, whereas at the same point in time, if we looked at oral reading fluency, which is a slightly more advanced reading skill, word, words read correctly per minute from a paragraph, you see that the impacts were largest in the middle to upper range of the distribution. If we then look at it in grade seven, and, and something got a bit messed up in the translation to, to the screen, uh, but that's fine. This is grade seven quantile regressions. Um, for oral reading fluency, now it's sort of a uniform impact, whereas a grade two initially, you'll remember in the previous slide, it was, mid to, it was mid to upper range of the distribution, which was most impacted on oral reading fluency. In grade seven, it's sort of across the distribution, uh, but actually, if anything, slightly largest at the lowest end of the distribution, and we do see a statistically significant impact on, on the likelihood of, of scoring zero uh, in, 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 in that item. Um, if we look at written comprehension in Setswana on the right and on the bottom, English written comprehension, which are now more advanced skills, uh, we see the impact is, is do, uh, dominant in the upper end of the distribution in the top sort of 20 to 30% of the performance distribution. And so what we're, what we're thinking this may imply is that, um, that looking at performance impacts, uh, impacts across performance distribution, the answer is not as quite as simple as the intervention was most effective for the upper or the lower end of the distribution, but rather that there may have been a somewhat uniform impact 
but the impact's going to depend on what skill you're looking at, at, at it through uh, and at what point in time. So that if you're looking at it uh, when the intervention was first implemented, targeting uh, foundational literacy skills, that's where you see the, the, the impact on oral reading fluency for the upper part of the distribution and letter sounds for the lower part of the distribution. But by the time you get to grade seven, oral reading fluency is now a kind of a, an earlier skill that is not so much where you see a difference for the stronger students. You see that difference for the lower part of the distribution. But now the, 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 the better students are starting to get impacted in, in the more advanced skills. Um, so thinking about these findings then, um, I think at a, at a basic level, we do see some sustained impact to year seven. Um, we see that impact on progression to grade seven, which I think with time might become a more important factor. Um, we also see a sustained impact on literacy outcomes, both the primary uh, targeted outcome, which was home language reading and literacy, um, but also um, in English as well. And by the time we get into grade seven, um, that impact is starting to be larger than it, than it was in, in, in earlier points. Uh, we do see these various impacts across the distribution. Uh, we see an impact on, on zero scores, um, but the different impacts are really going to depend on the skill you're looking at at the point in time you're looking at it. Um, overall, of course, I think these results are promising for the long-term impacts of, of well-implemented early grade reading programs. So I think it's at least suggesting we're on the right track to make this an important focus. Um, other implications, you know, we started out saying, are we going to see fade out? Or are we going to see growth in the impacts? And I think we're realizing it's not as simple as, as there's either fade out or growth, but it might depend on what skill you're looking at when. Um, it might be that there's things like thresholds in certain foundational skills like oral reading and fluency, which need to be reached before you start to uh, see benefits from interventions on higher order skills like, uh, like comp comprehension. Um, I think this, uh, these findings in the study are starting to raise questions for future work um, and future studies, which might want to more explicitly focus on um, how are different skills building on earlier skills and which earlier skills are maybe more strategic to target uh, through support interventions in resource constrained um, settings. For instance, I think one of the important implications of the work we've done is that uh, targeting home language literacy skills uh, might be really more strategic because it also leads to second language uh, skills. Uh, we do have another experiment, which we have not reported on here, where we targeted the exact same coaching intervention on, on English in grades one to three. And whilst we did see some immediate impact on the English outcomes, there was no positive spillover back to home language outcomes, and if anything, a slightly negative impact. Um, so I think putting all of that together, we saw to to see which skills in the earlier grades are perhaps more important and more strategic to focus on for, for later learning and educational outcomes. So our plans uh, into the future are we gonna continue to track these children. Um, we are gonna, in a few years time, look for them in the secondary school leaving examinations. Um, and I think then we'll get a better uh, understanding of whether there was a, uh, an impact on progression uh, on reaching the end of secondary school and on, on passing it, as well as looking at the impact on key subjects, um, subjects like maths, uh, languages and, and sciences, which become gateway subjects for, for post-school opportunities. Um, so that's it. I think I have a minute and a half to spare. It feels like bad planning now. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? No problem. I can stand. It's fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Great. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. Go ahead and have a seat. Everyone be preparing your questions. Uh, great. Okay. We will go ahead and dive in. We're going to use that extra minute and a half for our Q&A time. So, um, yeah, I will take some questions from the room. Great. Lots of good discussion. Okay. To save Katie running back and forth, we'll do a few from this side and then from that side. So we'll start here. Here and here, and then. Thank you so much for, for, for very good presentations. But my question is for Debbie and Kathleen. Um, so Debbie, you, you're positioning it in terms of like 
historical, like institutional kind of like economics of like institutions matter and the legacy of institutions. And then I see Kathleen's work where she gives more agency to the leadership and the particular figures that's kind of like a break from the institutional literature. So how do you see this, this phenomena of like building commitment? So then Stefan has his work on the gambling on development where there is an elite bargain coming together. So how does these themes fit together as we look at these issues from, from different lenses? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think this is for Debbie. Uh, thanks for an uh, excellent presentation. The purpose questions were um, really insightful. Um, but the country visit, can you say more about that? I mean, I think it's currently frowned upon. The current mood is to frown upon country visits, but you seem to think it was, well, two years duration, breadth, length, what did they do, et cetera. What are your current reflections on that? Great, and then right up front here. Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah. I think it's in the vein of Salman, both to Debbie and a reaction to Kat, both of them. So great work, Debbie. I think uh, I think it, it it it's a push to how do we think about systems. It's not just about bureaucratic, political, and let's say programs run by NGOs, but some of the factors go deeper, historical, how the society is, all of that. I I fundamentally believe a lot in it, but great, great, great to understand that about systems. But I think the other point also, in a sense, is then, you know, what are we doing currently as programs, let's say Delhi and others? I think it's a greater question and for us to think about getting rigorous about evidence. There isn't any evidence that Delhi program is performing or the Delhi government is performing, particularly in a sense of whether they're following teaching at the right level, which everybody talked about yesterday. It almost seems like Buddhism, which started in India, but not practiced in India anymore. No, no government in India, state government, or the districts at that level are doing. So the question, Michelle, also is, what are we trying to measure in terms of what works or doesn't work? Is it implementation of programs? Because most programs report by I'm themselves cut you otherwise. Because that was the end of the question. Uh, I heard no, a question mark there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. or, or are, are we looking, looking at how countries or states, yeah. to, to bring back to Rebe's question, or how countries or states or nations are improving or not improving on their system? So what are we trying Thanks. to measure is the question. Thanks for the question. And noting that those were all for our, our two ladies. If anyone has questions for the latter two, um, I would take one or two other questions for this round. Do you mind creating? We'll go right back there. Okay. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, so my question is for Stephen. Um, thanks for a really great presentation. So you mentioned how early skills are really important important for later skills acquisition. And so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more what early skills are you are you thinking of in, uh, on top of the home language that you mentioned and why exactly that link between home language uh, proficiency and later second language acquisition. Thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll respond to those and say that we'll pick you up on the next round, okay? Um, Debbie, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. Um, so, First, the question of sort of about the tension between um, institutions mattering, building commitment, and leadership. Um, again, 163 page paper, uh, monograph, we started calling it, um, <laughs> is I ended up in the presentation sort of leaving um, a lot about the role of specific leaders. Um, there's absolutely a key role for, for specific leaders, but also leadership at every level. Um, as well um, in key decision making, but also in in terms of of including um, sort of teachers uh, teaching teachers unions were were absolutely key to this work as well. Um, and so, not just sort of top level leaders, although that was absolutely necessary, um, but um, a variety of of different levels. So I'm I'm interested in in your take on that. Tag. Great, yeah. I don't think we're, I'm I'm so excited to read your paper and more about um, <laughs> the leadership element too. I think it's okay. such a cool. Actually, sorry. first, just real. Oh, sorry, you sorry. also had a question about the country visits. Yeah, Maybe yeah, before yeah. We Move on. Country visits, and then um, 
a really high level answer on sort of what are we trying to measure. Um, country visits, uh, yes, absolutely. It's it's not sort of considered um, all that great anymore. It seems like there's more of um, exporting sort of policy exporting countries or policy lender countries um, visiting the countries that they're lending to. Um, and so I think I think some of it is is um, an artifact of the time, but I also believe that the proactivity. Um, is the big takeaway um, from those those long missions. Obviously, I don't know of a lot of countries that could spare, um, that believe that they could spare half of their, their new government for a few years. Um, and information is available in a variety of, of different ways as well. Now they don't require necessarily steamships um, travel, although I think everybody had a really good time on that trip. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that the proactivity of figuring out who you want to learn from and learning from them in the way that you wish, um, as opposed to sort of, absorbing, and I know I'm, I'm lacking some nuance here, but absorbing the policies that are being recommended to you um, and the highlights um, that are being recommended to you of those policies, um, I think is, is the more relevant takeaway um, today. Um, and then broadly, sort of what are we trying to measure? I think that's in alignment with um, what that purpose is. If you have your the purpose of your education system, um, or even as a teacher of your classroom, clear, very clearly defined, um, that helps shape um, what measures matter. Great. Um, so on the first question, I think that um, posing that as a dichotomy of like it's either institutions or it's either agency, I think we don't necessarily need to think that way. Because um, I think at least in the cases I saw, you really need both. And I think the kind of key punchline, I think, of this work for me was that people talk about political will and coalitions as these sort of rare elusive things. Like we just hope that some politicians will just suddenly decide to value education, or we hope that some sort of coalition will happen. And it's sort of this like blind faith that you're waiting for them to emerge. And I think what my research shows is you actually can take active steps as a funder or as an NGO or as a politician, like you can take active steps to make political will emerge, make it more likely for it to emerge, right? And I think that's where you can intentionally build institutions that make it more likely to happen, like, you know, Central Square Foundation or Lehman Foundation or Education Alliance or MPB. These are all institutions and teams that were organizations that were intentionally infrastructure for orchestration and for, um, you know, to implement these kinds of policies. Um, but alongside that, though, you do just need the agency of specific people to take steps at certain times, right? And no one can really control when, you know, control the fact that Arvind Kedrawal decided they decided as a party that education would be their issue, right? No one person influenced that. It was a much larger decision that was impacted by many factors, but the agency of those actors is, is very important. And we don't have change if we don't actually have um, actors taking certain steps at certain times. So I think it's, it's that balance of, you know, building the institutions, kind of developing the talent and the leader pipelines, hoping that they will take agency to prioritize education and take certain steps. And then honestly, just, just being patient and waiting for the openings to emerge that no one has control over. And you're just gonna be surprised sometimes by when the windows open or don't. So it's, it's a combination of all of this. Great. Oh, sorry, the measuring, can I? Yes, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point that you raise that there is not good data on the impact of the Delhi reforms. And that is the truth. And I think that's a result of a few things. I mean, I think one, when they were first starting, they were dealing with more kind of urgent things like a lot of infrastructure development, dealing with you know schools where the roofs were falling down or they didn't have enough deaths or things like that. Um, but also they've been moving at such a fast pace trying to do so many reforms. And that's, I mean, I could go into like, so many critiques I have of their process as well, one of which is they're trying to do dozens of things as opposed to really focusing on what are like the few reforms they can be doing that have the most impact on learning. And they would say as well, like Shailendra Sharma, who's kind of the, arc, the one leading the operations of the reforms, would say the biggest problem is that they don't have a good sense of the progress that they're making and they don't have good processes for tracking data. Um, and so I think it's a result of like the frenetic pace of what they've been trying to do and the quick change, partly also as a result of, you know, they are linked to a political party. They're trying to show voters that they are doing work so that they can then get more votes and maintain their power in Delhi and an environment where there's lots of things against them. Um, and they're also, you know, at the same time dealing with the leader of the reforms who's in jail, lots of other, you know, challenges facing the party itself. It's kind of like in an existential threat moment. So 
it, I can understand why it has been a challenge, but obviously that is very important and it's something that they need to work on. So that's something I wonder, like people in this room, if you have thoughts on like, how can we actually support politicians who are leading these kind of reforms and who do want to be doing a better job of measuring um, the progress of, of the quality, um, but don't necessarily know how to do that or are facing challenges doing that. Like, how can we actually use that as an opportunity to better support governments, I think is, is a really interesting one. And, and hopefully also the What Works uh, Hub in the next phase can work on that as well. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll come to Stephen, but Ms. Ailey, we'll come back, we'll circle back to you um, for the next round for sure. Go ahead, do you wanna take the question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so your, your question's about wanting to know a bit more about which, how and which skills lead to later skills. And I think that is, those are the questions that our research is starting to raise now. Um, and uh, I think Mpumi is the, probably the person who, who, who's best qualified to answer that amongst our co-authors. But, um, but I will say that, uh, I mean, there is this, all this work on the science of reading which sort of tries to understand how different components of, of reading um, work together, how different skills work together uh, to lead to perhaps the outcome of reading with comprehension. Um, and so um, perhaps, you know, we don't want to necessarily reinvent that whole, that whole science of reading. Uh, to some extent, I think what, what we're showing is it's worth thinking a bit more carefully about which skills you are measuring when, when you're doing long run follow-ups. Um, maybe that, that's a simple point to make. Um, uh, I, I think maybe, I mean, at a high level, I think we're saying so far the evidence seems to suggest focusing on home language skills rather than going straight for, for reading skills in a second language. Um, and I think, again, linguistic theory is, is, is in line with that, suggesting that children learn the skills of reading best in the language that they best understand and then are able to transfer those skills into a second language. So I think to some extent it's more empirical evidence to back up the linguistic theory. Um, but maybe future research could try to, to flesh out that linguistic theory more empirically uh, through these kinds of long run follow up studies and longitudinal um, databases that we have. And I mean, there are some debates about to what extent should, should we focus on more phonics based approaches in the early grades versus more directly targeting comprehension strategies um, early on. And, and so if, if studies are more explicitly designed to to measure those skills and, and the effects of programs which, which have a more of a focus on specific skills. I think there's some contributions to be made to help answer your questions, which, which we also have. Thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna launch one to Ms. Ailey for you to think about for when we come back to you. But one question I had from your study was you're looking at these interesting kind of longer term changes in learning outcomes and what you called teacher quality. Um, but I don't think we got to hear a whole lot about how you were measuring those two things. So could you share a little bit more about how you were measuring the student performance? Were those the same assessments? I didn't quite catch that. Are they linked in some formal way? And then also, how were you actually measuring teacher quality? We'll come back, but you can think on that while we take a few more questions. Sure. Nick, up here, right up at the top. And then... Um, <clears throat> thanks so much. Super interesting presentation. Yeah. But I came away with a sort of opposite conclusion from the first two presentations. And I think I'm curious to hear from both of you. So Debbie, I kind of concluded that the spark of life kind of has to come from within the country. This is like a bona fide sui generis. It's like inside the country that it's coming from. And then your presentation was saying, no, the coalitions can bring that spark if it's not there. So I'm just curious to hear from either of you, kind of does the spark have to come from within or can it come from without? And I think that's also one of the kind of questions that's pushed into the what works hub, kind of it's why one of the things that makes it really interesting is what works, when it works, why it works, how it works. But this kind of tension between your two presentations, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, my question's also for, for, for Debbie. Um, there's lots of evidence from... Africa, Latin America, a nice longitudinal study in Turkey, for example, that when societies become more educated, their values change. Like, for example, they become more individualistic. And one thing that fascinates me about Japan and Korea is that didn't like didn't seem to happen in the same extent. And even so, here Hof Hofstede did this work in fifty study fifty countries and concluded that individualism and risk taking was essential for economic growth. And then he did a study in South Korea and changed his mind. Right, um, and so. I'd love to know if you've got any insights in how they achieve that. Because essentially, the goal of every country, I think, is to reap the benefits of education without fundamentally changing your values. And 
some, I read a quote from someone in Zambia once who said, "What well, we want your motor cars, but not your old people's homes, you know, which like uh, encapsulates the, the, that idea. So I wonder if, if you have, uh, you know, any insights into how that, how that's done. Great. Thanks. Maybe one more question from this general area. Okay. We'll go right here. Okay. I'm going to stick with this side. We'll come back to this side next. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I had a question for Masele about the, um, because I know in, in GKIP E there are lots of different interventions. Um, so I was just wondering what else was going on with those teachers in terms of allocation of teachers to different areas or um, training on pedagogical support? Because maybe, you know, as an intuition, you would think that pedagogy might be more important than content knowledge for reaching the weakest learners but you're sort of showing quite a strong role potentially for the content knowledge. So it's interesting. Great, okay, we'll go in reverse order to let Debbie have a little time. So Masaili, do you wanna kick us off? And Steve, we'll come back to you next time. Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I just start with the uh, second question I, in terms of the uh, intervention with the reform. Basically, the reform has several uh, aspects in terms of intervention, in, but what school, I mean, teacher uh, training or teacher development is one of it. And in a way, it just it gives training to teachers as well. And then it also gives some in-service training, in a sense, for those who are already uh, teaching. So it just gives different uh, aspects. And at the same time, uh, the period, of, I, obviously, uh, we just measure in terms of teacher content knowledge, but it would have been good if you can do it the uh, pedagogical uh, skill, uh, obviously, but we are not able to observe them in class how they teach. Just we just give them, we just give them a kind of uh, test correct as a teacher. Teacher usually correct is we do not just ask them to sit for a test, but we ask them to correct a test which is wrongly selected or something, so that they feel like they are correct in the exams. So. Uh, uh, that is the way how we measure the teaching, uh, the teacher content knowledge, and we are not able to just uh, undertake the pedagogical uh, uh, skill uh, at, at the classroom. That would be have been I'm very, very good, but it's just a bit difficult task to go to the classroom and observe all these 168 schools. That's one thing. And in terms of uh, the teacher qualification, we have here two measurements of teacher quality. One is just as I have said, the teacher uh, content knowledge, which has been just a paper-based uh, test for the teachers. And the other is uh, an index, which is a combination of five, four uh, variables like experience, how long they have been in, the, in teaching, whether they have a uh, teaching certificate, uh, as well as whether they specialize in maths. We are just presenting a learning outcome for maths. So whether the teacher has a specialization maths and whether he has like a degree or a diploma level of qualification as well. So we just um, uh, create a, an index to use a principal component analysis to so make some uh, correlation or association with the learning progress of the students. Great, thanks. Okay, go to Kat and then we'll oh, okay. Um, okay, I really love this idea of the spark coming within and without. So I'm definitely gonna use that, Nick, thank you. Um, I think that um, it's, so I think what's particularly interesting about both the Delhi and the Brazil cases is that they were completely indigenous, like they were completely led by people from the countries that they were working in. Um, and I think that's interesting in contrast to like, for example, we were talking about Nepal yesterday and the Asian Development Bank, you know, paid for that reform that then didn't really do anything. I think what's in contrast to this is that this was, you know, the funders were from the country that they were working in. The teams of these funders were entirely um, from those countries and all of the NGO leaders involved and politicians involved were from that country. And so I think um, it really was like a spark within in both cases. And I think it was just more about the speed in a sense, like in the India case, it was like they had that spark ignite really fast when they had the opportunity. And in Brazil, they sort of ignited it very slowly over time. That's a great metaphor. Yeah, I'm going to use that. Um, and so I think 
we we can think about that then applying that to other places where you know how could we enable more institutions like a layman foundation or a csf to exist in other countries and this is something i thought a lot about for kenya like how do we sort of create that equivalent of a completely local um, entity that where those leaders have a very strong sense of all the political opportunities in the landscape of how it's changing and are really committed to that long-term view of how do you change that country over time in a way that you know development agencies and a lot of international funders just often don't have that long-term view and don't have that ongoing sense of, of how things are changing and what's going on. So I think we can we can help build those institutions that enable uh, people who are in a country to then you know create the spark or take advantage and, and grow that spark over time. Um, and I think the other thing that, that made me think was it would be really interesting to do a study if someone here could do a study on like where political will comes from i feel like i haven't seen something about wh what actually makes politicians decide to value education and adopt reforms in in terms of like the specific you know these kind of moments that happen that shape their mindsets to do it like i would love to know more of those stories and that would be interesting um so like for example with the famous sobral case like i don't know if you're aware that the politicians who started that were these brothers who were part of this very um, powerful political family that had been in power in Sierra for a very long time. And so they actually were able to take that risk because they kind of knew their positions were secure. And they also had this relationship with this priest who shaped their thinking on why education was important. Um, and if you look at Pakistan, you know, the ACER and Ali Filan uh, campaign and, and the ACER study were really key in building that movement for Shabbat Sharif and others to value education reforms. Um, and then I also just recently was in Indonesia where the Minister of Education, um, he like founded Indonesia's first unicorn tech company, but before that he went to a UWC college and that made him value education as a tool and why he wanted to move into leading innovation education. So like it would be fascinating for someone to go and like collect these examples and really dig more into that because I feel like you know, we have such so much evidence about what programs need to be adopted and, and somewhat about like challenges in the process of implementation, but like that piece about what makes politicians and bureaucrats actually decide to mobilize um, and lead and have that commitment over time, because politics is often what determines whether reforms are sustained over time, I think would be interesting. So tell me if you want to work on that. I would love to Great. follow Thanks. it. Thanks. Yeah, Debbie, go ahead. And I would say that in Japan and Korea, sort of that that spark came um, in fact externally um, and and was sort of a, a response to an abject fear of being colonized by the West. Um, so to some extent that was actually an, you know an external um, spark but um, it really you know it it was internalized in a fairly specific way um, and uh, and that's sort of how we see it see it play out so the the internal spark uh, and sort of linking this to, to Matthew's question as well. Um, there was the, um, there's a couple of answers to your question um, about sort of how Japan and Korea didn't end up sort of becoming westernized um, through this, this transformation, um, particularly when, when a lot of their inspiration came from, from Western countries. Um, and to some extent, there's an argument that there's an influence of, the, of Confucianism. Um, I would argue that there are, there's influence of different reinterpretations of Confucianism, um, the way the way it influences education now versus 400 years ago when it was arguably um, stronger. Um, education levels are, are much higher now. Um, but I would say also there was a, a big split between members of that, that um, well, each of, of um, the policy borrowing expeditions between sort of traditionalists and modernizers and those who um, continuously iterated and pushed back on not wanting to lose their, you know, inherent Koreanness um, or Japaneseness by by borrowing, um, you know, too too uh, explicitly um, Western ideas. Um, so there was there was a really strong desire to sort of be able to not be colonized by the West to just meet that strength militarily, um, but also to do so um, while maintaining that that identity, and that was really really important and very explicit um, throughout that that transformation. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, we have our last minute. If someone has, I'll do the same to. Okay, I know Barbara's had her hand up. If you can do a thirty-second question, uh, and we. That's a Sorry, Jeff I have a question for you. Okay. Um, your your um, cases of you know reform champions uh, supported by what we call policy networks uh, are very good, but they don't explain reform reversals to under which is a important phenomenon in education reform. If it was only the champions that drove the world 
um, we'd be a lot further along in the education progress. So like there are stakeholders, important stakeholders that are typically threatened by re education reforms, no notably teachers unions or latent stakeholders like parents and children, and students who would benefit the most, who don't really play an active role. So I'm wondering how your work is taking account of those stakeholders. Great, a last word from Kat on that. What about regression? Okay, um, yeah, that's a really good point, Barbara. Thank you for that. Um, so I think that um, two interesting examples related to that that I thought a lot about. So one I think is Tusome in Kenya, I think is an interesting case for this because it's a, everyone holds it up as this big success story, but if you, from talking to people in Kenya right now, the government isn't actually implementing the program anymore um, because of various reasons. They see it as like a U.S. imposed initiative. Some of the funding ran out, you know, various reasons. But I think that's an example of where the, I guess you called it the reform reversal happened in a sense. Um, and so I think, I don't know what really like the answer, I haven't studied that very much. So I'll, I'll put that out there, but it's something I've thought about. And I, what? Yeah, I would love to read more about it. That would be great. Um, but then the other, um, the other, okay, sorry, I'll stop. That's probably all going to stop. <laughs> Why don't you guys chat more? I think there's probably a lot to unpack there. So we'll let you chat much more on that um, over coffee. So with that, let's give our panel a hand. Thanks, everyone. Okay. One hour for lunch. Be back here at 1.30. Thanks, everyone.
Good afternoon to this um, first session in the afternoon. Uh, it's uh, labeled education and later life outcomes. And I want to straight away put your expectations right. Um, this is through the eyes of a kid, later life outcomes. So for some of us, later life may sound a bit stretched. Um, <laughs> it's actually beyond primary into secondary teenage years and adulthood, right? And so we've got uh, three papers. It's a little bit in the tradition of what Stephen presented uh, in the last paper in the previous session, uh, to look at treatment effects and um, what are the long-term impacts of that, uh, uh, that, that kind of tradition. Uh, some of it using uh, uh, survey data. So the first paper is presented by Ricardo, uh, looks at Uganda and it examines the effects of a literacy intervention uh, in lower primary and looking then examining whether that has impacts five years later. Second paper is by Jennifer, is using Young Lives data, which we've seen before. This one looks at Ethiopia and Peru and uh, studies the relationship between skills at age 12 and educational outcomes at age 15 and 19 and 20, right? And then the third paper, so we, we go progressively into adulthood. The third paper looks at Bangladesh, this is by Rubaya, and studies the relationship between educational attainment and voting behavior as an adult. So, Ricardo, you have the floor. Thank you. So um, I'm presenting here a paper on the uh, Northern Uganda Literacy Program uh, with, uh, uh, I wrote with uh, Julie uh, Bull Wilkins, who is here, and also Jason Kerwin, Jeffrey Smith, and Rebecca Thornton. So just a little bit of context for the uh, Ugandan uh, primary education system. This comprises grades one through seven, and uh, the official policy is that grades one through third year should be a uh, uh, focus on learning to read, in particularly in the mother tongue. And Uganda has uh, around 40 uh, different native languages in three different language families. Uh, uh, then fourth grade should be a transition year. And then uh, starting grade five, they should uh, focus to uh, learn to read in English. Um, so the implementation of this, of this uh, policy has been difficult. Not every uh, school is compliant. Several schools start teaching how to read directly in English or start uh, a lot earlier than grade four. Uh, and there's been like, there's uh, little support, although education should be free. Uh, primary education should be free. A lot of schools actually request some money in, in a way like a donation, but if, if the students don't, uh, or the parents of the students don't give these donations, they're sent back home. So, uh, uh, the, 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 and obviously schools do this because they are underfunded. Uh, and also some uh, socioeconomic context, these are extremely poor uh, uh, families. They, they have poor health conditions uh, and social indicators. Uh, and it, this should not surprise us that uh, learning outcomes are also very poor. Uh, uh, by grade two, 88% of uh, children can read a single word. So the program, which is uh, in northern Uganda, like I said, and was developed by the uh, ONG Mango Tree in, in um, Uganda, focuses on grades one through three. Uh, and it's specified on introducing uh, students to reading, particularly in their uh, mother tongue. So they try to make grades one, two, and three exclusively in their, in their mother tongue. And uh, uh, they introduce concepts much slower than, than the uh, regular version or the regular curriculum. Uh, uh, so they, uh, there are several components to this uh, program. The first one is uh, this different or revised curriculum. Uh, uh, and this program was implemented in two versions, uh, thinking that this could, uh, that the first version that Mango Tree developed could be uh, too costly to be carried at scale. They also developed a, a reduced cost version and uh, they are different in terms of, of, of the variable costs. So uh, the curriculum is, is the same for both, but the component of teacher training and materials is, is very different. Uh, uh, teacher training in the full cost version 
is done uh, extensively. They have uh, several sessions, uh, several of, of them are, uh, they bring all the teachers together uh, to the same place and, and teach to everybody in the same place, and that's it's costly. In the reduced version, uh, it, this is done more, uh, this is firstly done by government officials instead of mango tree specialists, and it is done at the local level. Uh, in terms of materials, they both get scripted lessons for the, for the teachers that tell them how to do every session in, in, the, uh, in the curriculum. But uh, uh, the full cost version of the program also gave some materials for the children, like uh, uh, slates and chalk. And uh, uh, they also gave the, the teachers or each classroom a wall clock so that they could uh, keep track of time. Um, and then the, the full cost version also had a, a community engagement component, which uh, uh, led to parents being more involved in, in the, uh, by having meetings about the importance of using the native language. Uh, in terms of costs, the full cost version of the program uh, was, or the, this is only the uh, uh, variable cost, so this is not the development of the, of the materials is uh, separate from this and, and was common to both, but the uh, cost per student in the full cost is uh, about $20. And then for the reduced cost, it's closer to seven. So the reduced cost version actually reduced the cost a lot. So uh, uh, we're trying to measure the impact of this uh, program right at the end of the program and uh, 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 five years after the, the program ended. Uh, uh, schools were randomized into one of three groups, the, the control group and one of the two branches of our treatment groups. Uh, um, it was difficult to follow students across eight years. So if we uh, think that this randomization happened when they were in grade one, we were expecting them to be in the first year of secondary education and, and uh, in year eight. And follow-up was difficult, so uh, 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 tests for attrition bias is important here. These are the, the, the tests that we run for attrition uh, at the uh, end line. So if this is eight years after the beginning of the program or five years after the end. Well, uh, although we find like the control group had around 25% of attrition at the student level, which is relatively high, uh, we didn't find any attrition bias. And this is uh, in some part or in a great part uh, related to the great effort that our local team made in tracking the students through several years. Uh, and, and that this effort that we still have to carry out because we want to follow them uh, later because you're going to see that the results are pretty encouraging. Uh, um, but unfortunately, attrition doesn't seem to be related to treatment and this encourages us to uh, be confident that uh, at least attrition bias is not a, a big problem. So this is a little bit of our, our uh, time lapse for, for data collection. Uh, we started in 2014 with students in the first grade. Uh, uh, we had 128 schools at, at the point. Uh, uh, and we gathered data at the beginning of the school year. So this was before students were exposed to the uh, new treatment of uh, the literacy program. In 2016, which is uh, uh, at the end of 2016, we also visited the, the schools and the children and we gather information for when they supposed to be at, in grade three. We're gonna see in a later slide that grade repetition was a great problem here, but supposedly they were going to be in grade three. Uh, and then, uh, which is the last year of program intervention because this uh, program was for grades one, two, and three. And then in 2021 and 2022, we expected to find them in the first year of secondary school. Unfortunately, uh, two factors combined here. First, uh, uh, Northern Uganda has an important repetition program, uh, but also the COVID pandemic was, had just struck and, and Ugandan schools remained closed for almost two years. So uh, we have a, a, a big uh, a school um, retention or lack of progression in this in these children. So uh, this is uh, the progression of, of, of children across the years. So in 2021, we asked them where 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 they were in which grade they were enrolled each year. Um, and some things that I want to uh, like highlight. It looks like. Uh, these boxes show the, the, the grade they should be in if they followed perfectly through the years. And then the, the boxes that are highlighted, those are the ones uh, uh, where most children were. So those are the, like the modes of, of the distribution of each year. And we find that uh, even for the first year, about 31% of students were still in 2015 were still in grade one. 
So that's that's a big uh, uh, retention even for one year. And this this trend continues over the years, although it's uh, um, it highlighted at the end where uh, almost nobody is either at their current year or even one year behind. Right by by the end of um, of 2021, uh, uh, most students are in grade six. Um, I'm sorry, five. Uh, and only 16, uh, about 19% are in grade six or higher. If we try to see which grade they repeated the most, so we can see that uh, uh, about 35% of students repeated grade one, and then it goes relatively up until fourth grade. 72% of, of, of students repeated grade four. And then it goes down, but remember that you can't repeat a grade you haven't uh, reached yet. So it's not like students won't repeat grade six or seven. Uh, we don't know at the point, but uh, uh, this 72% repeat repetition grade, uh, uh, it's very high. It's also worth noticing that majority of students uh, uh, reach grade four uh, uh, in 2019, right? So there's a lot the, uh, of repetitions here that could be related to the pandemic. What were the results? So these are the results at the end of the program. So at the end of, of uh, 2016, and we are presenting this. We had a long conversation about how to present these results. We're presenting this first in uh, standard deviations of our uh, combined score for the uh, Leblango, which is the, the, the native language that the program was carried out on, and in equivalent years of schooling. So I'm first going to present this uh, uh, in uh, standard deviations. And this is uh, uh, for Levango, English, and math. Uh, we have huge impacts in terms of standard deviations. Uh, uh, the full cost version of the program had about 1.2 standard deviations effect. Uh, the reduced cost version, about 0 0.7. This is a, a very big effect in places as, uh, like in the top 90% of distribution of educational interventions. Um, in, even in English, which the program was not directly uh, uh, focused on, the effect is big. It has about half a standard deviation uh, in the full cost version of the program and 0 0.3 standard deviations for the reduced cost. So um, in terms of this, the reduced cost version of the program is getting between 54 and 58% of the impact of the full version of the cost of the program, even when it costs only 33% of the uh, uh, full cost version. Uh, we didn't see any impact in math, and we're not surprised to not see any impact in math in the uh, immediate uh, results. The problem was not focused on math in any way, uh, and uh, the results there are uh, uh, non-significant and small in size. Um, these uh, uh, standard deviations is not always very useful as an indicator. More, uh, a lot of people won't be able to understand them. We tried to present this in equivalent years of schooling. So uh, in the average, the, the, the control group gained about 0 0.16 or 0 0.17 standard deviations of learning every year. So if we rescale this, uh, 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 the students in the full cost version of the program learned like seven additional years of the control group uh, related to the control group. So, or, or gained the equivalent of what the, uh, uh, is, uh, control group learns in seven years, right? Uh, this is also relatively weird because the, most of the, of the children have not reached seven full years of, of schooling. So uh, it's a weird uh, way of measuring this. If we focus on the reading fluency indicator in Leblango, um, this, the control students can read 14 words per minute, which is very low. The reduced cost version of the program students they can read an additional seven units, uh, seven words per minute. And then the full cost version of the program students, they can read 14 uh, uh, words per, per minute uh, uh, in addition to the 14 that the uh, control students could reach. So about 28 words per minute. This is still low uh, in terms of proficiency, but I think it's easier to understand. It's, it's focusing on only one of the components, but it's easier to understand. So we wanted to see uh, what happens to these students um, later in, in life. And we find that uh, at the end of year five, we still have about 0.7 standard deviations and point, uh, I'm sorry, the numbers that I did for reading is for 
the end of year five. Uh, uh, at the end of, of, of this fifth year, the um, students in the full cost version of the program can read 0 0.7 standard deviations uh, uh, or rank, have a score 0 0.7 uh, standard deviations higher and 0 0.4 in the reduced cost version. In Lodango, yes, we find uh, uh, smaller but similar to what we found for the immediate impacts in terms of English, and we still found no impacts in uh, math, which did surprise us because we, we uh, thought that maybe teacher, uh, students who learned better how to read could understand other subjects easier, but it was not the case. We also uh, tried to see what happened to grade progression, and we can see it's a, a little bit diff difficult to read here, but uh, the main re uh, message here is that we can see students uh, uh, lagging less, right? Our treated students lag less than the uh, control students. And then in terms of other uh, outcomes later in life, uh, we don't see any effect in working outside of home or in sexual behavior. Uh, uh, we also have to take into account that uh, the sexual behavior, very few students had any uh, sex at the, uh, at the time that we were measuring, about only 10% of the, of the sample, but no effects there. So some uh, conclusions, there's very problematic great progression in Uganda, which was made dismal uh, due to COVID pandemic. Uh, the program had long lasting uh, effects with positive into English. Uh, these effects didn't promote math, and, uh, um, but partially alleviated the, program, the, the problem of uh, great repetition. And we found no effects in either sexual, working, sexual or working behavior. And that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Jennifer, you're up next. Yeah. Where do you see the time? Okay. 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 So, hi everyone. Um, uh, I'm Jennifer, and I'm gonna like it was mentioned. I'm gonna present to you a work that I can't see, but so it's me or it's, it's them. So this was done with Jerry Berman, Alan Sanchez, Santiago Cueto, Marta Favara, and Marta Favara. Uh, none of them are here, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, uh, like it was mentioned, what we wanted to see was the association between cognitive skills and educational outcomes later in life. Okay, so as soon as I can <laughs> tell you, I will start. Yeah, so this is basically what I told you. And just as a bit of an introduction, uh, we all know, we, all, all of you here, we all know how important education is. And it has been said many, many times, and some people might say that it's not important anymore, uh, but in low and middle income countries, uh, this is a still an element, a key element for um, mobility and for people to be able to access better opportunities in life. So why are we focusing on cognitive skills? Uh, because these are key for children to be able to store and analyze every type of knowledge that they get, whether it is at home or whether it is the one that they get in formal education at school. Now, so the base, any basic type of knowledge, you require cognitive skills to be able to analyze and to store that. So in, in low and middle income countries, there is little evidence about the role of cognitive skills. Uh, I mean, cognitive skills has as like working memory or inhibitory control. Not sometimes, not as we sometimes say that cognitive skills are like math or uh, reading comprehension test performance, but cognitive skills as what they are. There's not much evidence of that. And this can be due to the fact that this is hard to measure. It's hard to get tools to measure cognitive skills like more precisely. So this is why we have this question. So which of these cognitive skills predict domain specific learning outcomes and educational attainment? Specifically, we focus on four cognitive skills, declarative memory, uh, inhibitory control, working memory, and implicit learning, uh, which we refer to as foundational cognitive skills. Uh, two of these are part of what is more known in the literature as executive function. 
Okay, so I already told you the research questions and we want to see which of these cognitive skills uh, have the strongest association with educational outcomes and if this, uh, this prediction and constants are constant across countries. So to tell you the results from now, so we do find the, these cognitive skills predict educational outcomes, especially in the case in long-term memory and working memory, so the memory-related cognitive skills. Uh, implicit learning doesn't seem to be playing that big of a role in both countries. Uh, we also find uh, important associations between inhibitory control and math test performance. And finally, our results are robust to the inclusion of value added. So the data that we use is the data from the Young Life study. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous study, but just to tell you a bit more about it, this study has been following two cohorts of children since 2002. We have the younger cohort and the older cohort, uh, which were now, which were born in 1994, 2001, respectively, in four countries, Ethiopia, India, Peru, and Vietnam. So they have five in-person visits and five phone calls, uh, which were done during COVID, so the phone survey. So the data collected in this study covers a wide range of indicators, including background characteristics, parent and child aspirations, household and individual investments, and cognitive skills, and many more. So we only use data from the younger cohort, uh, which one which was around one year uh, in 2002, 15 years old in 2016, and about 20 to 21 years old at the, la at the time of the last phone call in 2021. Our main variables come from round four, five, call two and five. And finally, we do use uh, information from round one and two to, make, uh, to construct some control variables. Additionally, the study started collecting data on the siblings of these uh, index children, which are the main participants that the study has been following uh, since round three. Okay, but it's not the same. It is worth mentioning that it's not like it's had the exact survey for the siblings. Too. So we just collect a specific data, uh, which will have some implications for uh, some, some models that we would like to run. So in Peru, the data was collected from the young, for the younger siblings, while in Ethiopia it was collected for the siblings closest in age. We use data only from the younger siblings for the household fixed effects model. So these are educational outcomes. Uh, the main ones that I'm gonna to present today are at 15 years old. And the community skills data come from a tool that was uh, used in 2013 when the younger cohort was 12 years old. So this is called RACER. RACER is the rapid assessment of cognitive and emotional regulation, and it's a tablet-based administered, a uh, self-administered tablet-based software designed to measure each of these cognitive skills that I mentioned at the beginning through an interactive task, each of them. So uh, just to give you, I told you the first, the four cognitive skills that we have, which are long-term memory, inhibitory control, working memory, and implicit control. Just to give you an idea to what these are, uh, they're very self-explanatory, but long-term memory is the ability to be able to store and, and retain knowledge even when it's not in the environment anymore. Uh, inhibitory control is the ability to focus and uh, suppress any distractor that one might have. And working memory is the ability to bring back stored knowledge and to use it even when it's not there anymore. Uh, and finally, implicit learning is the ability to learn without being conscious about it. Okay, so uh, due to the design, RACER is relatively bias free. So it doesn't rely on language of cultural or cultural references, but it relies on shapes and colors. Okay, each of the tasks have both challenge and trials. Uh, we, perform, we measure the performance of each task. In, in either the number of correct answers, the response time, the accuracy, or a combination of the last two. So just to give you an idea, uh, you have a tablet, for example, for inhibitory control, and it's la, it has an imaginary line at, at the middle, and you have like the center of the right side and the center of the left side. And the child would have to press at the center of either the right side of the left or the left side. And what we can measure here is the response time, how fast the child is, or the accuracy, how close to the center of the top of the, how close to the center of the right side he's pressing. Okay, so if, for inhibitory control, we use a, a mix of both response times and accuracy. So uh, our model is very simple. We use an OLS model uh, where we have the outcome variables, which is either the highest grade achieved at age 15, the standardized scores in PPT, math, and reading comprehension. Uh, we do some things with uh, 
lower secondary school, uh, with finishing low, lower secondary school education at age, 50, at age 19 or being enrolled in higher education at age 20, but I won't be presenting those today. And then we have the FCA, the foundational community skills vector, which we include one at a time in each of the regressions. We have basic controls at the child level, at the household level, controls for the games, and finally, community of very fixed effects. So these are our results. It's really boring to see a lot of uh, coefficients I've been told many times. So let me just show you what it's, what it's important about these results. So we have first important associations between long-term memory and working memory with all of the outcomes in both Peru and Ethiopia. And the coefficients in Peru range from 8 to 29%, and the coefficients in Ethiopia range from, I think, 5 to 19% uh, of, of a standard deviation. So this is very good. And we also see in inhibitory control that, like I mentioned at the beginning, our main results are with math test performance. Although we do see something uh, more, something else in Peru going on there, but uh, we will see that it's not constant within our, or the other models. So, and finally, in implicit learning, we see nothing in Ethiopia and we do see something there, uh, a couple of things there in Peru, but again, this won't be uh, consistent with the rest of the tables. So yeah, so this is very good <laughs> in principle. We were really happy when we saw these results. It's very straightforward. However, these results could be the, the associations that we see between these skills and these uh, educational outcomes could be happening due to a previous association between, between cognitive skills and previous educational outcomes when the children were younger. So for that, to try to account for that, we include the value added model where we are we are controlling for the last test scores at age 12. Okay, so this is in, all the controls are the same and it's still there. So again, <laughs> the results remain good. We do see that most of our coefficients are the significant associations that we saw before are still there, which is very good. We do lose some of them, as you can see, for example, here in long term memory and the association that was that we had with math test performance, but it's not there anymore. Uh, but basically all of them are there. Uh, although all of the coefficients are uh, smaller. So that, that's, but we basically see that long term memory in, and working memory in both Peru and Ethiopia is still present in strong associations. And in the case of inhibitory control, we only see uh, the association with math test performance. Uh, and in the case, well, implicit learning is almost mentioned. So uh, finally, we also did a household fixed effects model to try to account for possible omitted variables bias, like parent quality of investments and so on. So again, we do have good results. And you can see this is the column three and six in both tables. We only can do this for PPVT and highest grade attained due to, like I mentioned, the sample restriction that we have from the civilians data. And Again, we find strong associations in the case of PPBT in both countries with long-term memory and working memory. Uh, again, in yeah, long -term, in the case of in the case of Peru, we also see something there with inhibitory control. However, there is not much going on. We highest grade attain. There is something in Peru, but we don't see the same in Ethiopia, so it's not that consistent. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have time. <laughs> So finally, like I mentioned, we do find strong associations between long-term memory and working memory. So the memory-related cognitive skills, which is uh, like intuitive from the literature, as well as is a result, uh, a result between, that we find between inhibitory control and math test performance is also consistent with what we saw in the literature. Again, implicit learning is a bit of a more complex skill in measuring and also in, in seeing exactly where does it play a role. So we are not that surprised to not find nothing that significant there. And according to our value-added specification, the results are consistent. So still, we see something with uh, the memory-related skills. And again, we see the result with inhibitory control. Uh, from a policy perspective, our first results, so this table, basically, tell us that, yes, it is important to invest in community skills. They are important. And our value-added results can might be saying that there is something that it is worth investing in remit remediation policies for older children. So most of the policies aimed at education or the development of cognitive skills is focused on younger children, preschool children. However, the, in the case of low- and middle-income countries specifically, 
there's a lot of older children that do not receive any type of policy or do had a terrible education, you know, the cycle of poverty and so on. So uh, what our model could be saying is that it is worth investing in this uh, policy saying at older children, not just the preschool period, because there is something happening between 12 and 15 years old that could be uh, done to help these children that did not receive the best education when they were younger. So finally, uh, this work is part of a series of works uh, funded by the NIH research program. So this is the last one, the first, I think five, four works focus on uh, why is, is what affects cognitive skills. And this one is the one that wraps everything up by saying, yeah, we care about cognitive skills, but we care because this matter for educational outcomes. Okay, so that's basically it. I have, I have some minutes left, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Rubaya Moshet. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. I am on the job market. Um, today, I'll be sharing some preliminary, preliminary findings from one of my more recent chapters, where I'll be talking about um, ind individuals' education levels and their voting behavior using evidence from rural Bangladesh. So basically, the two concepts here that I'll be talking about is education and political participation. So in setting this research question, um, one of the guideline guiding theories was the civic education theory, which says that education instills essentially individuals with civic knowledge and awareness uh, that, that in turn increases their likelihood of voting. So basically in this paper, we test the central implication of this theory and we look at the, look at whether with each additional education level, and thereby assuming that that develops skills, knowledge and awareness in people who are going uh, to the higher education levels, are they more likely to vote in national and local elections? Just to give you a roadmap, um, I thought that I, I should share some certain details so that we can together better understand the context, context and setting of this paper. So um, first, a little bit about Bangladesh. It's a South Asian lower middle income country. For this setting of this paper, I think it's um, important to understand the political climate of Bangladesh, which I'll be talking about. And this is interesting because Bangladesh does have a sort of unstable political climate, which makes it more important, I feel, to look into things like electoral participation, what leads people to either vote, vote more or vote less. And I feel, uh, being an educationist, I, I really wanted to look at the role of education here. Bangladesh's education system. Basically, I'm looking at education levels in this paper. That's what I mean by education. So we have primary, secondary, higher, secondary, and tertiary. So I'm, I'm, those are the levels I'm looking at. A little bit about the election system in Bangladesh. So there's basically national elections and local level elections. I look at both in this paper. Um, so to be eligible to vote in any of these elections, you have to be 18 years or older. Older For local elections, there are the Upojala elections, which are the sub-district elections. So there are districts and then sub-districts within the districts. I look at that as one of the local elections. There's also um, a small unit. So this is the smallest rural administrative unit in Bangladesh. It's called Union Porishad. So there are also elections at that level. So I also, that's very local. So I also look at that election. Just to give you an idea about voter turnout in Bangladesh. So, um, <coughs> The International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, they have some data on this, and their data over the years show that Bangladesh's voter turnout rates in national parliamentary, parliamentary elections has been more or less over 50% over the years. So that's, that's just to give you an idea about the enthusiasm and the perception towards voting in Bangladesh. And um, uh, there are political scientists who have described the, the, that the voting day, the, elect, the going to elections and the enthusiasm. And Schaefer describes, this, describes that Bangladeshi people have a certain enthusiasm undimmed by political violence on election day. So uh, you can see from the picture of the women lining up to vote that there is that certain enthusiasm. It is very important to understand the political climate then that so voting, the system of voting is one thing, but there is a lot of literature by 
political economists, political scientists, describing Bangladesh's political climate as um, clientelist authoritarianism disguised as democracy. So there's a lot of patron-client relationships, a lot of power plays, a lot of power dynamics there. And it's been described to be, have developed over aspects of money, muscle, threats, and violence. So it's a very, many have referred to this as toxic politics or political politics. So that's just to give you an idea about that. Also, please note that there is controversy about the credibility of some national elections in Bangladesh. One such election I'll be talking about in this paper, which is the 2014 national election. Um, also important to the setting of this paper is the literature that suggests that in Bangladesh, there's also, it's also important to understand who is more easily won over by politicians and the, powerfully politi uh, the, pow the powerful politicians. So there's literature suggesting that people in rural areas and people who are more socioeconomically disadvantaged tend to be easily uh, manipulated by the politically powerful because the politically powerful, they want the votes. So they offer protection in these patron-client relationships. And putting that in the context of this paper, I wondered whether the education has a role here and whether it is the case that maybe less educated people are easily won over too. And then Professor Wood from University of Bath, he has, a, he has a paper where he says that it's more difficult for disadvantaged people to step, uh, step up and stand against wrongdoing. But my question is, does that mean that those who are educated, we more easily stand up against wrongdoing? Do we call a spade a spade? So that led me to my question here to think that, do we expect education to play that role? Do we expect that the more educated we are, we will call a spade a spade and we will be more critical, more aware? Besides those motivating questions, there's also big literature on this spread all over the world where uh, the linkage between education and political participation is well established. So the mechanism there is that it is assumed that when we go to formal education, we're exposed to subjects like civic studies, social studies, things like economics, politics, history, and being exposed to all these subjects uh, gives us a certain exposure to more criticality, more awareness. And so more educated people are assumed to be more engaged with politics, more interested in politics. They have a greater concern for election and they, uh, they are assumed to have a greater feeling of responsibility of playing one's role as a citizen and voting as a part of that. So, um, that is the, there's a lot of theory explaining why there would be a direct link between education and voting. And it is established that this linkage should be positive. So the more that you go to education, you're expected to be more critical, more aware, more politically engaged, hence more likely to vote. So um, the literature, and I'm still updating this, I, 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 as far as I gather, it's, there are two types of results. Some studies in Global North, show that there, there is that positive association and that has moved on to uh, consider things like, is it a proxy, is it a direct effect? But there's also literature that shows that there's no significant linkage between education and voting. So in the global South, especially in Bangladesh, there is a little to no evidence on this. So I really wanted to look into that. So I basically test whether there's an association between higher education levels and people, uh, people's likelihood of voting in different national and um, local elections. The hypothesis following from all that uh, theory that I showed you is that there would be an, a significant association and that would be positive. So we're expecting that more educated people would be more likely to vote. I use um, a data that's uh, um, collected in Bangladesh. It's called the Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey data. This is basically a panel data but I use uh, only the 2015 round because voting information is only available there. There's politics there as well, maybe, perhaps, but uh, so it's a cross-sectional data in the end. And um, it has information on education level and voting and other demographic characteristics that I can use in the model. Basically, the dependent variables here are whether people vote or not, yes or no, dummy variables with two categories in different elections. I'll show you the elections. And um, I have a range of social demographic uh, controls, but the main covariate of interest is level of education. So 
um, the categories there would be no formal, primary, secondary, higher secondary, and tertiary. So in each case, when I'm talking about primary, secondary, higher secondary, and tertiary, the base category that I'm comparing to is no formal education. That's just a snapshot of the different variables. So there are two national elections, two upojala elections, and union polisha, two union polisha elections, so four local elections. So these were all questions in the survey. Did you vote then in this election? And there were yes or no answers. And um, so I used those dummy variables, but um, I also wanted to see whether um, when I aggregate these answers, I, uh, I constructed a count variable just to see that uh, what the over, what an integrated um, version of these results are. So that is basically just uh, constructing a count variable from all the yeses and nos in the, all the uh, different variables. So the more yeses that a person has, the higher their score for that count variable. That's just to see the magnitude of voting of each individual. For the dummy variables, I'm using a simple logic model. And for the count variable, which is one variable, I'm using the Poisson model. I won't go into the nitty gritty of the equations, just before going to the results, I, I assuming that different aged individuals would have different educational experience maybe, and maybe perhaps different voting behavior. I do um, do a, an initial age cohort analysis where I divide the sample into different age groups. So um, I look at the voting behavior in, uh, across these age cohorts as well. So what story does the evidence tell us? Remember the hypothesis that we started with is that more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Um, I'll quickly go over the story. In the case of the 2008 and 2014 national election, uh, we're seeing that the more educated people are, the primary, secondary, higher secondary, tertiary level, the less likely they are to vote. And there are several cases of this, 2008, 2014. Similarly, in the Upojale elections, similar instances where the more educated you are at different levels, uh, significantly less likely to vote. Same with the union pressure elections. I won't go into the numbers, but the story is that that in several cases, the more educated you are, apparently the less likely individuals are to vote. When I look at in, um, whether they've ever voted in a national or local election, similar results. And then in that integrated um, count variable where I look at the score, interestingly, that is where the only significant association is showing that when you're primary educated compared to have people with no formal education, you're more likely to vote. So they have higher scores. Finally, and a result that's making sense because everything else is saying that for some reason, more like, more, the more educated you are, the less likely you are to vote. The age cohort analysis, I'm still fine tuning this, but apparently at this stage, I'm seeing that for the older two cohorts, there are mainly there's no significant association, but when there is, there's a positive a significant association in some cases between education and voting. For the younger cohorts, there are more instances of a negative significant correlation between education and voting. So to sum up, the main punchline of this paper is that apparently, evidently, more the more educated you are, the less likely you are to vote in several cases. And apparently this is more observed in the case of the younger cohorts. Now, interestingly, there's literature that says that in these surveys, people tend to over-report their voting. And the more educated you are, apparently they exaggerate their answers more. So even if they didn't vote, they say yes. That makes me wonder that even despite that exaggeration, these results are even more striking to me. Why is this the case? Before I go into inferences, given the political climate of Bangladesh, I do have to clarify this. I'm not going after any political party. I'm looking at these particular elections because the data allows me to look at only these elections. So I am politically neutral. <laughs> so I have to say that before going into um, the inferences. And it does hurt me growing up in Bangladesh to talk about politics in Bangladesh as toxic or political, but it does motivate me as well to look into these issues uh, more deeply. As far as I gather, there could be three reasons why the result is so counterintuitive. One could be that perhaps the way we're expecting that education should um, politically engage or make people more critical and aware, perhaps uh, the education system that we have doesn't have the elements to ensure that. That could be one thing. Another thing could be that there has now become a certain level of, dis of disengagement 
So the more educated uh, that an individual is, perhaps they've come to feel that their vote won't matter, that they play insignificant roles in the elections. And that certain disengagement has perhaps become more prominent through their education. Third, and um, uh, uh, some, um, there's a paper on this from Zimbabwe, perhaps more educated individuals are choosing to refrain from voting because they don't want to legitimize an illegitimate electoral system. So it could also be a form of protest. So disengagement could have gone, gone to that level. And evidence from Zimbabwe does show that the more educated people are, the more likely they are to not want to legitimate that illegitimate system. So in terms of taking this forward in research and policy, um, in my PhD, I was unfortunate that I only got to work with secondary data since, so I have lots of data issues, limitations. I, I haven't been able to look at this causally. Um, I would really like to take this forward and see what works. So what elements can we add in the education system that actually translates into the outcomes later in life that we're expecting, that we want our citizens to vote, to be responsible, to be more altruistic, civically engaged. So I, uh, to this wider audience, I, I would love some advice for funding, postdocs, how to go about that and take this research forward. Because I think on one hand, there's things to do in the education system, but there's also things to do in trying to make the institution of democracy and elections stronger and to protect the sanctity of those. I would like to end with a Bangla saying. Um, the saying goes, Jai kono niti, shehi kore rajniti. Loosely translated, this means only one without any principle goes into politics. I heard this from my grandfather. Many of us grew up hearing this. So the saying is that if you don't have, you only go into politics if you don't have principles. The question I want to end with here, here with is, is it the case that more educated people in Bangladesh have been able to relate this saying more to reality? With that food for thought, I'd like to end here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So if the three speakers can come up front, that would be great. Uh, maybe just sit in the order of the presentation it may help people to, um, <coughs> to address the questions. Okay, wonderful. So I would just dive in and raise your hands. Maybe we'll, yeah, I'll see a hand there. So maybe we start with Tarant and then we'll see where we end up. So Rabana, thank you. Um, I, I want to flip your problem around. What What is your thinking about why less educated people vote? So, so let's collect a few questions, yeah? Yeah. Uh, question to the first presenter. Um, so you have these large positive results on reading. Usually poor reading skills mean that um, students not really understand how the words form the language, basically. And with this uh, big improvements, do you have any way of measuring? Is there really like um, a different way of understanding how language works beyond just basically speed of reading? Great. Do we have, yeah, great. Hi, thanks. Thanks a lot for those presentations. I have a question about the Uganda one. Um, uh, it, it, is there discussion around um, removing the system that forces children to repeat grades in the first place and just to progress, make them progress automatically? Is that something that has come up as a potential um, other way of addressing these? And does your evidence cast any light on, on that kind of idea? There's a question there. Maybe in the meantime, I'll ask a question to Jennifer as well. So I was intrigued by your results on, on inhibitory control, which kind of comes closer to the socio-emotional skills. And the Young Lives data has quite a bit of other information on socio-emotional skills, yeah, like uh, self-control, self-efficacy, agency. Did you look at the relationship with this? Because it could help us understand a bit more on, on how to, to measure this, which is really... I think holds us back in this field. And then maybe a fourth question there. Thank you. Um, my question is is sort of for 
both the first two presenters. Uh, so it's interesting that such large increases in literacy didn't sort of translate into strong improvements into youth's ability to progress and also didn't translate into improvements in math. Do you have a plan to look at other types of skills as these kids get older um, and then a hypothesis for why those really large gains in literacy didn't result in more success later on? And I think similarly building off of that question is, um, you know, what do we think that link between socio socio emotional learning and these more cognitive skills can mean for progression? Wonderful. So we'll take these maybe in, in sequence. So do you want to go first, Ricardo? Sure. So the first question about how we understand how literacy means more than the speed at which they read. Um, I think that's a very good question. Uh, uh, at this point, I think from what we've studied, we can learn, I think we can conclude two things. Uh, I'm not entirely sure we'll answer that question. The first is that the children in Northern Uganda are not learning to read appropriately, right? They, uh, by any indicator that we have, they uh, uh, are even reading really slowly, uh, and that's way beyond the threshold uh, uh, for understanding what you're reading, or using our more aggregate uh, uh, indicators. It's, it's, I think it's evident that they are not learning at least far beyond what they were supposed to. Uh, the second, second thing that I think we can uh, learn from what we've done is that uh, the problem has had an impact on that. Uh, uh, on, on what they can learn and what they can understand from what they're uh, reading. So uh, I think that that is clear. <clears throat> what other measurements we can do uh, uh, to, to know exactly at what level they are, I think that's a more difficult question. I don't think that the study was prepared to, to, to go to that. Um, so I, I won't be speculating about that. Um, the, the, the question about whether we should uh, suppress this retention uh, regulation? That's a very good question, I think. Uh, and we've debated this a little bit. So uh, in theory, what they are doing right now is teaching at the right level. So it's not letting people who have not learned the, uh, the, the appropriate material progress to a, a different grade. Uh, this is also combined with the fact that uh, students that uh, have economic uh, problems, they are forced to repeat the grade because they have to leave. Uh, so I think that that second part should be taken care of. I'm not sure uh, what the policy on uh, uh, teaching at the right level or, or forcing students to be promoted to a grade if they don't really have the, the, um, the background or, or the necessary information to, to take advantage of what they are going to learn that grade. And then um, if we have plans to uh, uh, get more data, yes, we are, we are at, uh, trying to, to get more data uh, of these students in the future. We think... Uh, it's uh, relevant to keep track of them. It, we right now have some data we haven't exploded on, on non-cognitive skills, uh, which is uh, uh, what we are doing uh, in the next weeks. Um, uh, but uh, for other technical skills, we have not necessarily designed yet what we're going to measure. We wanted to, to uh, know what they were doing, uh, like progression into secondary school, but it's, it's impossible at this moment. And we don't really know if it's going to be possible uh, anytime soon if they don't really go into secondary school. Uh, but other uh, um, non-academic non -academic, uh, indicators, I think we will measure uh, more things related to how they do in the labor mar market, because if they don't progress into secondary education, they will end up going to the labor market. And uh, I think the sexual behavior is also something that we will uh, tackle, because as, as it becomes more frequent, I think we will be able to explore it more. Great, can we turn to Jennifer? Yes, uh, so about the potential relationship between socio-emotional uh, skills and cognitive skills. So I think we did look into it because you know it would make sense, but I think we didn't find any strong associations even in the case of inhibitory control. And one thing one has to take into account is that these two were measured very differently. So RACER is a specialized tool to capture cognitive skills and cognitive skills are very different for uh, socio-emotional skills, even if they are a bit related. 
whereas socio-emotional skills were measured in the survey through questions, you know, so it's yes and no, yes and no, yes and no, and it's scale. And none of, no, not, not always all of, the, all of the points were asked to the children. So I think that's why we don't find uh, strong associations there. Uh, it would make sense, but at the same time, it's hard to say. Because uh, the thing about skills in general is that they are difficult to measure. Yeah. And but did, you, did you find a relationship between inhibitory control and some of the other? Because that's kind of halfway between cognitive and, and socio-emotional. In a way, but inhibitory control is more like, you know, like the, um, I know it's like you have the the self-regulation and all and inhibitory control talks about like the ability to regulate one's behavior, but we didn't find something okay. there. Can you, do you want to say more on whether there's any follow-up that you're going to build on? Oh, uh, yeah, about the, it was also about the social skill. Sorry, I'm a bit uh, spacey now. Uh, but yeah, it would make sense, like I said, but we, we haven't done any further research on that. But maybe it would be worth doing with, because we now have around seven going on, and maybe it's something there, because they are, the children are way older now, so maybe something there would come up. Thanks. Rubaya? Um, so, um, first, the academic answer, the literature says that less educated people are more easily swayed, more easily won over. So imagine a politician coming to someone and um, saying that, please vote for me and uh, I'll give you something in return, whether that's monetary or something in the form of protection. So the literature says that it's more easy to um, win over less educated individuals. From my experience growing up in Bangladesh, anecdotally, perhaps there is an issue of agency as well. So in, in this, this is rural data. So I've seen in rural settings in election times, there are like a trucks of um, saris and food that's taken. So these are monetary incentives, sort of gifts are given to sort of please vote for me, I'll give you a gift. And maybe lesser educated people um, they have maybe less agency and they also take that at face value, perhaps at all. Oh, that person gave me this gift, that person is going to give me this protection. I'll vote for vote for that person. That's my initial understanding of it. Okay, let's go to a second round of questions. I uh, don't know where the mics are. Yeah, let's start there. Yeah. Um, the first is... Um, for Rubia on um, education and voting, do you have any literature from developing country context? So based on what you just answered, um, my understanding is that doesn't necessarily play out everywhere. So yeah, if you could comment on that. And then on the, on Ricardo, if you could speak on um, sexual behavior and why you were measuring that and how it links with reading uh, and how you measured that. Um, thanks. This, maybe let's move there and then we come there. Oh. Okay, so my question is to uh, Jennifer. So I was wondering if you, in your research, considered um, employability and um, the uh, cognitive skills kind of in, in your research, since I think these children, they're around 21 now, so they're probably um, have completed secondary school, even uni. So if there's something around the association between employability and these cognitive skills. There was a question there, yeah. Um, so my question is for Rubea. Um, so I, I, I was trying to reconcile your findings that people with tertiary education vote less with the fact that Bangladesh came emerged out of a historical moment where students were the ones that led the independence movement, right? And university students. Um, so two questions there, I guess, is um, how can we reconcile that? And two, do you have any other broader measures of political participation and political engagement uh, that don't necessarily involve uh, voting in an electoral authoritarian regime? Wonderful. Let's, let's collect these. Um, can we start with Rubia? So there was a question on the, hmm. the literature of developing countries yes. and then the special role that students play. Hmm. Um, so to the literature, um, I'm still working on that. I'm going to the literature. I found one study in based in Zimbabwe by uh, Krook et al, where they've looked at this particular um, issue and they've, uh, I, I, that, that's where uh, I, I, I read about them saying that more educated people 
um, use refraining from voting as a form of protest. So I'm still looking for more literature. I haven't found more yet, but I think it's not only to do with less developing or low middle income countries, but I guess the political climate also matters. So it has to be a political climate that, it, that perhaps doesn't have as much freedom, perhaps is economically quite stable, more stable, but political climate is a big issue there. Um, uh, to uh, Emmerich's question, we have a glorious history of university students bringing us our independence, them fighting. Even now our young people go to the streets for to protest different issues, but you have to understand, and I, I might, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> because this is in the UK, it's easier for me to say, but the situation is such that freedom of speech has gone to a very, very critical stage that university students are not in that position anymore. In 1971, when we gained our independence, that was led from Dhaka University. Now, the situation, if anybody who speaks up against anything, it's quite difficult. And I don't think I've, uh, I was a university student of that university. So I, and I've been in, uh, in university these the, over this last de decade, and I found it hard to, and this is not just on a national level, even wrongdoings around me. It's difficult to speak up because there are reper repercussions for speaking up. I think that has played a role. Um, in my other PhD, so my, my PhD looks at labor market outcomes and non-labor market outcomes. So the part of non-labor market outcomes, I do look at civic engagement. So that does show that more educated, their education and things like um, people um, contributing to society in different forms. So that is the non-voting part where I sort of look at how people civically engage. I don't know whether that answers your second question. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, can you say a bit more about employability? Oh, employability. No, we didn't. <laughs> so I, I, I think the question was about uh, 19, 20 years, because the, the, the age that the, chil the children, we say children because we're used to calling them children in the in young life, but uh, they are adults now. They are The younger cohort is 23, 24, I think, this year. So uh, we did, uh, so Ethiopia and Peru have very different education systems, like the grades. Uh, in Peru, you only got up to, you have primary, secondary, and 11, 11 years of school, and Ethiopia is different, and not everyone access to like year 10 and 11, and so on. So um, we did look at the, because the fund survey allowed us to look at the, in Ethiopia, like Finnish secondary education, because people going up is a bit more difficult, like the, the percentage is lower. And in Peru, we saw those who got into university, who started university or have finished very unlikely, but yeah. And then we, we did find positive associations between those outcomes, um, uh, again, the memory related cognitive skills. So yeah, it was consistent with those two skills mainly. I think we found something a bit there, again, with inhibitory control, nothing with implicit learning, like, like in the previous results. But yeah, we, we do found those. I haven't talked about them here, but they're in the paper. Okay, Ricardo, can you say a bit more about how you came or what is the motivation that you measured sexual behavior and what do you see as a yeah. useful ways forward here? So when we had the results for the uh, immediate impact of the program, we, uh, we realized it was very, very big. And we uh, speculated that uh, a program with uh, such important uh, effects on learning could um, induce students to stay in school longer and, even, and be more likely to make the progression into secondary school. Uh, and uh, as we've seen in previous presentations today, the, uh, when children start to, or adolescents start working, uh, they gain access to their own money and start doing things that would not do if they were exclusively in school. So uh, one of the behaviors that we th uh, thought uh, uh, could happen is that uh, students who dropped out more could uh, uh, start uh, uh, their sexual relationships earlier. Uh, uh, as <laughs> almost nobody has left uh, primary education yet, it, it's been difficult to, to uh, test that. Thanks. Let's have another round. Um, there's a question there, and not one there. Um, maybe I can kick off while you collect the mics. Um, on on the, the literature, there's one interesting paper on sub-Sahara Africa that looks at the relationship between elite capture and disengagement. And I wonder whether you, because you have local results as well, mm -hmm. and I understand that there's some variation across Bangladesh in, in, in kind of 
elite capture locally, whether you can exploit that to test that hypothesis that what they present is that if there's more, if, if your political competitors all come from the same elite, then there's much more disengagement. So that would be really great if you can try to test that with the data. Uh, sorry, so another Hi, question. Um, so I wanted to understand whether you are um, looking at the regional variation and income variation within regions, because that can explain a lot in our uh, in Bangladesh. Um, one, and I just wanted to just add that maybe you want to downplay the reduction in the political space argument in here because you're you're looking up to 2014 national election. The uh, you know the reduction in the public space has actually exacerbated over the last 10 years. Uh, but 2008 national election, 2009 uh, local government election, uh, Facebook was not that popular. So the Digital Security Act that has been used to recurve public uh, freedom of speech would not have had today's impact. So um, that you need to probably incorporate a little bit in your explanation. Like a fair point that, you know, the tendency to speak out may have gone down, but it's a more recent phenomena just for the sake that, you know, social media was not a big thing in 2008, 2009 in Bangladesh. So you need to look into that more deeply uh, and find, you know, explanations that would fit that climate better. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, on the election um, paper, uh, I just want to relate your results to what um, it's going on in some countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So, for example, um, I know every election has key issues that um, are presented to voters and that actually drive out whether people go out to vote or not. For example, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in recent votes, you could see a lot of youth and middle class actually pushed out. And if you look at in the past, um, it tends to actually uh, share a similar trend with your story. But more recent times, whereby the election issues revolve around um, maybe issues that are concerned of mid, uh, middle classes, they also actually have been seen to actually vote in those situations. So I don't know, maybe the election issues also play a role in kind of what drives voters in Bangladesh. There was one more question there. Uh, if we could get the mic there. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for all the oh, sorry. miles walking. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for the long distance. Yeah. Hi, uh, my question is for uh, Jennifer and Rubaya. So I noticed that both of you are using secondary data analysis. So sometimes like the primary data could be collected for a very different purpose. Uh, and then when it comes to cognitive uh, ability testing, you know, the, the enumerators, I had to kind of like go through like very intensive trainings in like psychological testings. So yeah, basically I just wonder like your insights on kind of using secondary data and then if you had the chance to redesign it, what you would like to add or yeah, anything from you would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, let's go. Well, let's take one more here and then I think we're gonna be very close to, to closing. Okay, team effort, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, no, just uh, um, I thought uh, there was a slight comment and specifically a question in terms of uh, uh, when you're uh, the results that we are talking about with regards to elections and uh, education are not surprising to me at all, uh, because we thought that uh, uh, at least from an Indian context, it was almost reasonable to get that distribution. If it were the other way around, I'd have been surprised. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to ask if you've looked also looked at uh, this cut from a gender perspective in terms of who's putting uh, more, because there is a correlation between education and gender there as well. And uh, uh, one of the rationales. Uh, uh, from an Indian context is more like uh, the idea of agency that you did mention earlier does play a large amount of part because uh, elections are almost seen as this uh, festival of agency where regardless of whatever else happens, you are able to register an opinion at one point of time, uh, which is a lot more important for folks who are a lot more disenfranchised in other aspects of life compared to the first one. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, let's try to keep the answers short, if you don't mind, uh, because we're running against time. Jennifer, do you, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, so about uh, 
So Eraser was uh, created by a psychologist with help of, uh, I think it's an economist that did all the programming and all, because it was really to get all the data that we wanted uh, to be able to get like time and so on. It, it had to be really well programmed. But the design was by the psychologist that I got to meet. And she was really like, you know, this, they have a whole paper about the implement, the, the creation of this and how it has been tested and it has been validated. So yeah, uh, would I change something about it? So the thing is that this is a longitudinal survey. Uh, I wouldn't benefit from changing anything because the idea is to take to take, make the participants take racer again in order to compare these results. And now that the younger cohort is actually in the labor market, we can do some we can do something there because you know actually racer has been tested in this round again. So uh, and it's really easy to test and the compliance is very high because it doesn't require that much and it's like kind of a relief from the survey which is very long. So yeah, I, I wouldn't change anything exactly there, uh, but if anything, I do would be more precise with the tasks. So none of, uh, we see that implicit learning, for example, really hard to measure. It really doesn't yield that many results. So I, I, will, I would drop that one and I would try to focus more on the literature to see what makes sense. So the first uh, executive function, definitely I would keep measuring that because it really, has really a lot of backup from the literature. Wonderful. Rubia, do you want to okay. answer the questions? Um, to uh, the question at the back, I did um, account for so, uh, regional and socioeconomic variation that's in the models. I would disagree with you on the social media point. We can uh, discuss this more over coffee, but I do not think protesting on social media is the same as what our students did in 1971. I think if social media was there back then, we wouldn't have become independent because it's it, I, I, that, the, Difference in opinion. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, election issues. Uh, so election issues. Thank you for that point. I, I, I will. That's a very good point. I'll think about that and specific election issues in the different elections. Um, secondary data. Vicky. Um, one of the biggest struggles with my PhD using secondary data was always feeling. Oh, I wish there was more data and especially more richness in the data in Bangladesh, especially with the educational data. And when I look at things like Young Lives data, RISE data, I wish there was more data on students' abilities, educational performance, intergenerational indicators. So I, I would change that. And I do say that in my PhD as well, that we really need to add these because these surveys have been going on for a long time without adding those very, very needed data to do educational research. Um, Thank you, uh, Arvind, right, uh, for that comment. Agency, definitely, and definitely, that's been a big thing, disenfranchisement, um, uh, agency. And I, the gender perspective, I haven't looked into that yet, but I agree that would be very, very interesting. I would like to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any final thoughts, Ricardo? Any of the questions? Uh, I think it's important, and we do these long follow-ups, uh, uh, more frequently because a, a fade out can be a very important part of the of the um, of the effect of the of the of the programs uh, and uh, yeah what happens later in life is going to be very relevant especially with uh, early interventions. Thank you so much. So I'm going to try to wrap up, but but Ricardo stole my thunder, so <laughs> <laughs> not much to say except for the lining. I think there's kind of perhaps three takeaways. One is the importance of these long-term follow-ups. And I hope we can do much more now that we have so many things going on, we can look at long-term data. The second is, is kind of to broaden out. What are these other outcomes? Uh, education is not just uh, to have success in the labor market. It is more than that. And can we measure more of that? That, that would be great. But I think that the, the third takeaway is and I think these papers provide really good, um, good examples of the big question remains this why. Why do we observe these relationships uh, between early outcomes and later outcomes or early skills and later outcomes and, and uh, later outcomes being both education and labor as well as citizenship and, and, and much broader. Um, so the why is, uh, th there's so much to do. And I think our, our conceptual thinking about capacity formation uh, will be really challenged by just empirical testing uh, of, of these relationships. So 
I want to especially thank uh, the younger cohort here, I'm looking through my glasses now, uh, of really uh, presenting wonderful work and uh, giving us lots of confidence of where this field is going. So thank you very much. And now it's time for tea. Yeah. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. We could all take our seats, Daniel and Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really excited and a little bit sad to be kicking off the final panel of the final RISE conference um, and coming to the end of what's been a really fantastic two days um, of learning and also really fantastic uh, time personally for me to get to spend time with all of you. Um, we concluded yesterday with a look forward at what is coming um, after a rise, and we're ending today with a look back at the consequences of the COVID-19 school closures. Um, but as I was reading these papers and reflecting, I was really thinking about what important messages, um, the lessons that we can learn from these papers have for preparation for future um, disasters and crises. In the early days of the pandemic, we looked back at examples from natural disasters to understand what the effects of school closures might be. Jishnu Tahir and Daniel's paper from the earthquake in Pakistan, which Rise put out, ended up being a really important one um, that, that was referenced widely. Um, and now looking back at the lessons from COVID, it, things are going in the other direction. What does that experience have from the pandemic to teach us about how to think about resilience, response, and preparation for the future? Um, I couldn't help but be thinking about children in Morocco and Libya as I was reading these papers um, and what's in store for them as the, uh, those countries recover from the disasters that happened um, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, so in this panel, we have three papers about how the return to school process worked um, and, and what the effects were on different subgroups of children. Uh, Carolina Better is going to start us off, or sorry, we're going to start off actually um, with a paper from Ashtosh, Ashtosh Buharia um, from India about uh, household choices around expenditures in education and return to school in India. Um, then we're going to go to Andreas Backhaus with uh, a cross country analysis from six countries in East and West Africa on patterns for girls' return to school um, and also on the types of fertility and labor market decisions. Um, that girls were making and events in their lives that shaped their return. Um, and then finally, we're going to turn to Carolina Better, um, who's going to speak to us about an experiment conducted by Ideas 42 and Oezo Uganda about what kinds of encouragement messages um, can help nudge parents to reinvest um, in, in sending their children back to school after the pandemic. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ashtosh to get us started. Thanks, Marla. All right. Let me see... I can make this work. Oh, I can. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Ashutosh Bharadia. I'm a PhD student at, uh, at Harvard, and I'm thankfully not on the job market. <laughs> I'm uh, presenting a paper which was done in collaboration with Emrick Davis right there, and Fei Huan, who couldn't make it. Um, so, and, um, so I'm going to start. So um, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic had a severe impact on education systems around the world. In particular, um, COVID-19 had um, resulted in school closures around the world, and there was a great deal of variation in terms of school closures. So as you can see, this is a plot of the number of days schools were closed, and these dots are like countries. Um, and India is right there in the corner. So India had the fourth largest or fourth longest school closure compared to other countries in the world. And as a result, schools in India also opened much later than elsewhere in the world. The other consequence of the pandemic was economic. So it led to economic turmoil. India experienced a great economic shock. As you can see, uh, India rebounded, but the initial economic shock was much more severe than the world median. So in this paper, what we're trying to do is we're saying that the combination of economic crisis and um, school closures led households in India to, to change their educational expenditure and also their schooling decisions. This brings me to our research questions. So our research questions are, what is the impact of COVID-19 related school reopening on A, household, expend, ex, household education expenditure in India. What's the impact of COVID-19 related school reopening on school choice in India? So for example, school choice in the terms of 
moving from private to public schools, from public to private schools, or dropping out of schooling altogether? And finally, what was the impact on time spent on learning? To answer these questions, we leverage two sources of data. So the first source is data from the Center for Monitoring the, In the Indian Economy's Consumer Household Pyramid Data, or henceforth CMIE. Uh, CMIE is a high frequency panel data of household consumption. So we use data from 2014 to 2022. Uh, this data, these data are collected quarterly and um, every quarter it has detailed information about consumption, specifically on education expenditure for different education categories. Something else which is relevant to this paper is that CMIE has data for time spent on learning and just generally like time, uh, just generally time use data. The second source of data we use is data on school closing and reopening by state between February 2020, so just at the beginning of the pandemic, to uh, August 2022. These data are manually coded um, through media reports and government circulars. So just kind of talking a little bit more about the data and, talk, uh, and, and giving you a few more sp specifics which will inform our results. So the CMI data contains data, as I said, on children's time spent on learning and household expenditure on school fees. But the data doesn't explicitly provide information on whether children are in public or private schools. So to kind of identify that information, we use data on school fee and time spent on learning. So if, if school fee and time spent on learning are both positive, then we code that as child attending private school. If school fee is zero, but the time spent on learning is positive, we code that as child attending a public school. And if both are zero, uh, we code that as not attending school. The other important aspect of our data is the school reopening data. Again, as I mentioned, these are hand-coded data using media reports and government circulars. So the way we code it is by state quarter grade level. So first we divide, we divide the data into three grade levels. So primary one to five, upper primary six to eight, and secondary nine to 12. Then of course we kind of divide the year into four quarters as one does. Um, so the way we code it as is school is open on any, if school is open on any day for any grade of a grade level in a quarter in a particular state, we code that as open for that state quarter grade level and closed otherwise. Uh, that's quite a mouthful. So I'll try to illustrate this with an example. So for example, in the Indian state of Delhi, if say schools were open for grades one to five in, in the months of January to March, 2021, then we would code that as open for Delhi for that quarter for the primary grade level. So that's essentially how we did the coding for um, school reopening data. So before I go to our empirical strategy and our uh, causal results, I wanna show some uh, descriptive results. So this is a chart of school attendance by private schooling, government schooling, and out of school, and out of school students, right? So this is CMI data from 2014 to 2022. So from 2014 to 2019, we roughly see enrollment in government schools decreasing and enrollments in private schools increasing. So in 2019, it's around, uh, the enrollment in private school is around 40%, right? Uh, but around the pandemic, we see the kind of trends go in opposite directions. So the enrollment in private school dips and the enrollment in government school increases. So we kind of see a switch here. We also see a slight increase in the number of, or in the proportion of out of school children. Uh, this is our other descriptive result is just a sharp increase in out of pocket expenditure on education, right? So which we would expect given the economic shock. So uh, educational expenditure dropped across the board the blue line is the total education expenditure. So like you can see from 2000 to 2000, sorry, from 2019 to 20, we see a sharp decline. 
and the other other lines are education expenditure categories so even in those categories we see a sharp decline all right so we've arrived at the mathy part of our presentation so uh, we're trying to estimate the change in education expenditure between households that send their children to different grades and we leverage this and we leverage the variation in um, state st state level school reopening and the variation in grade level differences in school reopening across states um, we we use child grade state level and quarter fixed effects to compare observations within the within these levels um, we also capture other outcomes which is which is not shown in the specification here so specifically we capture four outcomes related to school choice so the first outcome we capture is switch from public to private schools from private to public schools from private school to dropout and from public school to dropout So this is the first set of uh, event, event study results. So we plot our results in an event study design. And before I kind of talk about the results, I'd briefly talk about the event study plot. So the first three quarters are the kind of negative quarters are the first quarter is the pre-pandemic quarter. And the two other quarters are when there was a national lockdown in India. So schools weren't open across the board, across states, regardless of grade level. So that's the first three quarters, the kind of pre-trend, so to speak. Then in September 2020, schools opened in India. So everything is relative to the quarter before which the schools reopened in India. So all kind of point estimates are relative to that. So this is, um, this is the event study plot for private to government school switching. And here we find directly after schools reopen, we see a 2.5% increase in private to government school switch directly after the quarter. And then in the next quarter, we see like a 1% shift. And then um, after three quarters, we see a decline and become zero. Then this is the event study plot for private to school dropout switching. So students, uh, children who were in private schools, did school reopening cause them to drop out, right? So here we see a very small positive and significant effect of school reopening on private school to drop out. Then our next plot is public to dropout school switching. So did school reopenings in India cause students to from students who are in public schools to drop out of schooling altogether here though there is a downward sloping line but we see no effect because the confidence intervals are uh, confidence intervals are large and we can't precisely estimates we can't precisely estimate an effect again this is more on the expenditure side so we see we kind of check if uh, school reopening caused a change in expenditure on private tutoring. Here too, we find no effect. Time spent on learning, uh, did that change as a result of school reopening? We see it decreasing, uh, but there is no effect. And I think the time spent on learning as a result, like the decrease in time spent of learning as a result of school reopening, might be because students were potentially like studying or engaging in engaging in studying remotely before schools reopened or the other possibility is that students dropped out of school altogether so talking about some of the potential like mechanisms like what happened why do we see these kind of shifts in expenditure and especially some preliminary results on the side of switching from private schooling to public schooling or dropping out uh, of school altogether. So one mechanism could be substitution. So basically households substitute for from for, formal schooling to private tutoring. 
However, we don't see that in the data. We don't see like an increase in private tuition or private tutoring expenditure. The other thing could be like households are waiting. Households are waiting until formal schools reopen. So they've artificially kind of stopped spending on education for a period of time. And they're waiting for schools to reopen, at least in our period, for them to start spending on education again. The other, which the third possibility, which seems more plausible, is just an economic crisis where households have permanently decreased their expenditure on education. Because of COVID, there has been financial turmoil, and that might have, um, that might have kind of forced households to uh, shift resource allocation towards other, uh, other aspects of consumption and moved it away from uh, schooling. And then on the private schooling side, like, so why do we see these shifts in private schooling and what mechanisms might explain them? So one thing could be that on the demand side, like once schools reopened, parents simply couldn't afford sending their kids to private schools. So kids dropped out of schools altogether. That could be one mechanism. On the supply side, when the schools reopened, potentially because of the economic crisis, a lot of private schools in India had to close down. And then the school and the students who were in those schools had to either move to public schools or had to um, get out of school altogether. So just again, summarizing some of our tentative conclusions. So we see an initial small switch from private schools to government schools and government dropouts and sorry, school dropouts. We see no increase in expenditure on tuition. So this kind of suggests that financial crisis hit households and they responded by cutting back educational expenditure altogether. And we see a non-significant decrease in time spent on learning. Um, given this is kind of preliminary, like the, uh, this is a very preliminary analysis. So we're kind of thinking of next steps in terms of our analysis. So first we are thinking of running analysis with other specifications of school reopening. So for instance, using um, like coding data as the number of weeks uh, schools were open in a quarter rather than a simple binary of one zero, right? And also using more recent CMI data because currently we use CMI data till August, 2022. And we might want to figure out the long run effects of school reopening. So we, we might want to see data from 2023 and also data from before. Uh, but anyway, thanks a lot for listening to me. And this is like a preliminary stage project. So we will appreciate all kinds of feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashtosh. We'll turn to Andreas. Great example, right? On time. Good start. Yes, thank you for this very interesting first presentation. I'm happy to follow up. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm a postdoc at the Federal Institute for Population Research, or BIB. And I'm presenting on uh, young women returning to school in Sub-Saharan Africa during COVID-19. Just um, something before I start, I was asked a lot uh, by some Americans attending this conference, we have a Federal Institute for Population Research. And the answer is, uh, no, sorry. Um, we are a German institute. We were founded 50 years ago to analyze demographic change in Germany. Since then, we have brought out to uh, global population studies. Um, I'm in the research group Global and Regional Population Dynamics. We are a mixed team of demographers, economists. I'm an economist and statisticians. We do research on global population trends. And if you work at UN, we also represent Germany, the UN Commission on Population and Development. So sorry, not an American institution, but uh, we are around doing population research on developing countries. So the motivation for this paper is, as we all know, the COVID-19 lockdowns in 2020 um, led to nearly global school closures for several weeks at least. And after spring 2020, we saw a lot of heterogeneity in the duration, continued stringency and recurrence also of school closures. So the questions are, of course, how have the school populations been affected, how have they adjusted, how have they responded to these lockdowns. And Sub-Saharan Africa is a particular case, of course, because there's generally 
high uncertainty about the return to school. Uh, for example, there could be binding economic constraints on students. Um, there's a particular vulnerability of female students. And some of these concerns have already been raised by some papers published early or during the pandemic. And um, so in this paper, I try a bit to study the return to school of young women in six sub-Saharan African countries, where I can differentiate between the prolonged closures, the reopening of school, and the actual return behavior. I can also analysis and um, analyze female fertility and labor supply, conditional on whether the school has reopened or not, and whether women have returned or not. And thereby, I try to contribute to a growing uh, literature on the gendered educational impacts of uh, COVID-19. The data stems from the performance monitoring for action surveys, um, which have been collected in Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Niger, and Uganda. There's broad sub subnational coverage, except in uh, the DRC, where only like the two most Western regions are covered. Um, it includes um, for this particular questions related to schooling, women aged 15 to 25, a total of 8,311 observations. Actually, PMA is a longitudinal survey that started right before COVID, but I'm using only the phase two, which was collected at different timings within the pandemic, giving me some uh, variation that I will show you in a minute. So it asked about in this phase two about school attendance at the outbreak of COVID and the reopening of the schools and the return behavior and also contextual information on fertility and labor supply. For labor supply, I can distinguish basically two outcomes, whether women have done any independent and paid work recently, which I argue is kind of an indicator for more skilled employment, or whether they've just done work aside from their own housework, which was defined or surveyed as basically work close to the household, close to the household farm, for example, so rather low-skilled uh, work. So, oh, I hope you can see that. So this gray shaded area is the survey collection time. And these are the, it's a school closure index uh, for Burkina Faso. So there was a hard lockdown requiring closures at all levels in March, 2020, but then was phased out very brief, um, raising uh, to a level of recommending closures only, but um, by the time of the survey collection, the big lockdown uh, was already beyond. Um, that's similar in Cote d'Ivoire. Actually, there was a small rebound around the Omicron time, but the survey was collected right before that when the restrictions had been phased out. Similar, Niger survey was collected actually in early 2022, long after the last uh, restrictions had been there. The DRC is a bit of a mixed bag because they were in the process of phasing out um, the restrictions by the end of 2020, and there was a brief rebound of the lockdowns, but um, yeah, basically all this is overlapping with their survey collection. And then there are the two basically prolonged closure countries, which is Kenya, which by the end of 2020 uh, was still recommending or was still requiring school closures at some levels when the survey was collected here. And of course, the case we've heard before from Uganda, where closures were required at all levels far into uh, 2021 when the survey was collected. So if I just basically pool the information from all countries, I adjust for country fixed effects, I plot the school attendance before COVID-19 across the age of the female respondents, and then what is said during COVID-19, so basically have you returned to school, I see a drop in female school attendance at the youngest ages of 15 by something like 20 percentage points, and by at least 15 percentage points even at the higher levels who were, of course, attending secondary tertiary education by this time, by the age. So basically a quite large drop in school attendance all across the age range. When I do this country by country, we see a fairly large rebound of female school attendance in Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire and the DRC, and in Niger at a low level, of course, but we see very low rebound uh, in Kenya and Uganda, of course, the two um, prolonged lockdown countries. This is, these are the rates of school reopening. So between 70 and 80% of women in the sample actually said their schools have reopened. And again, 70 to 80% have then also returned to their schools when they have reopened. Also, this is a surprisingly stable 
uh, pattern across the whole age that I see. When I do this country by country again, in, this, in the four countries that we opened kind of quickly, um, large rate of reopening and high rate of return. Kenya actually has a fairly high reopening rate, but a low rate of return of only 40%. Uganda is a, um, has a low rate of reopening, but actually to the few schools that have reopened, there's a high rate of returning to them. Um, so moving to the regression analysis, what I can do, so I regress a dummy if a woman is currently pregnant on the information about the school reopening and return. So the baseline comparison group are women who have already been out of school before the pandemic. And the first group are women who say their schools are still closed. And then I get into the group, they say that the schools have reopened, but they have not returned, meaning they have dropped out of school. And then the last group are women whose schools have reopened and who have returned. And I control for age and country fixed effects, control for household wealth, um, the school level, and in the second and fourth column also for births that have occurred before the pandemic. So in terms of pregnancies, we don't see much. Could of course be the reason that the pregnancy rate is quite low, just 6%. So it's difficult to find um, significant differences here. But we see a lot more in terms of births that have occurred since COVID-19. So that's also a dummy, whether a woman has had any births. So we see compared to the baseline of women who have already been out of school, the women who are still under lockdown have a significantly lower probability of having given birth. So we can see basically some protection against um, fertility still for them. But the women whose schools have reopened but who have dropped out actually have a four percentage point higher birth rate since COVID-19 than the women who had already been out of school before. And the largest protection from fertility are, of course, enjoying the women who have returned to school because their birth rate has been significantly lower by 4.3 percentage points, which are all large differences compared to the baseline of nearly 13 percent, um, the baseline birth rate um, among the out-of-school women. <coughs> Yeah, I differentiate this by age. The good news here is um, there's not much going on in terms of teenage. Um, so the darker plots are women aged 15 to 19. There are the differences in the birth rate since COVID-19 actually quite small. When this is opening up at age 20 to 25, then of course the out of school women have a higher birth rate, but the women who have dropped out of school during COVID-19 um, their birth rate then also jumps up basically to the same level. Um, I can do the same for labor supply using the more skilled independent paid work outcome. And here we see the women under lockdown have a three percentage points lower probability of having done this more skilled work, which makes sense. They are still under lockdown. They are still waiting for the schools to reopen. But then what is concerning is the women who have dropped out also have a significantly lower probability of having done this skilled work. Meaning, although they have dropped out, this doesn't look like they've been well integrated into the labor market already. And which is not surprising then, the women who have returned to school, they are of course less likely to have provided labor as well. But actually there's no difference between the dropouts and the ones who have returned to school. When I look at the less skilled work close to the household, the women under lockdown, less likely to have provided this work. But what is also concerning, the women who have dropped out are just as likely to have performed this kind of simple work as the women who had already been out of school before. So there we see a complete assimilation basically in this uh, low skill segment of uh, labor supply. And here, of course, the women who have returned to school are the most protected against having supplied this low skilled labor. Um, so in context, <clears throat> generally there's a high share of female students returning after the lockdowns, which is in line with some country by country findings um, I've cited before. Um, the prolonged lockdown in Kenya is consistent with some evidence on learning loss in Kenya from other studies. Um, I have a small paper and uh, some colleagues from the Johns Hopkins have a paper on 
pregnancies and unintended pregnancies during COVID-19 using also PMA data where we didn't find uh, any differences in pregnancies consistent with here, but we didn't look at birth. So in, at birth, actually, there's more happening. And um, the results basically could indicate potential labor market scarring effects. So basically, these women were pushed out of education during the pandemic, which was also a very difficult labor market, meaning they had great difficulty integrating into the labor market and they're punished by this by um, only finding these low skilled jobs which is uh, in line with results presented in a recent very nice World Bank report on human capital losses during the pandemic by Shadi and Silva, who were the editors, there were many con contributors. Limitations of what I'm doing. So everything here is self-reported, could of course be some biases or mistakes. Um, it was not asked about online instruction, but I think we know online instruction probably played only a limited role in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I don't have information on men of the same age and potential gender gaps. Of course, they're also important. I have no information on learning, only on attendance. So uh, basically, learning is where you come in. And what I'm really comparing is I'm most comparing women between countries due to the national character of the lockdown policy. So for example, I'm comparing women in Uganda who are still under lockdown to women in Burkina Faso, where the lockdown has already been lifted. So what I want to say with this, I'm not giving this a causal difference and difference interpretation because I don't think, I mean, some people might argue this, but uh, I think this basically country comparison doesn't make uh, or isn't telling so much in a causal way. Although I have few pandemic controls, at least for fertility. So short lockdowns, basically the message in the four countries had only marginal impact on female school attendance, but the prolonged lockdowns, they did still a lot in terms of depressing female school attendance way into 21 and 22. Uh, interestingly, the rates of reopening and return have been stable across age, which maybe is a concern because we would think the highest priority should be bringing the women aged 15, 16 back into school. Um, so that's maybe concerning. We didn't see higher rates of return there. Uh, the fertility of non-returning women since COVID-19 is higher than the fertility of women who had left school earlier, even after controlling for pre-COVID birth, um, which of course could indicate potential selection of women with stronger fertility preference or high vulnerability to um, into non-return to school during COVID. And there's indication of labor market scaring among the dropouts. So basically, this is a big picture paper spanning several countries to now connect maybe back to the micro evidence that you are mostly working with. Um, what do we know about incentivizing return to school? We will see about this in Carolina's uh, presentation. There's also a paper by uh, Malucha et al. Um, it could be potential for on the job trainings for school dropouts when they're in the labor market later. Uh, it could also be an opportunity for expanding remote learning opportunities to higher ages, as we saw yesterday in uh, uh, the presentation of the paper by um, Norm and co-authors. And um, there could be a role for increased support, support for family planning after the first child, basically, if this has occurred during the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andreas. And now, Carolina, to close us out. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, they're loading the presentation. My name is Carolina Better. I'm an Associate Managing Director at Ideas42, and I lead our global education portfolio or sub-focus area. Um, and today, I'm going to be presenting. Thanks for the mention, Andreas, by the way. I'm going to be presenting about a project that we conducted in the summer of 2021, where we um, design behavioral messages to encourage caregivers to send their children with a particular focus on their daughters back to school once they reopened in Uganda. I know we've heard a lot about Uganda. Um, and before I get started, I guess as I've met people uh, in this conference and I say I work for Ideas42, I get one of two reactions, either Ideas What or, oh, cool, Ideas42. Um, so if you're on the first group, um, we are a nonprofit um, organization that uses applied behavioral science to find solutions to various social problems around the world. Um, 
It started more than a decade ago as a small lab in Harvard University by some professors that basically wanted to bridge the gap between theory and practice. And so that's kind of the goal um, of what we do. I'm not an academic. Um, we uh, really bring in our projects the expertise on behavioral science, um, and we rely very heavily on our partners, implementing partners on the ground. And so for this project, we partnered with USA Uganda, who we've also heard about uh, in this conference. Um, but for those of you who don't know them, they're a nonprofit organization based in Uganda, um, and they essentially run um, household learning assessments every two, three years. Um, to measure numeracy, literacy skills of children ages four to 16 years old. Um, and this was uh, funded, this work was funded by Echidna Giving. So some background, I'm going to go through this quickly to not be repetitive, but kind of to set the stage. Um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, about 260 million children, adolescents, and youth um, globally were um, out of school. This is about a sixth of the total global population for this age group. Um, despite all the work that um, people in the room, outside the room have done to kind of close the gender gap in education, um, there's still a gap. And so in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, for every 100 boys that are out of school, um, there were 123 girls out of school in 2019. Um, in 2021, when we did this work, it was actually estimated that 11 million girls would not return to schools um, with adolescents, as adolescent girls being at particular risk in low and middle income countries. And then as we've heard over and over, um, Uganda saw the, lo the longest pandemic prompted shutdown in the world, which lasted 22 months. Um, so what was our objective and why did we partner for this work? Um, 2021 was actually a very unique year for USO Uganda in that it was the first year that they were going to conduct this learning assessment while schools were closed. And so we saw this as the perfect opportunity to actually design messages um, to encourage caregivers to send their kids with a special focus on daughters back to school because we were going to have their attention in the first place. Um, girls were out of school, kids were out of school. Um, and there was gonna be someone that was gonna be talking to them. So it, they had the opportunity to do that. Um, and so how we did this, we followed our framework. This is kind of the framework that we use for most, if not all of our projects, um, where we start by defining the behavioral problem or challenge that we wanna focus on. In this case, it was how to encourage caregivers to send their kids and daughters back to school. Um, we then diagnose the features of the context or the environment um, that might be causing or exacerbating this behavioral challenge, um, typically through uh, qualitative um, research methods. We then design an intervention. So we design potential solutions that directly address the behavioral barriers that were identified during diagnosis. We, oops, we then test them, um, ideally through our CTs. Sometimes that's not possible. And then we aim to scale any proven solutions. So again, the behavioral challenge, encourage caregivers to send their children, particularly their daughters, back to school. Um, and what were some of the key behavioral barriers that we identified? I'll, I'll start by saying that um, we didn't have a lot of time to conduct diagnosis because when this project started, when we received the funding, there wasn't a long period of time between that point in time and when the assessments were going to happen. And so we had to kind of do a quick um, diagnosis. And so we ended up um, interviewing USA Uganda staff and volunteers and some of their partners. Um, and some of the key behavioral barriers that came out of this, um, and these are hypotheses, um, were one, social norms. So this idea that we as humans will act in the way that we see others in our community, or we think that others in our community are acting, whether they do it or not, it's the way that we think that they're acting. So in this case, you know, caregivers may believe that it's not common to send um, girls to school, and so they choose not to do that. And um, this could, be, could have been exacerbated during COVID because of 
uh, some of the things that Andres was just presenting, um, increased marriage, increased pregnancy rates um, among girls during COVID-19 could, you know, uh, prevent them from going back to school. Another thing that came out of these conversations was that um, present bias. So this idea that we'll prioritize um, the present and sometimes at the expense of our future. And so in this case, what that meant was, you know, caregivers may focus on the short-term benefits of having girls um, help out at home or contribute to uh, the household income. And um, this is particularly important during COVID because the kids were already out of school. So this idea of, you know, keeping them in the house versus sending them back is already more challenging. Um, as well as you know, people were facing economic challenges as we heard as well in, in the previous presentations. And so um, it's very salient what the benefits of keeping the kids in, in, at home are versus the long-term benefits of sending them to school. Um, and so we designed two interventions. Um, both of them have the same two components, um, which I'll get into in a second, but I will caveat by saying that um, another constraint that we had was that these learning assessments are already taking a long period of time. Um, enumerators and volunteers are already spending a lot of time speaking to um, caregivers in, in the household. And so um, they really wanted the intervention to be very simple, very quick, easy to implement, and ideally easy to scale. And so what we came up with was um, interventions that follow these two components. First, it was a message that um, the enumerator would read at the end of the survey, and that was coupled with uh, leave behind material. And so the first um, intervention was targeting this idea of social norms. And so the message that was designed read like this. Uh, in Uganda, more than eight out of 10 parents are sending their young children to school and almost half of all students are girls. Each year, more than 100,000 students graduate from secondary school or start their tertiary education. Don't let your daughters and sons be left behind. And then um, the enumer enumerators handed this certificate um, of planned completion uh, to, to the household head of household. Um, and they handed one certificate for each of the kids in their household. So not just their daughters, not just you know, a specific age group, um, where they had to complete the name of their, their child and certify that they were going to send them to school, their signature and the date, and branding from US, so Uganda, to increase credibility. Um, the second intervention addressed the present bias um, hypothesis, and so the message read, Children who complete their education are empowered to support their families. This is especially true for girls. Girls who complete their secondary education make twice as much money on average with those completing their tertiary education earning even more. Overall, completing education is much more profitable than dropping out of school for reasons such as taking a short-term job or getting married early. So really highlighting the financial benefits of completing an education. And this was coupled with um, what we called an education commitment, which um, basically highlighted, um, again, the benefits of sending their kids to school. And um, it had what we call an enhanced active choice, which is basically just showing, you know, the two choices and the benefits and cons of uh, whichever choice they select. So yes, I'm going to send my kids to school and these are the benefits or no, I choose not to send them. And these are kind of the implications of not doing so. And again, signing and dating it. Um, and I should mention, we designed these um, in close collaboration with USO Uganda. And so for the experimental design, uh, we ran on RC team. And so um, the basically the, um, the household assessments were conduct, the learning assessments were conducting in the summer of 2021, um, and they vis USO visited 5,000 households that were uh, randomly assigned into three groups, um, either treatment one that received the social norms uh, intervention and 10 districts belonged to treatment one. 10 districts were assigned to treatment two, which received the present bias uh, related intervention and nine districts uh, were assigned to the control group. Um, in January 2022, schools reopened, 
um, and USO collected data at the school level. I will get to that in a second. Um, by selecting a sample of five districts per group um, that contain about 15 schools per district. And so, as you might be thinking already, this is kind of one of the key limitations of this project, which is that treatment was delivered at the household level, but data was then collected at the school level. Um, and so we lost a big sample um, in doing that, but unfortunately, that's kind of the resources that we had, and it was the second best option that we were dealing with. And so what we found um, and the results that you see here are comparing percent change in enrollment from March 2020, which is when schools closed, and then comparing it to re-enrollment rates um, in the term between January 2022 through May 2022, which is the first term after schools reopened. Um, and so what we found was that schools in districts belonging to the control group increased their total enrollment. So for both boys and girls by 2.5% um, and schools in districts belonging to the treatment group increased their total enrollment by 9.5%, um, which is about 2.8 times more than the schools in the control group. Um, and we see kind of similar results uh, for when we look at the data for girls only. Um, when we compared the two treatment arms and, and kind of tried to see whether one was more effective than the other, we found no difference, um, no difference when we looked at girls only either. Um, and unfortunately, these results are not statistically significant, um, which was super disappointing. Um, but why am I sharing them today then? Good question. Um, so, perfect. Um, so, one thing I want to highlight is how the interventions were so low cost. I didn't mention this, but they cost less than 20 cents per child. It was mainly just printing that material, training the enumerators to deliver the message. They were extremely easy to implement. Enumerators were already speaking to caregivers, so they just needed to add that to their talking points. Um, and when we look at effect sizes, effect sizes are actually pretty big um, and the sample size is pretty small. So we, we feel that these are suggestive results that um, behaviorally designed interventions can be effective at impacting caregiver behavior, um, especially when there's already a channel that can reach so many people. And so um, kind of just wanna encourage you guys, and if anybody wants to test those out with us with a larger sample where we're in, let me know. Uh, but uh, behavioral messages delivered through national assessments have large impact potential at scale. And you know, in this case, we focused on encouraging caregivers to send their kids back to school, but we could use any potential message. It could be about encouraging caregivers to read with their kids more often or to engage in online learning platforms with their children. So kind of the opportunities are out there and um, these can be very, very simple, low-cost messages. This is my email in case anybody is interested in collaborating. Thank you. Uh, yes, let's have a seat and we'll get started on questions. So Andreas has to run to catch a bus to catch a plane. So we'll start doing uh, the first round. Um, we'll just take questions for him in one round, and then we'll open it up for everyone. And at some point, he'll he might sneak away. I apologize for that <laughs> timing. So, any questions on the paper about the six countries in Africa? Oh, yes, Megan, please. Question, but the <laughs> <laughs> is that better? Okay. Great. So um, one question about the conclusion that you arrived to at uh, when we saw the fertility drop, or sorry, the uh, yes, fertility rates were lower for youth, for young women who both dropped out, or sorry, who were, who didn't return to school. Is that right? No, they were higher. 
fertil- sorry, yes, okay. Fertility rates were higher for youth, young women who didn't return to school. And one of the hypotheses at the end is that there could be some like reverse ca- causality there. Um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about like how the, just how we should think about that related to like the differences between those schools and the comparison group. Cause I was just like a little confused about that. It could be a, a question for the future, but I just was thinking about if the comparison group is places where, um, if the comparison, thinking about like what, what is the comparison group and how that, that, that coefficient mm-hmm. is different. So is it, is it that in places where there were longer closures, young, young women were more likely to could have been more likely to get pregnant and then therefore they couldn't return to school or am I not thinking that, about that in the correct way? Okay, so, so, so we'll, start, we'll take, we'll take a oh, round sorry. and then we'll come. Any other questions? But then I have one to add, sure. um, which is actually a question for, for both of you, for both of the descriptive papers. Um, I was wondering about characteristics that might be able to differentiate between the returners and the non-returners. You both were drawing on larger surveys, which is something I think is interesting about all three of these papers, actually. And you're both drawing on larger surveys and, you know, you wouldn't be able to say anything causal necessarily, but might there be any interesting coefficients in those fixed effects buckets um, that we could look to for identifying the the at-risk students? So we'll give it to Andreas and then Ashwish, you can also respond to that one. Yes, thank you. Um, There was a comparison group where women who had left school even before COVID. so they, of course, advanced already on their fertility trajectory earlier than the women who stayed at least in school until COVID. And I tried to control for this with a pre-COVID fertility control. Um, and then I basically see this overshooting of the women who dropped out during COVID in terms of their fertility over this baseline comparison group. There could, of course, be that a lot of first birth happened among this group of uh, women. And I agree the causality there, it could be uh, as a direction of the of what happened, basically, the time sequence is not clear from and I only have one wave of data per country. So um, I cannot basically take this apart. If this answers your questions. Yes, it does. Just basically, mm-hmm. like, we can't reject the fact that it could have been reversed. Totally, totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, and to your question, yes, basically, you can turn these regressions around. So you can use the return status as an outcome and regress it on uh, individual household characteristics, which would also not be causal because there could be lots of unobservable selection going on. Um, I agree. It could be interesting. The problem is you can not really present both things uh, in the same paper. Basically, you know, now I'm flipping around with my regression. So I was using basically this group allocation of return, non-return. We can argue uh, the school reopening basically was a policy decision. So at least this group allocation was uh, determined exogenously. And then there was a self-selection of women into return, non-return. There's a different paper. I know Isis Gattis is on there. She's at the World Bank. It's a working paper by the World Bank. And they also do cross-country analysis of school return. And yeah, they basically run the reverse regressions, which uh, characteristics are associated with the return. So you want to look into this, I think you will find it. Yeah, I can only speculate, uh, which is not a great like habit as an academic, but um, I, I suppose like based on what we're seeing that educational expenditure has reduced, like one, one kind of heterogeneity would be in household incomes. So like SES, lower income, higher income households. Uh, The other thing, which Andrea's paper also kind of points out, there could be like a gender story. So within households, if there are multiple children, like maybe boys might be prioritized over girls. But again, all speculation, we'll have to kind of do some heterogeneity analysis and see if if those patterns actually exist. So let's open it up now for paper uh, questions about any, any three of the papers. Go to Kate. Uh, hi, my question is for Ashutosh. I was um, wondering if you could just speak to what the broader implications are for the Indian school system of the shift from private to public schools. Um, 
I could imagine, you know, a narrative where this has been really hard for public schools to absorb more students. I could also see a potentially positive spin where this might kind of lead to greater investment in the public school system from families that have traditionally opted out. Um, and then I can also, you know, I, I'd be curious to hear if you've been seeing a lot of closures of private schools in a way that's kind of reducing supply of those um, that may also be affecting then parents' decisions. Well, here in the second room or third row. No, right here, next to Meadow. Sorry, Katie. Also to Ashutosh. Um, so just wondering during the pandemic time, um, like uh, if there is any way to figure out if say nonprofits stepped in a lot during that particular time, which could have contributed to like reduce expenses because of that. So, um, so maybe that's something more of a suggestion than a, than a, than a question on that. Thanks. Third question. Oh, oh Meno. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Ab Abhijit, go for it and then we'll come to Meno. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is also for Ashutosh, and it's one of those annoying ones about, you know, I, I would write the paper differently, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering if you have a sense of what the heterogeneity in just the descriptives looks like, both across the SES distribution and different states, because to some extent, everyone's, everyone's forgotten that COVID happened and discussions of, you know, whether school closures were a good thing or a bad, that is not a... Unfortunately, that's just not something that we're talking about anymore or are thinking about till the next pandemic, whereas all of these other things are things that we will have to deal with in the next year, two years, about exactly who is in what type of schools and are they staying there? Because that has implications for, you know, what populations are you serving? Uh, how has that changed? How has composition of classrooms and things like that changed? So that was just a suggestion for stuff that you can do with your data now that you have the code set up. <laughs> Meno, who is your question for? That was also Asutosh. Okay, so uh, why don't we hold on that one? I'm going to ask the question for Carolina, and then we'll do another round. Um, so, Carolina, for you, I was really interested um, in the, the sort of pictogram you shared of your process um, as an organization. And I was wondering, um, one thing I didn't see is like a refine step. Like we get the results and then maybe we do something differently. Um, so I was wondering if there was anything that you learned um, in this study that if you were doing it again, or maybe for the future collaborations that you're gonna get lots of emails about following this conference, um, things that you learned that you would do differently in the future. So, okay, so yes, start, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first question. Uh, I hope I get this, but like you're kind of, talking, asking about the broader implications for the school systems, especially like private versus like public schooling in India. Um, I, I mean, like, I don't know about the broader systemic issues. Like I think, but one thing seems for certain that it's definitely been a neg neg net negative in terms of students dropping out of school. And if there are students moving from private schools to like government schools, obviously they mu there must be some kind of a strain on like government schools. So I don't know if there is a positive spin to it. The positive spin could be that there might be a greater reliance on public schools uh, and shifting away from like private schools, which was the trend we were seeing before 2019. But, but it's very hard to say if this is a net positive. And uh, Sabrish, yeah, great point. Uh, we, should, we kind of look into some heterogeneity regarding like non-state actors being involved in states in terms of helping the school system and uh, kind of helping with school closures. Um, to Abhijit's point, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it would be interesting to look at a lot of heterogeneity across states. Now we have the code, we can look at like across states, the amount of a school closure like across states and how compositions of students in these different states has changed. That would be interesting to see, and that's something we might want to do as next steps, uh, which 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 we would like to do. Um, thanks for your question. So that framework that I presented is actually a simplified version of the framework. It typically has like all these arrows going back and forth because the idea is to continuously refine and iterate based on the findings on each subsequent phase. So like 
you go to diagnosis, you're going to find so much more information than you had during problem definition. Is that really the problem? Okay, let's go back, back and forth, back and forth. Um, what I would change, um, I mean, ideally we would have a bigger sample so that we get significant results. That would be number one, if we were able to collect data at the individual level or even be able to track the specific students that received the intervention and what happened with each, each individual. That would be ideally what I would want. Um, if I could go back and redo it again, probably spend more time in diagnosis as well so that we feel more comfortable with the, that those are the right behavioral barriers. I think they are accurate, but maybe we missed some other ones that we didn't address necessarily. And so just knowing that. Uh, Menno, we'll start with you. This, this may, I just misunderstood, but um, could the, the shift towards public be just a definition question that maybe because school closures, they stop paying for school and therefore you suddenly classify them as public? So we'll do it. We'll do right. it around. Okay. Uh, also, is my turn? Yes. Uh, Ashutosh, was, is the, was there any, what was the discussion or was there any discussion by the government on uh, strategies to, to respond to these shifts? So subsidies, maybe subsidies, temporary subsidies for private schools or some kind of strategy to absorb students quickly into the public sector. I asked this because in Peru they had they had a very similar uh, exodus of quick exodus of students from the private, and the government decided to absorb them. They used the, kind of a centralized mechanism to quickly absorb them, and they they but they thought about the two options. So I was wondering if was there any discussion about this, or was it just something that happened? And what did this cause any any problems in the public sector, overcrowding, or how did they how did they absorb these these students? Great, and then I think we'll go to Lant. I was just curious, like, how do you, in a, if you do two treatment arms, they have the same effect. Why isn't it just a Hawthorne effect? I mean, it, it seems impossible to say this was a behavioral thing versus it was just a Hawthorne effect. Somebody saying anything would have had exactly the same impact. I just don't understand. I mean, this is sort of generic about these behavioral interventions. It's like, they never seem to be tested against a real hypothesis. So we're gonna go to Ashtosh and Yeah, I can, I can respond. No, you're right, actually. Um, this is something we might wanna look at because we can't identify in the data, in the survey, whether the school uh, students went to private schools or like public schools. And the only way we are able to identify is that if they don't pay fee, fees, but if private schools for a particular period, period of time stop fees, they might be classified as like public schools. And this might have happened in certain states. So this is something that we might want to look at and see if there is state level variation like based on that. So you're correct on that point. Uh, and it links, like it links well to your point about like how government was involved. Uh, I don't have the data about particular states, but certain states in India did ask private schools to temporarily stop charging fees. Uh, I don't know how long that period extended, but given that <clears throat> students were trying to go back to school and a lot of families weren't able to pay school fees, at least not stop paying fees, I don't know about stop, but at least a reduced amount of fees or like delayed fees or some kind of a structure for families to allow families to be able to cope with the economic crisis caused by the pandemic. The other mechanism that we are trying to look at and dig into deeper is that certain schools in um, certain government schools in certain states provided some kind of resources like free schools, free stationery, or, or something that might have made them more attractive compared to private schools. So that could have explained some of this switch from maybe private to like public schools. But yeah, both great questions. That's a great question, and it could be Hawthorne effect. Um, I think the reason why I don't think it is is because it was different from the control group who also received some sort of mention about the kid, whether the kids were going back to school or not as part of the assessment. It wasn't a behavioral intervention telling them, hey, these are the benefits, or hey, 
these are the economic benefits or these are is what your community is doing. But they did have the mention of, are you going to send your kids back to school? Are you planning on doing so? Um, but again, it's a data, a sample issue. So like, I would love to be, I think the reason why there isn't a significant difference in the type of intervention either is because of the low sample as well. But I would love to, to have an answer of one was better than the other. So yeah, we'll start in the back and then come to the front. Oh, go ahead. Okay, um, I have a question for Carolina. So you see some uh, effects, even though they're not significant. For example, have you had any talks with uh, people from the government or practitioners about implementing this? Because it was also really cost effective. So maybe like taking something could also like be worth implementing at a, at a bigger scale. Um, yeah, uh, so, so I was just wondering, uh, uh, the results that we spoke about, uh, uh, they seem kind of obvious uh, from a perspective of if you just generally think about it. And to some of those points of, uh, um, I honestly don't think uh, there was uh, uh, a large uh, sort of a, um, a move where uh, private schools were asked to stop their fees. And even if they did, they didn't actually do it. Uh, it could just have been as simple an explanation as government schools have no fees. So if there are no schools that are open, why should uh, children, parents send their children to private schools? There is no return on investment on it. So just to involve them into public schools could be as simple as that. My second point was, uh, was there anything that you found a little surprising or confounding in any of your uh, sort of uh, results? Or this, was this more from a methodological perspective that uh, this is the kind of analysis that could be done on an ongoing basis, uh, uh, which could be helpful? And the third thing is, uh, did you look at UDI's data in conjunction with uh, um, uh, the CMIE data? Because some of the problems that you're talking about could be resolved. Uh, there you have actual enrollment figures and government tends to report it quite uh, stringently, even during COVID. So that could give you maybe more accurate uh, descriptive of uh, what is the government uh, enrollment on any given year. A third, a third one for this round. No, okay. Uh, let's start with Carolina. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, that's a great point. And um, our partner, so at USA Uganda, they're planning on incorporating at least one of the two messages in future um, assessments because it was so low cost and potentially effective TBD. Yeah, so to answer your questions, like I think the trends made sense, but I think what was surprising was how sharp they were. I think that was something that was surprising. Great points about, you know, UDI's ASER like data. We haven't looked in, like into that. One issue could be like matching them through to like households, but that could give us some like aggregate data that we can use in our like model, which helps us understand variation uh, across states. I think we have time for one more round if there are any further questions or comments. No, everyone's tired. <laughs> Ready for the weekend. All right, well, then I will conclude by looking at my notes where I wrote down what I wanna to say to conclude and say that, um, uh, I think that these takeaways leave me with a mix of optimism and pessimism. On the one hand, um, the majority of children did go back to school, the vast majority in, in many cases. Um, and on the other hand, in some places, particularly where the closures were longer, there were some long lasting effects. And of course, um, it seems quite obvious to be concerned that the children who didn't return to school would be um, the most vulnerable in, in other ways. And now they have access to one less service and one less um, source of support. Um, and again, just as I started, you know, this makes me look ahead and think, what can we learn about this for future disasters, which is part of my, you know, my question about uh, the heterogeneity of the effects on, on different types of, of children and households. And um, I'm left with sort of three questions of what I'd like to see more of from this in the future. Um, the first is, you know, for the systems where the closures were longer and we know that the return, out return outcomes were poorer, 
what can we do to work with our colleagues in the humanitarian space to make sure that reopening schools or some kind of reconnection of children to schools sooner on in the recovery process is a priority if we know that the length of the closure is something that determines the likelihood of return. Um, for the, the paper from India, it makes me think about, you know, systems where we know the private sector is a large provider um, of, of education. What kinds of support are needed to those schools and to the families that are sending their children to those schools, um, you know, to make sure that return in the private sector is, is also prioritized and as a bridge to make sure that we don't lose those children. Um, and then, uh, you know, this speaks to the labor market points that Andreas was making, you know, for the children, both boys and girls who aren't returning to school, um, if that's not an option, what kinds of additional support do we need to try to make sure that the consequences um, in the long run for them are lessened if getting them back to school isn't going to be an option for, for their family. So those are the three thoughts I was left with. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to get to spend this time with all of you and to be here at the conference. I'm really excited to see what comes next in the conference next year and with the What Works Hub and to see what this great community continues to learn and do to make sure that every child gets the education that they deserve. So thanks so much, everyone. And I think <laughs> I hand it to Claire and Lant. Claire wants to start. Or no, you're going to start and then you're going to hand it to Claire. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, and to know. Part of RISE, I think it was a very successful endeavor uh, at producing research. Uh, and as we discussed yesterday, the question now is to translate research into action, which is an incredibly more difficult uh, <laughs> problem to cope with and uh, to address. Um, second, I would like to say for those of you who haven't been involved in RISE, I would encourage you to go look because RISE really did attempt to do a whole array of approaches and researches and other kinds of things. So there was a fair share of RCTs done within RISE, but there were you also did a 12 country politics of education and learning within 12 country historical case studies. We did qualitative research uh, in a whole variety of countries, both within the country research teams and dedicated separately by Masuda Mano, who looked at qualitative components and how parents interacted with schools, how, um, and each country was encouraged to think not just the implications of their own research, but to think deeper. So we've, we countries did evaluations of their teacher training programs, but then did this question of, <laughs> and this is, follows up, for instance, with Paul Clevy's research in Nepal, um, you know, if you have found that in this period of history, countries are still engaging in ineffective teacher training, the real question is how and why are they still doing that, right? <laughs> how has it come to be that countries are still doing ineffective teacher training 50 years into the expansion of mass uh, education. And so I do think, I just wanna convey that uh, out of RISE came some really excellent quantitative research, but Jonathan London's work on the politics of Vietnam and how Vietnam came to be a Vietnam and Yamini Iyer's work, which was mentioned on uh, like detailed, engaged, <laughs> they literally had somebody in the schools implementing this program every day. <laughs> Um, for like a year, um, seeing what actually happened in the school in response to what 
was being said. So we do have a rich variety of research and I encourage you all to look at that. And then I do, I'm going to thank Claire and then Claire is going to thank everyone else. <laughs> so we have a gift for Claire. So why don't you come down? Uh, one of the beauties of being the research director of RISE is I did very little other than <laughs> give a few speeches because this conference has been arranged by Claire for. Well, my son's eight. Right. And right started when he was eight. He was born. So, so he is, yeah. uh, it has been uh, it, the Rise Conference has been one of the most enjoyable experiences I've had for two days every year, <laughs> once a year for eight years, because Claire has done a just terrific job of organizing the conference. So I'd like round of applause for Claire for having organized it. want to say I think RISE has set the bar extremely high. Um, it has been just tremendous to hear um, this conference and, and have been a witness to a bunch of the incredible work that RISE has done over the last eight years. Uh, and I appreciate the challenge that I put forward um, that uh, now, now to put it into action. Uh, we're hoping to do a bit of that and also put some rigor behind it and some science behind it. Um, and just to say, uh, it's it's a one door is I don't want to say closing, but it's sort of um, coming to a certain juncture, and then the other door is swinging. Uh, and we're cousins, we're siblings. We're hoping to carry so much of the incredible uh, knowledge, know-how, people, uh, coalitions that have been built through Rise forward. Um, there's a quote that I really, really like, which I think we're going to need to think about as we enter this next chapter. I'm sure some people have heard about this, which is that people uh, won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, and I think in this room is actually quite a mix of people and of people in RISE and people in the What Works Hub for Global Education who are building the know-how and also have the spirit and the care and the motivation uh, to keep chipping away. So we won't solve the learning crisis in six, and if FCTO extends uh, to eight years, uh, we won't solve it in eight years, uh, but we will make some headway. Uh, and I really look forward to doing that with everyone here. Thank you. So I, I am going to say a few words of thanks. Uh, first, I think we should thank Lam. We are. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful direction, and now it's a really big set of sheets. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, you can with support from the academic team. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and session chairs today and yesterday, and all of you. Um, it's been a wonderful group in the room, and the room's been packed pretty much every session. So, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank the program committee. Uh, we had, yeah, but it was. Like over 200 submissions this year, it was a record number of submissions. The program committee helped to sift through all of those and hopefully put a, um, a thought provoking program together. Uh, so, thank you to everyone on the committee and Michelle in particular for following through afterwards and helping uh, uh, with many of the logistics. Um, I would like to thank uh, Varangina, where is Varangina? Uh, for all of your work uh, over the last couple of days and the lead up to you. So, come and we can have. I'm getting at them. Uh, you might have noticed them in the corner of the room, but they've been working tirelessly. Uh, Sam and <laughs> Well, so you have an event team at BSG, and they've been doing lots of work behind the scenes too. And I'm going to make sure they eat the chocolates from the moment. There are some other people who could be with us, but have done a lot of work too. 
Um, uh, Lily, who's done all the work on social media, and she can hear us. <laughs> and Nadia too, and the facilities team who are not here but helped set up. Um, uh, so I want to say thank you to them. Thank you, Lucy, for tirelessly keeping us on time. I, I think, do you agree? We've been pretty much on time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Super, super important job. Thank you. And I think we all know who really needs the fact, right? Who's kept it all running, keeping all of the things, all of the balls in the air, making sure everybody's accommodation is sorted, their flights are sorted, that they're happy, that all of the people in the room at the right time. Who else is it? But